Live stream is up. Computer recording started. Cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Polite. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on zoning and franchises. Will council, council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Moyer, we are ready to begin. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Zoning, the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm joined remotely today by Council Members Reynoso, uh, Ayala, Borelli, Levin, uh, Barry G. Uh, we are also joined by uh, Council Members Rose and Adams. Uh, today we will, uh, and uh, Council Member Kalos. Uh, today we are, uh, will also hold public hearings on uh, rezoning proposals for uh, 624 Morris Avenue in the Bronx and 18517 Hillside Avenue in Queens, as well as a development proposal for the New York Blood Center in Manhattan. But first, uh, we will vote on a number of items heard by the subcommittee on our September 24th meeting. We will vote to approve LU numbers 854, 855, 856 for the 495 11th Avenue rezoning relating to property in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment uh, to change an M15 district to a C64 district and extend the special Hudson Yards district to include the development site, uh, a related zoning text amendment to establish a new subdistrict G as part of the special district and establish the development site as a new MIH area and a related site uh, selection and acquisition of a portion of the site for use as an NYT, uh, NYPD uh, vehicle storage facility. Speaker Johnson is in support of the proposal. We will also vote to approve with modifications LUs uh, 859, uh, 860, and the 270 Nordstrom Avenue rezoning relating to property in Council Member Cornegie's district in Brooklyn. Um, the proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R7A district to an R8A C24 district and a related zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area utilizing option two and the workforce option. Uh, during the course of ULIP review, the City Planning Commission voted to approve with modifications by changing the proposal, the proposed uh, R8A uh, C24 district to a mix of R7X C24 and R7D district districts. Our modifications will be to strike the MIH uh, workforce option and to restore the originally proposed R8A C24 designation. This modification will both increase the number of affordable housing units and deepen uh, the affordability while allowing density that is appropriate for this large vacant site on a major Brooklyn Avenue. Council Member Cornegie is in support of the proposal as modified. We will vote to approve with modifications LU's number uh, numbers 861 and 862 for the 1776 48th Street rezoning proposal related relating to property in Council Member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. This proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R5 district to an R6B C24 district and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and option two. Our modification will be to reduce the overall area to be rezoned and retaining the existing residential zoning on mid-block sites where the existing R5 zoning reflects the built context and where there are no development sites as projected in the EAS uh, as well. Uh, we will also modify the approval to further reduce the area proposed to be within the C24 overlay district the rezoned commercial area will only be mapped to a depth of 35 feet, reflecting the location of avenue fronting buildings, which are appropriate for commercial. The remainder of the zoning area will be R6B. This modification ensures the uh, distinction between mid-block and avenues uh, zoning is more fine-tuned for a predominantly residential area and focuses the commercial overlay on those buildings uh, fronting the avenue. Council Member Yeager is in support of the proposal as modified. We will vote to approve with modifications LUs 842, 843, and 844 for the River North proposal. 
relating to property in council member Rose's district in Staten Island. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment uh, to rezone an existing R6C22 district in the special uh, hillsides preservation district uh, to an R73 uh, C24 district within the special St. George district and an existing R6C22 district to an R6C24 district also within the special St. George district. The proposal includes a related zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing program area with options one and two and various changes to the special uh, St. George district regulations. Finally, the project includes a zoning special permit under the amended special St. George district rules to allow modifications to the applicable bulk regulations, all in order to facilitate the development of three new mixed use buildings with ground floor retail and residential units on the upper floors. Our modifications will be to reduce the bulk of the proposed uh, buildings by lowering the maximum height of the eastern and central buildings, also known as buildings one and two, and requiring additional setbacks to uh, relate to the existing built context directly to the south. We will also reduce the area to be rezoned and retain the existing R6 and special uh, hillsides preservation designation for the westernmost portion of the proposed area, pulling the boundaries easterly of uh, Nicholas Street. These modifications will permit the development of three, build, uh, three new buildings while maintaining significant uh, view corridors in the New York Harbor and Lower Manhattan from the upland neighborhoods. Council Member Rose is in support of this district as modified. Um, and now uh, I call for a vote uh, to approve LU's 854, 855, and 856, and to approve with the modifications I've described, LU's 842, 843, 844, and 859 through 862. Uh, Council, if you can please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Levin. I vote aye. Councilmember Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Councilmember Grudenchik. Aye. That's an aye from Councilmember Grudenchik. Councilmember Ayala. Councilmember Ayala on a vote of the land use items. Councilmember Borelli. Uh, I vote aye on all with the exception of 0842. Uh, and if I may, if, if the developers wanted my support, they should have reached out and explained why this would be a benefit to Staten Island and they failed to do that. Uh, so uh, I'm recording my vote as a no, thank you. Councilmember Ayala. I voted aye. Uh, I'm sorry, apologies. Chair, the vote is currently uh, five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions on all items except for LU842, which is, uh, excuse me, six, all items, six in the affirmatives, zero in the negative, and no abstentions with the exception of LU842, which is currently at five in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions, and we will keep the vote open. Uh, for Council Member Rivera. Okay, great. Um, thank you, uh, Arthur. Uh, before we turn uh, to our hearings, uh, I will first recognize the subcommittee council uh, to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public were asked to testify. Uh, members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the council's website. As a technical note uh, for the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, 
please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first, followed by members of the public. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony, uh, you would like to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members with questions will be announced in the order as they raise their hands and Termoya will recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. And Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now open the public hearing on a pre-considered LU item for the 624 Morris Avenue rezoning proposal under ULIP number C210339 ZMX requesting a zoning map uh, amendment relating to property in Chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx. Uh, for anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already uh, done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website uh, once again, at council.nyc.gov uh, forward slash land use. Uh, council, if you can uh, please call uh, the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Adam Rothkrug, appearing as land use counsel for the applicant. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Moy and commissioners uh, one, one and one council second. members. One second, thank you. Uh, <laughs> council, if you could please... Uh, uh, administer the affirmation. Ms. Rothke, would you please uh, raise your right hand and state your name for the record? Adam Rothkrug. <clears throat> you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you are ready to present your slideshow, please say so and it will be displayed uh, on screen and slides will be advanced for you by our staff. As a technical note uh, for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this uh, presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and now uh, you may begin uh, your testimony. Uh, you thank you. Reiterate your name and-, and uh, Sure, Adam, Adam Rothkrug on behalf of 624 Morris B LLC. Uh, and if you pull up the presentation, I know you have a, a large agenda, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this application is actually to restore a C14 overlay uh, that previously existed on the properties, uh, affecting seven properties uh, on a small uh, block in the Bronx uh, that were zoned with a commercial overlay uh, from 1961 to 1973 which somehow uh, disappeared, even though all of the first floors of the buildings are used commercially. Uh, next slide. And you can continue forward. Thank you. So these are the seven uh, buildings that are affected uh, by this uh, zoning application. They're zoned R71 at the present time. The addition of the commercial overlay will recognize the commercial uses on the first floor, uh, will not permit any uh, new or added bulk to any of the buildings. Uh, the large building on the corner to the right uh, actually previously obtained a zoning variance from the Board of Standards and Appeals to permit uh, commercial use on the first and second floors. Uh, the other buildings all have grandfathered uses on the first floor, uh, but because they're now zoned residentially, they've been uh, hampered in uh, changing uses and uh, uh, building small enlargements on the first floors. Uh, next slide. And you can continue to the next one. 
Uh, these maps show that in 1961, in the upper left corner, this uh, area in blue was, uh, had a commercial overlay, as well as in 1967, when some of the area was rezoned. In 1973, the surrounding district was rezoned from R6 to R71, but for some reason, this commercial overlay was removed from this uh, half block area. If you look at the maps uh, from 1973 and the current map, you see that there are uh, commercial overlays on the opposite side of uh, Morris Avenue, uh, as well as uh, to the south of it. It doesn't show up, but that's a uh, commercial zone uh, so that these uh, areas, these, this block is surrounded by commercial overlays along Morris Avenue, which is a relatively commercial street. Uh, you can continue. Next slide. Uh, this shows the building in question, which has a Caribbean uh, restaurant that wanted to expand and found out that uh, the rear portion of their first floor was actually an old shopkeeper's apartment and Department of Buildings considered it residential. So uh, even though it didn't even have a full bath, so they weren't allowed to uh, expand, as well as the other buildings on the block that all have uh, existing commercial first floors. Next slide. Uh, so the commercial overlay will only affect these seven buildings, uh, receive the support of the community board, even though they didn't have a, a, a quorum available, uh, as well as uh, a favorable uh, review from the uh, borough president, uh, as well as uh, uh, the council people's office that we, we met with. Uh, Councilman Salamanca's office didn't seem to have any objections. Uh, and other than that, if there are any questions, I'm happy to respond. Thank you. Uh, no questions here. Uh, is there any um, uh, of my colleagues uh, who have any questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with uh, questions for the panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no questions, the applicant panel is excused. Um, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 624 Morris Avenue rezoning application? Yes, Chair, please stand by while we confirm. Mr. Chair, we do have uh, some uh, registration, so we're just working on uh, coordinating there, getting them into the meeting. Thank you. Okay, Chair, um, we did have some advanced registrations, but they, uh, it appears that they have not uh, actually joined yet. So I'm just gonna make a quick announcement before we move on. Uh, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 624 Morris Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting uh, will briefly stand at ease while we uh, check to make sure that there are no persons registered to testify.
Chair Moya, I see no members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, there. Okay, there being no members of the public uh, who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU item for the 624 Morris Avenue rezoning proposal under ULIP number C210339 ZMX, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LUs 882 and 883 for the 18517 Hillside Avenue rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map and zoning text amendment relating to property in Council Gennaro's district in Queens. Once again, if you wish to testify on this item, uh, please visit the Council's website to register. That link is at uh, www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, you may also submit written testimony by emailing it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and council, can you please call uh, the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include Richard Lobel and Amanda Iannotti, Land Use Council for the Applicant, David Weiss, and Frank Demerley, Project Architect. Thank you. Uh, council, can you please administer the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, as a reminder, uh, when you're ready to present your slideshow, please uh, say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff, and slides will yep. be advanced for you. As a reminder for anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, for the record panelists, as uh, you begin, uh, I'll just ask uh, that you please restate your name and the organization. Uh, and now, um, Mr. Lobel, uh, you and your team may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Good morning. Good morning, council members. Once again, Richard Lobel of Shelb Lobel, the applicant in the 18517 Hillside Avenue rezoning. If you can please load the slide presentation, I can start. Next slide. So this rezoning, uh, which would result in the building that you see on the first screen uh, is a zoning map amendment to rezone parts of five lots from R3X and R6A24 districts to an R7A C24 district, as well as to extend the special downtown Jamaica district. Um, the actions that would be part of this rezoning include an extension of that downtown Jamaica district uh, to establish certain regulations for R7A districts within MIH designated areas in downtown Jamaica because the downtown Jamaica special district was uh, created in or around 2007, so it preceded MIH. So we have to make that adjustment, as well as, of course, a text amendment to allow for the mapping of MIH uh, in this case, uh, the, the applicant will be utilizing option one, uh, but option one and two over the entirety of the area. Next slide. So to give you the calculations for this specific development, you've got a 16,000 square foot lot uh, along Hillside Avenue. The resulting building would be roughly 63,000 square feet or 4.54 FAR, uh, would have a total height of nine stories with a base height of 61 feet. Uh, and setbacks. There would be parking for 27 cars with 24 biking park spaces, parking spaces. Uh, 48 units would be generated here, of which 12 would be under option MIH option one. And we note that there is a mix of one bedrooms and three bedrooms. So 25% of those uh, one and three bedrooms would be devoted to affordable housing, which would of course be permanently affordable. Next slide. So the next slide shows the, the zoning map. Uh, which is uh, very difficult to read in the upper left corner. But you can see that the property is located within the uh, special downtown Jamaica district uh, along Hillside Avenue. I think the next two slides give a little bit of a better picture of what we're trying to do. So the next slide is a tax map, which shows the proposed boundaries of the rezoning. Next slide, please. And you'll see that the properties along Hillside here generally extend back roughly 160 feet, uh, while the rezoning uh, uh, area previously only went 100 feet, so now would be extended towards the rear 
to allow these lots to take advantage of uh, better floor plates and, um, and create more housing units. Next slide. So the land use map here really demonstrates why this rezoning is uh, particularly well suited for this area. You've got Hillside Avenue, which is 100 feet wide, uh, which is a wide street. Uh, along Hillside Avenue, you've got roughly eight bus lines, which uh, translates into a wealth of transportation options for residential housing created here. In addition, you've got uh, the Jamaica 179th Street Station, roughly a quarter of a mile to the west of the site. Um, you can see that the existing boundaries of the uh, rezoned area to the west and east pursuant to the downtown Jamaica district, they kind of tracked the boundaries of the lots in those areas. So they really were more conducive to development and to putting up residential buildings while on our lot, for whatever reason, it was cut back to 100. So one of the things this also accomplishes is pushes back the zoning district and district and Jamaica, uh, special Jamaica downtown Jamaica district boundaries to be more coincident with the lot lines, which will allow for the exact development which we'd like here. It's gonna take an underutilized site, which is roughly 16,000 square feet. And instead of a, a roughly 1,700 square foot or 0.11 FAR animal hospital, we'll create these 48 units of housing, 12 units of affordability. This is really what the downtown Jamaica special district was designed to do. It was designed to create more housing and more affordable housing along avenues that could handle this density and along avenues with excellent transportation options of which we have many. Next slide. So as we page through, you can see uh, the development site perhaps most clearly in the bottom left. Uh, that gap in the development is the one-story animal hospital longstanding uh, that is that um, you know is, occupies this large lot. The two adjacent buildings are uh, built under the uh, current regulations, but are non-complying. Each of those exists at seven stories. Um, so this will really allow a development which is more contextual with these surrounding buildings. Next slide. I think if you want to forward through the photos, which just demonstrate that indeed what we're proposing here is within the context of the area. If we can go one more slide, uh, you'll see in blue, highlighted in blue, is the uh, are the uh, outlines of the existing development to the east and west of the site, and white would be the proposed development. So with setbacks, you can see this is really a contextual uh, addition to the area and one which will create much needed housing in an area which saw a significant population growth between the, the initiation of the downtown special Jamaica district, down, special downtown Jamaica district in 2007 through 2016. So there's been a, uh, an increase in population, but there has not been a corresponding increase in residential uh, units created. So this in part addresses that. There are uh, R7X districts in the area, which uh, upwards of the R7A is proposed here, and those have been responsible for some new housing. But when you look at the R6A districts, like the district mapped on this site, uh, I think that's in the entirety of the, re of the uh, development activity since this special downtown Jamaica district uh, rezoning, there've only been two additional residential buildings. So it really has, has not um, risen to the level of the uh, residential uh, uh, units that have been needed by the area. So this really is a rezoning which goes to address that. Uh, the next slide merely shows, uh, locates the site uh, among the other sites and has zoning, we have zoning calculations as well. Uh, and then the following uh, plans demonstrate the layouts. Once again, we're very happy that the proposal includes uh, one bedrooms and importantly, three bedrooms, which allow for uh, larger families in the area. And of course, um, the opportunity for those larger units as well to become permanently affordable housing. And with that, the applicant team is ha happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. Um, just one, one quick question here. Uh, and I think you might've addressed it in the beginning, uh, but just going back to it. Uh, how has your team uh, addressed community board concerns about the perceived lack of parking uh, in the area and the impact this project will have uh, on the surrounding area? Sure. So thank you for the question, Chair Moya. So, um, you know, the community board, uh, it was a, um, you know, it was a very deep conversation with regards to that one issue. Um, the, the Queensborough president we know uh, did not, was not similarly concerned, and neither was the commission, and both of, both of which approved this application. 
Um, for, for the part of the community board, um, the applicant has um, you know, created parking here, which provides more than 50% or at least 50% greater than what's required at the site. So we're required to have 18 spaces um, pursuant to zoning. We're providing 27 spaces. Given that and given the plethora of transportation options immediately right in front of this building, um, we're confident that, that we're able to uh, address parking concerns with the building. So, um, you know, with that, I think one of the things was that the applicant had the opportunity here to increase density, to allow for a greater number of units. In fact, with 48 units here, you're really um, decreasing the demand on not only local infrastructure, but also on things like parking. So given the unit mix, which we ended up at, and given the fact that we're having an overage of parking, um, we're, we really feel we're kind of addressing some of the community board concerns regarding that, that issue. Great, um, thank you, uh, Richard. That's it uh, for my questions. Um, I now invite any of my colleagues who may have questions for this panel. Uh, council, do we have any uh, council members that have questions? Uh, no, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, uh, there being uh, no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 185-17 Hillside Avenue proposal? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 185-17 uh, Hillside Avenue proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, chair, the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check to make sure uh, there are no registrations. Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU's number 882 and 883 for the uh, 18517 Hillside Avenue proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU's number 864, 865, and 866 for the New York Blood Center proposal, which seeks zoning, a, seeks zoning map and zoning text amendments and a special permit, uh, all relating to property in Council Member Kalos' district and Council Member Powers' district in Manhattan. Uh, we have a lot of speakers uh, signed up for this uh, uh, project, so uh, would ask that you all be patient and council staff is working hard to make sure that you all have a chance to speak. Um, if you would prefer to submit written testimony, you can always do so by emailing it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov uh, forward slash uh, uh, land use. Uh, Council, can you please call uh, the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include Dr. Chris Hillier, Rob Purvis, Barry Green, all of the New York Blood Center, Paul Silver, Land Use Council for the Applicant, and Melissa Sarko, Project uh, Architect. Available for a question and answer, we also expect to have Jay Moore, Donna Gargano, also of the New York Blood Center, Ann Locke, Lisa Lau, Kenneth Mack, Dan Abadamarco, all of AKRF, environmental consultant for the applicant, and Bob Green and Jamie Peschel. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Council, if you could please uh, administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm uh, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just uh, a reminder, when you are ready to present your slideshow, 
uh, please say so and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced uh, when you say next. Uh, once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and now uh, you may begin. Uh, and I'll remind each of the panelists that as you begin speaking, please state your name and the organization uh, for the record. Thank you, Chairman Moya. If you could bring up the presentation. Chairman Moya, distinguished subcommittee members, council members, and friends. My name is Christopher Hillier. I'm the president and CEO of New York Blood Center. New York Blood Center is all of our community blood center. It belongs to the community, a not-for-profit charity. We provide life-saving blood products 24-7, 365, serving our community for the last 60 years, never once closing our doors. We come before you today to ask for your support in approval of our applications to build a new building that the city and the blood center desperately need. Next slide. As you know, we are located between 66th and 67th streets and 1st and 2nd avenues. Built as a trade school in the 1930s, the current space is antiquated and cannot support advanced research and technologies. From this building, we currently do three things, provide life-saving blood, stem cells, and sickle cell programs. Two, do groundbreaking research in things like stem cells, AIDS, sickle cell, cancer, blindness, COVID, diabetes. And three, we house startup companies from our contiguous world-renowned medical and research institutions. As has been pointed out, New York Blood Center has been looking for a workable solution for over 20 years. The current conditions do not allow us to recruit great scientific talent and companies. We are out of space and the current facility is too expensive to maintain. Replacement is the only viable solution. In order for us to fulfill our mission, serve the city, grow a much needed life sciences hub in New York City and expand our world renowned research, we propose and have considerable citywide support for a project called Center East. New slide. Next. Center East is a partnership with Longfellow. Longfellow Real Estate Partners is the world-class real estate developer in the life sciences building area in Boston for MIT, Harvard, and universities in and around Duke and in San Francisco and around the world for that matter. The new uh, blood center and uh, hub will be configured something like this picture you'll see uh, more detailed diagrams in a minute. And the commercial labs in the tower above generate the income such that NYBC uh, can receive new space um, essentially at no cost to the blood center or to the city. There are benefits to the city and nearby institutions, providing space for commercial partners to have world-class medical and research companies, institution, and shared facilities to keep life sciences entrepreneurs in the city, to increase the square footage of life science space in New York City, and to compete with other markets for talent in New York City. Next slide. In terms of life sciences space, New York City is far, far behind. This slide indicates that Boston and Cambridge have approximately 47 million square feet of space on a background of about 700,000 people, whereas New York City only has about 2 million square feet with very low vacancy on a background of 10 million people. San Francisco, 30 million square feet on a background of a million people. San Diego, 20 million square feet on a background of 1 million people. It has been widely shown that these cities are successful because of the clustering of universities, biotechs, lab buildings, and investigators in contiguous and nearby space. Next slide. We have exactly that clustering already where we are. This slide shows our site, Center East, on the left, as well as Wild Cornell, Memorial Stone Kettering, Rockefeller, and New York Public, New York Presbyterian Hospital, Hospital for Special Surgery are all there. For more than 10 years, many of our investigators have been going back and forth across the street teaching, doing research, sharing slides, sharing core facilities, sharing cells. And these lists, collaborative studies with Cornell, 
MSK, and Rockefeller. And on the next slide, I'll show you that all of these institutions have spun out companies that are currently incubating in our space. The bullet halfway down is from my lab, which has novel T-cell development therapies with IPSCs produced from cord blood. We've had the largest and biggest cord blood facility in the world for over 30 years. And this allows us to work and my lab to work directly with investigators in companies in our institutions and with Memorial Sloan Kettering. Truly, we go back and forth across the street every day. For that is the second of the red arrows from our square across the corner of the park to MSK. Next slide. 10 years ago, we started the Upper East Side Biotech Accelerator Program in anticipation of potentially growing this great tower with our Longfellow partners to host and to incubate all levels of biotech and biopharma companies. These are 10 companies currently in our space. We are out of space. Fate Th Therapeutics works with Memorial Sloan Kettering and my lab. While Cornell is Mint, it says in the middle, Mental Million Invasive New Technologies is a spin out of Wild Cornell. Rumi Scientific and Surge Advance are spin outs from Rockefeller. Proximity truly matters. People walk back and forth. These companies and the future companies in the tower will benefit society by bringing research and discoveries, promote economic growth, speed these discoveries through industry partnerships, improve recruitment and retention of the best scientific talent, and generate income streams to reinvest in research and in our city. Next slide. I cannot overemphasize how unique, important New York Blood Center is. We are a one of a kind, world renowned, comprehensive blood center. We provide 100% of the primary blood supply to New York City, 1 million blood products a year. We're 100% primary supplier to New York City's health uh, and hospitals. And testimony has been submitted on behalf of the commissioner from New York City Department of Health and from Health and Human uh, from Health and Hospitals who strongly support the project. The second bullet: We are the largest supplier of stem cells, obviously in the city and in the region, but also in the world. The largest ever public cord blood bank and the first ever FDA-approved stem cell product. This huge. Uh, undertaking and accomplishment was not done at Harvard or anywhere else. It was done by our community blood center. We have a major focus on sickle cell, HIV prevention, and the LGBT community, as well as infectious diseases. We have an unparalleled blood cell therapy and regenerative medicine institute, which will grow and serve the companies in the tower above. We have made over three COVID therapies Two that we brought out to the market and to patients saving over 100,000 lives has been published. We're a leader in sickle cell, in novel CAR T and IPSC therapies. We're a leader in vaccine and vaccine trials with ongoing trials in COVID, HIV, and the first hepatitis vaccine ever brought to market. In addition, some of these covers that are hard to see, these are covers of textbooks, some 20 Four textbooks have been written and edited by New York Blood Center. We are widely considered to be the leader in education and training in our field, all for New York Blood, all for New York City and for its people. Next slide. New York Blood Center impacts all of us. Advanced medical and surgical therapies do not happen without a safe and reliable blood supply. First responders, firefighters, trauma victims, burn victims, sickle cell patients, cancer patients, stem cell recipients, all cannot achieve any hope at quality of life and life-saving outcomes without the blood center and its products. Next slide. One of the council members brought to our attention life-saving blood products for mothers in, in, in fetal maternal medicine. We also take care of neonates, preemies, infants, and children. All of these pictures are from my collections and known to me. In the lower right, spend one second, those big tubes on that person's bedside are one inch in diameter and carry gallons of blood, blood from donors, blood that saved lives. That procedure is called ECMO. And ECMO not only used in trauma, but has also been used extensively in COVID. Next slide. None of those things happen without New York Blood Center. And none of those things happen without our donors. We have the most diverse um, blood donor pool 
and blood supply in the world and the and a very very diverse uh, workforce of over 2,500 FTEs. We collect blood from every zip code in our boroughs and in our city. We have the largest bank of rare blood type units, special units needed for matching in sickle cell, and special laboratories that we run simply and only to support the sickle cell population. Next slide. And to summarize my section before I ask Paul Selver to look into the zoning, I'd like to say Center East is a project of citywide importance. It will bring to our city a new state-of-the-art blood center, new state-of-the-art life sciences hub, a world-class research institute with new biotech companies, adding over 5,000 jobs and aiding New York City in post-COVID recovery. If I could introduce Paul Selver, Land Use Council. Next slide. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. Chair Moya, members of the subcommittee, Council Member Kalos. I'm Paul Selver. I'm a member of the firm of Kramer Levin. We're land use council to the Blood Center. And I'm here to describe the Blood Center's land use proposal, to discuss what we've heard during the Euler process, how we would change the project in response, and the effects of those changes. Let's start by getting oriented. The map you see shows highlights, highlights the blood center site in dark blue. It also highlights the two other properties that were the focus of community concerns, St. Catherine's Park in green and the Julia Richmond Education Center in light blue. The institutional complex that includes Rockefeller University, Weill Cornell Medical Center, and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is to the east of First Avenue on the right side of the, the image. The Blood Center's land use proposal has three parts, a zoning map change, a zoning text amendment, and a special permit. The zoning map amendment is illustrated on this map. It involves for the Blood Center site, a change in zoning district from R8B, a moderate density residential zone, to C27, a higher density mixed use zone that includes the ability to develop commercial uses. The text amendment would change, uh, change section 7448 of the zoning resolution. Section 7448 is the life sciences special permit. It authorizes the establishment of scientific research and development facilities in commercial zones. It was used to develop the Audubon project at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and amended subsequently to facilitate the development of Alexandria Center across the street from NYU Langone. The proposed amendment here would, be, would allow it to be used on the rezoned blood center site and enable it to authorize additional commercial floor area and modifications of height, setback, yard, and signage regulations. Finally, the special permit we are seeking would be pursuant to amended section 7448. It would authorize a scientific research and development facility of approximately 6.8 FAR, height setback and yard modifications to accommodate center east's 30,000 square foot plus or minus floor plates and a minor modification of signage controls. The results aren't going to be anything but unprecedented. They will be a building type and building form that is appropriate for the neighborhood. Its research uses are comparable to the research activities that have been going on for years on the site and at the other medical and academic institutions to the east. Its floor plates are in the sweet spot between 25,000 and 40,000 square feet for advanced urban clinical and research buildings. You see them all over New York and they are large enough and flexible enough to keep startups on site and in New York City as they grow into mature organizations. And it imposes less on the pedestrian experience than do the Zuckerman, Belfer, and Koch buildings, all of which are within three blocks of the site and rise 300 to 400 feet at the lot line, far more than this building rises at the lot line. Next slide, please. Uh, we've been in the public review process considering these actions for about three years. We've had a lot of meetings with stakeholders during that time, and we've heard a range of critiques of the proposal. Some, like the claim that the project poses an immediate existential threat to R8B zoning are unproven, 
and because it's a canard, impossible to prove. Others related to building height and the effects of the project on St. Catherine's Park and JREC present real world issues that are susceptible to real world solutions. And in response, we put together a package of solutions, improving the park, reducing building height and shadows on the park and permanent improvements to JREC that I'll touch on today. Let's start with the park. As you know, the Blood Center has already committed $3.6 million for improvements to the park's comfort station and its play areas. It is now prepared to reduce center east height by more than 50 feet to about 276 feet at the top of the screen wall that was once 334 feet. It's a reduction that has a substantial positive effect. Next slide. This is illustrated in the section that you see. Uh, on the right, the uh, lower, excuse me, the lower building on the left, the original building. Uh, next slide. And the additional sky that's shown in the before and after renderings from across Second Avenue, looking southeast. Next slide. And from across St. Path Catherine's Park, looking southwest. Next slide, please. Shrinking the building also shrinks the shadows on the park. These shadows first touch the park at 3 p.m. Indeed, before 3 p.m., Center East has no impact on the park. And that gives it at least six hours of uninterrupted sunlight that the uh, project doesn't affect at all. And they do not reach the Eastern half of the park until at least 4.15 during the spring, summer, and fall. Next slide, please. The shadow diagrams show in blue the shadows from the reduced height building. They also show in yellow how much reducing the building's height increases the amount of sunlight reaching the park. And that is by about 56% on May 6th and August 6th. I think we may have missed a slide. Can you go back a slide, please? Yes, we did. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, about 64% uh, reduction uh, on the summer solstice. Then next slide, please. About a 56% reduction in mid-spring and mid-summer. And next slide, please. Up to about a 25% reduction in the at the equinoxes. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, we put together a set of permanent permanent improvements to reduce outside noise affecting the special needs children at JREC improvements that go far beyond what is required by the City Environmental Quality Re Review for construction noise mitigation. These improvements include adding acoustical interior windows, re repairing and improving the seals on the existing windows to reduce sound transmission further, special acoustical curtains to further reduce sound, uh, uh, sound encroachment and sound absorbent ceiling tiles. We would welcome the chance to work with the JREC administration to implement these improvements when the project moves forward. I thank you all for your attention and Barry Green will now talk about jobs, job training and the innovative employment opportunities that Center East uh, will involve. Next slide. Oh. Thank you, Paul. I'm Barry Green. I'm Vice President of Research at New York Blood Center. With your support, the new enhanced Center East facility will grow New York City's commitment to greater diversity in the life sciences by providing workforce training, development, and placement programs. Workforce initiatives that target New Yorkers from under, underrepresented communities and backgrounds that include CUNY students and public housing residents. Provide education, training, and placement into life science internships and jobs at Center East creating partnerships with various institutions, some of which we have already fostered. All these tools will assist Center East in providing New York City's life science industry with a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. Next slide, please. We are currently negotiating with CUNY to establish and provide funding and internship placement opportunities for significant new academic programs across CUNY colleges in three boroughs. Provide a direct pathway for New Yorkers into jobs in the life sciences at Center East and citywide. 
Center East will commit to specific internships and lab placements, including a pipeline for five years of placement for students in existing New York Blood Center programs. I will now pass this back to Dr. Hillier. Next slide, please. Thank you, Barry. There's a diverse and citywide coalition significant support for the Center East project. With so many organizations listed here, I'll call out a few of them, but let me say that testimony and letters have been submitted by many of the biotechs, universities, hospitals, things like foundations like the Stem Cell Foundation. And as I mentioned, Health and Human Hospitals, Department of Health. A citywide coalition comprised of prominent unions and city-based organizations. Three people listed here, Marlene, Gloria, and Ginger, all represent different NGOs that are important partners in sickle cell anemia and its treatment and therapy. I also say New York uh, NYC uh, builds bio, as well as the unionized construction trade laborers local 79, community voices heard and their base supporters living in East Harlem NYCHA housing and the not-for-profit urban upbound focused on ensuring that New Yorkers have a pipeline to the jobs in the life sciences that reflect the New Yorkers far and beyond our local neighborhood. These are groups that do not typically support ULERP applications, but see the importance of this project. They believe that good paying middle-class jobs and careers in life sciences should be more widely available to New Yorkers of color and know that Center East will be built with union labor, bring over 5,000 jobs, and that this project is instrumental to the recovery effort of COVID and our city. Next slide. I'll be very brief in the next two slides and then wrap up. So I thank the members for their attention. There has been a tremendous amount of incorrect information circulated about the blood center and this proposal. A full response will be submitted into the record, but here are a few of the claims that are false. First, luxury condos are included in the project. No, there are no residences in the project. It removes 500 houses from the market or housing units from the market. False. It uses only New York Blood Center's footprint. There are no residences. New York Blood Center doesn't work with nearby medical institutions. Therefore, proximity doesn't matter. Could not be more false. It's impossible to even go into the detail to support that. New York Blood Center did not consider other sites. For 20 years, we've been working to find a way to build a new blood center and to fund it and to not fund it at a huge cost to the city. And the ability to build what the city wants is new life sciences space and a biotech hub. We have considered many, many other sites. Some of our in-house entrepreneurs will testify later today and say that they could not do this if it weren't in proximity to what I call their day jobs. Center East can be built under existing zoning. I'll deal with that in the next slide. The last two bullets here are one of many, many falsehoods that have been uh, misleading statements made about the blood center and its finances. Suffice it to say that while it says that we have made $269 million selling blood, we don't sell blood, it's illegal. We sell the provision of blood and blood products. And in order to collect, um, test, manufacture, and distribute those in a highly FDA-controlled environment costs money. In the year that this number was put forward, we actually lost money. Some people will contest that. A very, very small amount was made according to the tax return, but that is way more than simply just the blood center, or just selling blood in the blood center. And then the blood center spent $75 million cash transfer to buy other blood centers around the country. We did acquire five blood centers around the country in order to make sure that we could always bring blood into New York City, and we spent zero dollars. You cannot buy a blood center in that way. We spent no money in cash transactions. These are member substitutions, a number of falsehoods, suffice it to say. Next slide. Centuries can be built under existing zoning. In order to do so, we have a 75-foot height limit, and the um, estimates for construction are over $450 million. This is an impossible figure for us or for the city to give us in order for us to have a new blood center. The extensive mechanical and support that support the labs cannot be done under a 75 foot ceiling. Much has been said about NYBC's endowment. It's technically and legally not an endowment. It's reserved funds earmarked for the four bullets 
in the bottom left of the slide to support our not-for-profit mission and to make sure we can supply the lowest cost blood products, to provide a financial safety net during emergencies such as 9-11, Sandy, and COVID. Over the 10 years of 2010 to 2020, the Blood Center lost over $110 million, ensuring that we could provide the best products. Next bullet says to ensure the ability to provide safe blood. During those years, we went above and beyond all regulations, including those of the FDA, to provide additional testing for our blood to ensure safety for all of our fellow recipients. And our endowment, so-called, funds our pioneering research. Next slide. I'd like to close with a letter from a CEO who will later testify today. When I was talking to him the other day, he then wrote us the following. He said, proximity matters. Our commercial lease from New York Blood Center was a critical step. So this is the CEO of Surge Advance, a company incubating, a startup company using intellectual property from Sloan Kettering, who invented a new microscope that will allow millions of lives to be saved around the world, including right here in New York City. He was able to house his startup near academic institutions, raise non-dilutive funding, and raise funding of over a million dollars to spin out this company. Another example of what New York Blood Center does to advance health and welfare of all of us in New York City. In closing, members of the committee, the council and the public, I'd like to say the Blood Center is important and it's vital to New York City. The Life Sciences Hub is important and vital to New York City. The Center East Project is important and vital to New York City and its future. Please support our zoning requests and this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. Uh, before we go into questions, uh, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Councilwoman Rivera, and I am going to call the council to uh, take the vote. And a continuing vote of the land use items, Councilmember Rivera. I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, the vote uh, on the land use items of the subcommittee is seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, no abstentions, except LU number 842, which is adopted by a vote of six in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. Those items are adopted and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you, Arthur. Um, and before I turn it over to um, Councilmember Kalos and Councilmember Powers for questions, uh, I have just a couple of questions uh, myself. I know in one of the slides that you had brought up uh, about the residential tower, um, but if it is uh, rezoned to a C27, uh, what are the assurances that we have that you will build uh, the facility that you're proposing uh, and not a residential tower. I just wanted you to just go back to that. But well, thank you. First, let me answer and then uh, move it to Paul. Um, so if I said residential tower, it was a mistake. The tower is entirely for uh, academic and startup companies of different sizes in wet labs. It's entirely designed for wet laboratories. Offices and laboratories are the only thing that will be in the tower. Perhaps Paul can talk about how we would guarantee that we would build such a facility. So all is muted. You're muted. You gotta unmute yourself, Paul. Just did, you thank go. you. Uh, I'm sorry. So uh, while the zoning theoretically allows for a, a residential uh, tower to be built, uh, the first of all, I would say we wouldn't be going through this exercise, which has been very long and and very complex. Uh, if it, and and we wouldn't be. Uh, doing it to be here if we didn't want, if the blood center didn't want to be here and, and didn't have to be here to really make its future. So I think one, one I know it's, it's, not a, it's not a legal protection, but one protection that you have is that, that in fact, this is, this is really being done. This isn't the, being done for real estate. This is being done 
to create the life sciences hub that New York City wants and the blood center that the blood center needs for the future. There are ways of, uh, of ensuring from a legal perspective that uh, land can only be used in a certain way. Uh, city planning uh, and the council have both used restrictive declarations uh, to control uh, the use and development of property in the future. Uh, that certainly is an option which uh, is available to the council if it chooses to do that. And uh, we are open to discussing it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've heard a lot uh, about what is uh, not financially feasible uh, for the blood center, but uh, not anything that is apart from the proposed building. Uh, one, is there a smaller building than the, uh, you're proposing that would be uh, financially feasible? Um, and then also without insight into your finances, uh, how do we know for sure that there isn't a smaller alternative that would work? We've looked at this for over a decade, trying to figure out how exactly and how big the building would have to be. And this is the smallest building that we can come up with that is financially viable in order to make a new blood center on this site. Um, the building of the tower allows for more efficient building costs of the whole project. The smaller building as of right in and of itself costing almost $500 million is beyond all measure and beyond all uh, monies that the blood center has available to it. Okay. Um, and now I just want to go into the sort of shadow impact here. Uh, I assume that the uh, shadow impact could be reduced by narrowing some of the uh, upper floors. Um, why don't you make that adjustment to that proposal? Uh, and is there anything else that can be done to reduce the actual shadows uh, on the park? Well, clearly, uh, there by by reshaping the building uh, in different ways, uh, one can uh, impact and reduce and reduce the shadows. There are, uh, I would say. Uh, programmatic constraints on how far that can be done. And I think what I'm, I would do here is I would ask Melissa Sarko, who's the architect, to talk about why the, why, why the floor sizes as they are as they are and why the shape of the floors are as they are. That's not to say that there isn't something that could be done, but it is to say that whatever is done would take away from the efficiency and effectiveness of the project. Melissa, can you talk a little about that? Sure, I can. Um, so laboratory buildings, whether they're um, commercial in nature or academic in nature are planned on a very strict and rigorous planning module um, of 11 feet. So everything from the bench dimensions to the um, spacing of things is set up on that 11 foot module that includes the structure. Um, and that's set based on the uh, clearances that are required back to back with equipment and access and accessibility for um, safety and and um, and planning flexibility. Um, that also supports the ability to take a floor and reconfigure it. So as we all know, in the sciences, there's very little that's static. Um, things do change, technologies change, equipment changes. And so it's often necessary to reconfigure a laboratory facility in order to um, to keep up with the, the new technologies that are out there. And this planning module has been proven for decades to be the most efficient way to do that and is um, supported by the National Institute of Health and other um, institutions that, that look at laboratory planning and efficiencies. So part of what's driving our specific floor plate size um, at Center East is that the entire floor plate is divided on this 11 foot module. So when we talk about reducing floor plate sizes, we, we need to think of it in, you know, not, not five foot increments or three foot increments. We're really talking about 11 foot changes to, to the building in order to impact um, dimensional changes. Um, and right now we're holding at both the north and the south end of the building a um, essentially a 55 foot zone, a 22 foot uh, lab support zone and a 33 foot uh, open bench zone, which is a pretty standard uh, way of organizing a laboratory floor plate. Um, and that's essentially what's driving all of the tower dimensions of the project. Um, and that 30 foot 
uh, you know, essentially 30,000 square foot floor plate size that Paul had mentioned is um, an ideal size because it allows for a critical mass of uh, principal investigators to work collaboratively on a single floor. Um, and it also allows for that floor to then be um, subdivided depending on the size of the tenant who needs to take space in the building. And as we've, um, I think, indicated in our application, the intent here is that this project can support uh, investigators who are very small and starting up a business and then can grow in place and stay in New York City as they um, need to take more space in the building. Uh, so that's really what's driving that floor plate dimension. Um, and as Paul noted, sure, there are potential modifications, but they are, they're actually quite hard to achieve in a lab building and kind of stepping up or stepping back as you go farther up in a lab building is very atypical. You would, I think you'd see in most laboratory facilities in New York City that the lab floor plate is a very um, rigorous planning module that then is extruded straight up um, from, from the building um, in that manner. Okay, thank you. Uh, just uh, two more questions. Uh, typically, our zoning uh, and good planning practice encourage uh, large buildings on avenues uh, with smaller buildings uh, on mid blocks. Uh, could you explain how the height and the bulk are appropriate for a mid block uh, location? Well, there are a couple of there are a couple of reasons why we think that uh, the uh, building is an appropriate building here. Um, let's start with the fact that uh, uh, the there, there, the, the location is a very, very unique location for a very, very special building. Um, it's, it's the only location anywhere near uh, the hospital complex that uh, uh, the uh, that the blood center is part of that uh, has that that has both the ability of the blood center to possess it; it owns it. It's not, a, uh, it's not a site that's owned by a hospital. It's not a site that's owned by a school or used for school. It's not a site that's owned by an existing business that's operating there uh, and has no intention of leaving. Uh, it's, 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 it's an available site and not just an available site, but it's a site that also has the, the appropriate size, appropriate shape uh, and appropriate development history. Uh, for this kind of a use. It's a site that hasn't been used in res for residential purposes. So there's no displacement of tenants uh, as part of this process. There's no assemblage as part of this process. Um, that's a consideration. Uh, a second consideration is that this is a, this is a relatively unique uh, mid-block in a relatively unique mid-block setting. Um, it, it, is a, it is a mid-block that already has the blood center on it, uh, albeit in a lower building, but it also has two buildings that the, the city planning commission would have, has referred to in its uh, one of its reports on mid blocks as anomalies, which are the two eight FAR residential buildings that are to the east of the blood center. It's also across the street from a block that is very different from the traditional mid block. It has the JREC building and a park on it. Uh, both of which, uh, both of which make it an a an, sort of an atypical setting, uh, and it is also proximate. It is also in an area that has an, a, numbers of mid blocks that are are occupied by buildings that are again anomalies in the R eight B setting. Uh, in particular, we noted that uh, the two blocks to the south and and west. 65th to 63rd streets uh, between 2nd and 3rd avenues are almost entirely occupied by buildings that are more than 200 feet and that are not at all R8B types of buildings or R8B compliant buildings. So it's, it's an unusual mid block in an unusual setting and it is in a location that's really critical to the type of use that is being proposed here because of its proximity to the complex of institutions uh, that is on the east side. And that's not just because of the blood center has, has a history of working with these institutions. That is because this is one of the three premier academic medical complexes in Manhattan. 
and the city, the city's approach to its life science initiative is predicated on, on, on using life science clusters composed of institutions, uh, medical and academic institutions, and private companies working together uh, to generate the energy for the industry that then then is able to spin off into other other areas of town and and yes there are other life sciences facilities but the the life science life science industry takes its its strength and uh its energy from these core clusters and to not not use this uh this area not not take advantage of these institutions to create a cluster is a real missed opportunity for the city. So yes, there are, th there are reasons why in the normal course, one would not locate a very large building in the mid block. We think that in this case, the balance between the citywide benefits uh, of uh, promoting the life, science, uh, life sciences, both in terms of jobs and uh, in, in terms of uh, economic, uh, economic development, economic activity in New York uh, outweigh uh, the, uh, the considerations that you know, have historically kept uh, mid blocks uh, at a lower density than the avenues. I'd also note that, that actually one block to the east uh, in, the, the, in, in, in a corridor that has uh, a number of hospital buildings, the mid blocks, have in fact have in fact uh, are in fact developed with taller buildings so the 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 type of use here uh the type of building that this is 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 a type of building that has appeared in other mid blocks nearby okay thank you paul my last question before i turn it over to my colleagues um the eis uh identifies impacts from construction noise uh on neighboring buildings uh, could you just go uh, a little bit more into what that impact would be and how you plan to mitigate it? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, Ann Locke uh, from AKRF or one of her colleagues to talk about uh, the, the base mitigation. Um, I will simply say it, it, before they start that the, the, the point of what we are, we are proposing for JREC is to make a real difference, both during construction and after, on the, the the facilities that are used for special needs children who are especially sensitive to noise, and and we recognize that as part of our process. Now, in in, in the ordinary course, there are also noise mitigation measures that are taken uh, to address construction activities, and I'll ask Anne or her colleague to to speak to that. Uh, hi, so I'm Dan Abadamarco from AKRF. I'm Ann Locke's colleague, and uh, I, I was the task leader for the construction noise analysis, and I can speak to some of the, the mitigation uh, for construction noise here, especially the, you know, we touched on some of the, the options specifically for JREC, but there's also measures that are taken on site, which control the noise uh, at its source and apply to all of the surrounding receptors. Uh, so in addition to compliance with all of the New York City noise code, uh, noise controls, there are specific project commitments uh, that are included here uh, that, that go beyond what a, you know, an everyday construction site in New York City would have to do. And those include noise emission level limits for certain key pieces of construction equipment. So uh, individual pieces, each individual piece of construction equipment is held to a noise emission level limit by the code. But in some cases, there are pieces that are held to a, a lower limit specifically for this project. There's also uh, a commitment where feasible to use taller than typical noise barriers uh, to limit the travel of noise from on the site to the surrounding receptors. Uh, and, and the staging of equipment within the site has generally, uh, has generally been configured to limit the amount of noise that would reach the surrounding receptors and, and especially the most sensitive receptors, including the, the school uses uh, to the north of the site J, uh, at JRAC. So, so those are, you know, that's, that's a, a brief summary of the 
on site noise controls, especially those that go beyond what's typical or required by code. Uh, and then also as part of the construction noise mitigation, there is the offer for uh, facade enhancement or provision of alternate means of ventilation, which really is intended to allow receptors that are predicted to experience uh, elevated levels of construction noise uh, to, to be able to reduce their interior noise levels. So if you have an air conditioner, you're able to keep your windows closed. And if, uh, if you don't have insulated glass windows, the offer of storm windows allows you to, to have more transmission loss to keep that noise outside and, and reduce your interior levels. And then there's the, the bullets that we saw earlier for the, for specifically for JREC. Okay, thank you um, very much. That's uh, all the questions uh, that I have. Um, I want to turn it over now to um, my colleagues. Uh, I know we have Councilmember Kalos. Uh, just a reminder to my colleagues, uh, there is a 10 minute uh, limit for uh, the first round of questions. If you want to come back for a second round, it will be for five minutes. We have a large number of uh, uh, folks from the public that wish to testify and we want to get uh, to them uh, as quickly as possible. So I please ask you to stick to the uh, strict time limit here. Um, thank you in advance. And now let me turn it over to Council Member Kalos. Thank you, Chair Moya, for the uh, thought of uh, questioning. I want to thank more than a thousand people who signed my petition and more than 200 people who have signed up to testify in opposition to Longfellow Commercial Tower Project is currently proposed uh, by the Blood Center. I appreciate having the uh, 10 minutes, wish it was more, we'll work with what we have. I will tell you that the 200 people who I've invited uh, want to get as many answers as possible. Uh, so I know they don't mind waiting because we've been in close communication. I wanna start by uh, thanking the Blood Center for all the work you do and your impressive presentation. I'm committed to working with the Blood Center to build a new building at this location, regardless of what happens in this land use process. I have worked with my community to find a middle ground that provides the Blood Center with 100,000 additional square feet, more than the Blood Center is even asking for for themselves in this rezoning. If we're unable to find a path forward in this land use process, I've already identified at least one developer who is interested in constructing a new building for the Blood Center likely at no cost. In my district, we love biotech. In 2014, I approved a rezoning to build three city blocks of new biotech space over the FDR drive. This year, we announced a new biotech incubator with Rockefeller University that I spent eight years working on. I even cut the ribbon on the new Cornell Tech Campus, the Tata Innovation Center for Tech Transfer, and the new Belfer Research Building that also hosts a biotech incubator. And I was there for that ribbon cutting too. Along those lines, I'm committed to working with Longfellow for them to also open additional biotech space. We have an even larger parcel in the neighborhood and have located nearly 1 million square feet of vacant commercial office space for Longfellow within blocks of the Blood Center at 919 3rd Avenue and 625 Madison Avenue with the floor plate sizes 40,000, 45,000, these are hard to find, but I found them for you. Everyone can win. Blunt Center gets a new building. Longfellow in our city gets twice as much biotech space. Our nearby commercial towers get new tenants. Students at Julie Richmond can still have sunlight on their playground and thousands of hospital workers and children can still enjoy the sunshine at St. Catharines Park, the only park in the neighborhood. A win, 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 win. Never heard of it, but we can do it. Uh, I hope we can get it done. And let me just jump into some questions. The first question is, how many square feet of space would the blood center occupy in the new building as proposed? And is that more or less than could be built under the current zoning? So I'm just looking for a more or less. Donna? Hi, I'm Donna Gargano, consultant to the Blood Center. Um, we would be occupying slightly more than what could be currently, what we currently have now. Um, I, I think that the real issue though- so uh, To be clear, because this is testimony under oath, um, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, your proposal under this rezoning is to only occupy about 206,000 square feet. Is that correct or not? 
Melissa, if you could just chime in, I don't have the chart handy for square footage. Could you just chime in with the exact square footage? Um, and while she's bringing that up, if um, I might just continue. The, the I, I'm, just, I'm asking for the answer to the question. So we're Melissa, could you just adding zoning committee. Place? The specific question is how many square feet are you going to occupy? I know during your presentation, you have that number. Uh, can, can any of the 30 folks on the call just tell me whether uh, there's 206,000 square feet thereabouts or? Yes, that, that's a correct statement. 206,000 square feet of uh, gross square footage for the blood center in this proposal. Is, and the as of right would be 210, 229,092 gross square feet. Is that correct? That sounds right, yes. Is 206,000 more or less than 229,000? It's 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 like it's slightly more. Okay, so the the as of right, you actually get more than under your rezoning. Now, under this proposal, and if you want to pull up the slides, you're welcome to. Two thirds of this new tower is for Longfellow, not the blood center. Is that correct? Yes or no? That is correct. Would the blood center have any ownership or control over the Longfellow commercial labs? We, we would not have ownership, but there would be um, a joint control overseeing condominium board to control um, big picture operation of the building in concert with Longfellow. Would the blood center have final authority over Longfellow's tenants? Yes or no? We would not, we would have joint say, we would not have final control as envisioned. Uh, and so this is a condominium structure. That's correct. Okay. So the commercial labs, in order to use the commercial lab, would a tenant be required to work with the blood center? Yes or no? I'm sorry. Are you referring to the core facilities, council member? In order for somebody to lease a space in the Longfellow lab, would they have to work with the blood center? Yes or no? Uh, Chris, I would welcome you to- uh, Well, I believe they would work with the blood center. I'm not sure that we've envisioned through the governance structure that we've talked about, Donna talked about, we have not set out bylaws that would require them to at present. But the concept is that there'll be tremendous interaction between the core facilities of the blood center, as you know, and I, I this tower. I'm just saying that I, I, I'm an attorney, people are bound by laws, and so at this point, you were saying, while well, you would love for the tenants to collaborate with the blood center, uh, there would not be a legal requirement. Uh, you know, if I may add something, council member, the concept here is not just- is I'm not, not asking the concept, I'm just asking legally. Concept, the concept, this, this, involves with, this involves the legal structure. The concept is a life sciences hub that will also serve the other institutions in the will area. The That's a part of this, and therefore, I would be surprised. I don't know because it hasn't been finally negotiated. But I would be surprised that there were, if there were a limitation to uh, uh, commercial tenants to dealing only with the blood center. Uh, will they be required to only deal with specific institutions on the east side? If somebody has a great idea and they need a biotech space, but they are working with a facility in Brooklyn, will they be allowed to use your space? or is it only for tenants in geographic proximity? I can't imagine that we wouldn't allow them to use the space. Okay, so there, there is no requirement that the tenants have a relationship with Blood Center or any of the nearby medical institutions. Not as envisioned. Okay, now um, I wanna thank you again for the great work you do. How many years will your 310 East 67th Street location be closed during construction? And well, were those, where will their activities from that site occur? I think the uh, timeline envisions approximately three years. Um, uh, there are various timelines that go a little longer than that. And we would find swing space to move our laboratories out but our basic science laboratories, the institutions, I'm not sure where we'll, there will go, meaning the 10 biotech companies, I'm not sure where they'll go at the moment. 
what will happen to New York City's blood supply while 310 East 67th Street is uh, no longer online. We'll do everything in our power to maintain it. Or do you have any other locations that can supplement 310 East 67th Street to maintain our blood supply during your construction? Well, the blood donors, as you well know, don't give blood only in that building. So we have 28 fixed sites around the cities that, that we have a map of all of our sites. I think it's well known that we don't collect blood only at that facility. And is that facility where you distribute blood and, and treat blood and test blood from? Not only. So where, where, where will the bulk of that work come from? At the moment, a majority of, of the testing type work happens in Rhode Island and in Minneapolis. The samples are sent out of state for that. The manufacturer can be done in a variety of our centers. Great. Uh, I, before proposing this zoning, did the blood center consider other locations like the Tasty Building in West Harlem? Yes. Uh, why not invest in a uh, low-income community of color and bring biotech uh, to that location? If I recall, uh, council member, the Tasty Building was very expensive in rent, wanted retail on the uh, lower floors and did not have the space to accommodate us. We visited it twice. You've argued that the project must be located here as opposed to elsewhere. Time expired because of proximity to major research institutions to the east. If proximity is so important, why are the life sciences developers and the city uh, pursuing projects on 11th Avenue on the far west side, East 42nd, the Proton Center, which was recently built in East Harlem, uh, in Long Island City, Queens, Brooklyn Navy Yard. Would you, uh, would you argue that we shouldn't be doing that? You know, I don't think, I don't think council member that we've said that proximity is the be all and end all. I think we've said, first of all, that it is very meaningful and very helpful. And we know that because that's why people have universities. That's why they have medical schools. That's why we have law firms. That's why city councils get together and, and you know, operate, I think, much better when they're talking in, in person rather than Zoom. So I think, I think personal contact means a lot. Is it, is, it, is it, you know, can you get by without it? Sure. You can, but this the 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 purpose here is to try to do what is best to try to create the best possible facility. And I that, would argue that a number of those facilities will have challenges due to their locations. Uh, if with the chair's indulgence, I have two more questions in this line, and I'm happy to wait for the second round of questions. I'm going to ask uh, you to please hurry. Uh, yes. On that. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, in your testimony. Two more minutes. Yes, in your testimony, Paul Selber, you mentioned uh, plenty of 25,000 to 40,000 square foot floor plates being used all over the city for life sciences. How many of those are in residential districts? Um, probably, you know, I think a, a number of them. I think Mount Sinai's, Mount Sinai's are. I think that uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to, honestly, since I'm under oath, I'd want to check it, council member, and I will check it, and we can come back to that at the second round, if you like. Thank you. And in your testimony, Paul Selver, you stated under oath that there are other buildings in mid blocks nearby in the district. Are those buildings directly across the street from the only playground in the neighborhood? I think you know the answer to the question as well as I do. The answer is they are not across the street from uh, that park. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. I'll reserve my questions for the second round. Thank you, um, Council Member. Uh, before we go to Council Member Powers, um, I just want to recall the vote. Um, uh, council, if uh, you can, uh, Council Member Borelli would like to clarify his vote. Thank you, Chair. Uh, for a clarification on the land use vote, Council Member Borelli. Uh, to be clear, it, it's a pleasure to interrupt Council Member Powers, uh, but on the vote, I will vote aye on all except land use 842, 843, and 844. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chair, the uh, land use items are adopted by a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, except LU numbers 842, 843, and 844, which are adopted by a vote of six in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. Uh, the uh, clarified vote is uh, adopted and referred to the full land use committee. 
Thank you, uh, Arthur. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Powers uh, for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos as well, and the Blood Center, of course, for your presentation. Um, I'm just going to jump right into questions. So we've seen a new presentation, of course, from the uh, Blood Center, which we had an opportunity to see last week. Um, so we saw a new plan with a 50 foot reduction to the building, which I think was uh, you know, attention to address the community feedback about uh, the folks who are concerned, obviously, in the neighborhood about the lack of sunlight on the only green space within walking distance to their home and the uh, concerns about the precedent to the zoning in the neighborhood. Uh, just a kind of big question to start this off. Are there other accommodations, whether it's size or shape of building, that the Blood Center and Longfellow are willing to make to address those concerns? I think the presentation has uh, shown some new adjustments to sunlight and uh, uh, impact on green space and size, of course, but wanted to get a sense of other accommodations or changes that the uh, blood center has considered or is willing to make as uh, to address those concerns. Well, I think we would absolutely be interested in a good faith negotiation with the council and council members. Um, the last time we started to try and have that discussion, I believe you were a part of that conversation and our uh, attempts to address some of this were listed as embarrassing and offensive and uh, one other word. Um, but something along those lines. But yes, I think we, we have been in looking for the opportunity to discuss it. Okay. Um, uh, do you have any, any, so anything you want to uh, share with us in terms of other thoughts? I understand how folks might have described those uh, uh, discussions in the past, but just wanted to hear while we have a public hearing here, any other thoughts on what the Blood Center and Longfellow have thought about in terms of other ways to uh, mitigate those concerns? I think the categories have always been the park, JREC, and the height. And I think that those, um, we've tried to improve on all of those at present. Okay. Um, one of them is the park, obviously. And uh, I believe it's part of your efforts here. You've talked about a mitigation fund to fund improvements at St. Catherine Park, St. Catherine's Park um, of a few million dollars here. Can you tell us just how you arrived at that number? And I think, I think it's called a shadow fund, uh, but maybe you can share with us what that would be money would be spent on to help address any impact of shadows. And uh, if you've discussed that with the parks department at this point in time. Actually, council member, the, uh, uh, the, the, this, the uses of the funds and the amount of the funds uh, came out of discussions with the parks department. Um, they had three improvements that they wanted to make or three areas of improvements that they wanted to make to the park, at least as, as as, as we were told, uh, one was to the Western play area. And I don't remember the definition of that, but it was, as I recall, very general. Uh, there was a very specific item, uh, I think involving resurfacing one of the play areas on the Eastern side. And there was a general concept plan for improving the comfort station. And the money that we gave, uh, which was arrived at after discussions with the parks department can be used for anyone or all uh, of the those three projects. Okay, and, and uh, uh, so you've had conversations with the Parks Department, there would be regulations or this is just conceptual thoughts on what would be spent or would they would there be sort of requirements on how that money is spent? Um, I, 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 don't think so. I don't think any requirements have been put on how the money is to be spent so far. Okay. Um, I know the alternative locations has been a topic of discussion. Uh, you mentioned it earlier in your, uh, uh, as one of your uh, myths or misconceptions that you wanted to talk about, but it's been brought up by obviously Councilor Kalos and other members of the community about looking for uh, locations where there might be more receptiveness to uh, the blood center and Longfellow. Could you, do you want, can you share this just your, uh, efforts to explore alternative locations for this development and maybe elaborate on why those locations were not feasible or didn't work for the project that you're proposing? We looked at a number of places that are currently built and places that could be built. Some of them have been owned by the city, some in Bronx, the Harlem, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Navy Yards. We've looked below 14th Street, 
in, uh, in Manhattan, we've looked at a number of possible locations on the west side. For whatever reasons, and it's beyond sort of a complete listing under testimony about why they weren't feasible, they're not feasible for a variety of, of important reasons physically or, or cost-wise. And I know that the council member in my district is set that proximity doesn't matter. Um, but all of the <clears throat> great biotech hubs, and there are academic articles written about this, are about proximity. This is a site we, we own, it's in proximity, and we already have the clustering. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'll keep moving. Um, uh, you, you've stated that your endowment alone cannot cover the cost of the redevelopment of the blood center by itself, which of course would then be able to accommodate a, a proposal that other, you know, that many both folks in the communities, your neighbors have been asking for something more modest. Can, can you talk to us about or give us some uh, understanding of why the endowment doesn't allow for this to be built or to be help finance the details of the, the of the uh, of the finance project and yeah and and you know I think the, obviously the, the the life sciences here is intended to be a, a finance partially financing mechanism for the redevelopment of blood center. Can you talk to us about the endowment and what allows or doesn't allow you to spend that money and why that's not a option here in terms of financing this project? Sure. So as a non-attorney, I'll say it this way. Endowments usually have a capital E in their legal structures where a certain amount has to be spend on, spent on certain things. This is not a monies that were given to us and endowed to us. These monies came in through research and development projects that have been accumulated over time. It allows us to have a research institute. Almost every other major blood center and blood system in the country has given up their research institute because they can't spend any money above and beyond blood products. We don't believe that taxing blood products and services to sickle cell patients and others should make for our R&D efforts, which are about a $25 million effort per annum. <clears throat> the blood center keeps the endowment, and we think it would be imprudent to use the endowment to build out this new building at this level because it is there for essentially a rainy day fund and it rains a lot in New York. It has rained many times on the blood center. As I said, my calculations about a year ago were that we'd lost $110 million over the course of, of 12 years in the downturn in blood utilization. It's there to protect us in emergencies and to help us fund research and other things. Um, that said, the city could kick in uh, dollars, but as all of the people on the call know, the proposed building as of right is almost $500 million. It's well beyond all of the net worth, bricks and mortar and everything of the Blood Center. And is, has the city offered money here when, from EDC for life sciences or other money? Uh, I, I think we discussed that, but has there been any offer public funding to help with this project, whether in the, the as a right format or in the uh, proposed rezoning? No. No, okay. Is EDC able to provide funding uh, for life sciences? It's my understanding they do have some funding available to help. Uh, well, I think, I think you're right. And you know, I should be cautious about when you're talking about funding exactly what it implies, because whether you're talking about cash or capital or IDA funds. So uh, EDC has uh, agreed in principle and is working with us and our partners with Longfellow uh, to provide uh, IDA related funds and enhancements. Do you know how much that totals? At this, do you know how much that totals? I really don't. Can you provide, can you get us uh, after the hearing uh, a follow up on that? I sure can. You see us here as well. Um, I, just a couple more questions and I want to hand it back to, to colleagues and Councilman Kalos. There's been obviously one of the concerns here that's been uh, brought up by the neighbors is, and I know, I know Paul had raised this, but I think it's worth just coming back to is the, you know, the precedent setting about, you know, institutions, you know, building, here in the neighborhood. And while I think everybody understands the clear purpose here, when the blood centers role here in the city and life sciences role in the past and I mean, the present and future in the city, lots of the East side obviously has lots of institutions here, lots who may also look to expand at some point in the near future. 
Is there, uh, can you talk about precedent here when we talk about, you know, deciding to go, you know, beyond what's currently allowed in the zoning and what would prevent other you know, institutions here, maybe ones that have different plans or different intentions or different purpose that's far I'm expired. Sorry, but that'll wrap it up here. From seeking similar accommodations uh, uh, when it comes to redevelopment. I guess I, I can I just do I have time to try to answer that? Of course. Or try to respond to it. Look, you know, there are there there are a series of I guess let me start this. When, when you look at precedent, you, you look at at, at similarities, uh, at, at reasons, at, at important similarities, why something should, why you should make a decision that follows uh, a prior pattern because the the uh, considerations in making that decision are so much are so much alike. We just don't think that exists here. We don't think that exists because you don't have the combination of the site already assembled, no residents, owned by the uh, owned by the user and ready to go, together with the location, which is a very good location uh, in terms of its relationship to other institutions that it works with and in relationship to the, to the city's longer term goals. It's a good location relative to mass transit. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's not uh, what I would call the, the, the sort of the classic R8B mid block. Uh, it's, it's a much more, it's, it's, it's on a block that has anomalies and is in a more diverse setting. So I think it would be very hard, if not impossible, to find an, another set of facts that even approach this, uh, especially in the context of, uh, you know, a very strong public policy in favor of uh, the the jobs and the economic activity that the life sciences will bring. Okay, I have one last question. It's very short. I just one piece of this is crossing over into Second Avenue, taking in some parcels, obviously in the Fourth Council, which is my my district. I I just wanted to hear the explanation or justification for sort of the expansion here to the other parcels that obviously don't include the blood center and why there was a decision made by the applicant or some other entity here to, you know, go past what the direct applicant, you know, the direct project is. Uh, it's kind of confused me and I'm just trying to get a better understanding of that. Sure. Well, you know, we actually looked at a variety of different, when we were studying this from the, 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 the standpoint of, of what the right approach to rezoning was, we looked at a variety of things and we consulted uh, uh, HRNA, Carl Weisbrod and uh, Purnima Kapoor, uh, both very well respected planners who you know, about what they thought we should be doing and, and, and about our, you know, the, the, whether our project made sense from a planning standpoint. They, they, and I had a lot of discussions with them about this actually, whether, whether you know, what we should do relative to both uh, the blood center site, the balance of the mid block and the avenue frontage. And, and the, the avenue frontage presented an interesting situation because the uh, C28 zone that we are proposing to move one block north from 66 to 67th street uh, was mapped to 66th Street in 1961. We don't really know why because the records of the, the, the people who did that just don't exist. And they probably wouldn't have mentioned it anyway, but, uh, but we think it's because C2 is a zone that allows movie theaters until Sloan Kettering built their facility between 65th and 66th Street on the east side of 2nd Avenue. There was a movie theater, the Beekman there, uh, and that therefore it made sense to extend the C28 north uh, as far as 66th Street, north of 66th Street, that didn't exist. Between 1961 and today, um, the, a, a number of theaters opened uh, in the building on the west side of 2nd Avenue between 66th and 67th. Those theaters are there by special permit. Um, it seemed to us, following what we believe to be the reasonable logic of uh, the people who drafted the ordinance, that it made sense as a kind of cleanup matter to take the C2 one block north. It didn't change the commercial FAR. 
It didn't change the residential FAR. It didn't change the community facility FAR. The only thing it did was allow a certain number of additional uses uh, in on, on that block, uses that are, you know, today as of right, one block south, and in and one of which already exists on the block. So, so we thought it made sense, uh, frankly, as a cleanup matter. Uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect the blood center at all, obviously. Thank you. I'll hand it back to the chair and stick around. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Kalos. Um, I just want to remind the Sergeant at Arms that we are now moving to five minutes for the second round of questions. Uh, and then if any one of my colleagues uh, have questions for this panel, uh, please raise uh, the raise hand button so that we can um, get the order in which uh, we will have folks uh, ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to my colleague, Councilmember Keith Powers, for the great questions. Uh, in the rush on my last two questions, I lack specificity in stating residential broadly instead of low density residential of four FAR or less. Uh, a question that's been referenced is just how much is the endowment of blood center enterprises and your related entities? The, uh, the endowment obviously varies with the stock market uh, and its investments. And it runs, uh, I think in my tenure, it's been somewhere around 248 to 325 million. Uh, you keep testifying under oath that the building is some $500 million, but your presentation pegged the cost of the new blood center at $325 million. Uh, for the sake of specificity, which number is it? Both numbers are right, council member. The $325 million is the value added to the blood center and it's billed when it's built in conjunction with an FAR that's in the eight to 10 range as we've proposed and, um, and is in part due to the size and, and, and uh, uh, the value of essentially buying in bulk. The, if we were to build the center <clears throat> at the 75 foot as of right height, um, that 465, I think it's $465 million number is also correct. Thank you. Um, so in this proposal, you are asking us to print about $400,000 in air rights. What is your valuation of those air rights? How much, how much per square foot? Well, I'm not actually asking you to print anything. And uh, I don't understand exactly why you uh, say to me all the time that uh, essentially the city's making uh, a payment on these amounts of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, what the city is doing, uh, if possible, is allowing us to build such that we can do great things for our city at a time of critical need. Uh, in building, terms of the post building. value, in terms of the post valuation, I'd refer to my colleagues at Longfellow. I really don't know. Um, if, if I can just add, layer in and add a little bit of clarification, um, in the building as proposed, council member, the value of the square footage that Longfellow gets benefit of to build the um, floors up above, um, I think they're roughly getting. And Melissa can check the exact number. Roughly. About 300,000 FAR, and um, the math is a, a, a little in excess of $1,000 in FAR, which covers the $326 million portion of the overall construction budget to deliver the building and to, to deliver the blood center, our condominium portion of our fit out space. So that's the $326 million um, that Dr. Hillier has referenced. Great. The community is offering 100,000 FAR as a full, full build uh, in between. Uh, it, it's pretty close to 300,000 that you need for initially offered Longfellow. That would be going from printing essentially 326 million to 108 million. Uh, is that enough? Why can't we build something with that, for, with that extra 108 million dollars in added benefit? I'm not sure I understand the question or could follow the math at that moment. Why don't we you submit a proposal and we can look at it? 
Uh, sure, the, the community is offering a, a full build out proposal within the 75 feet uh, so that you can add another 100,000 FAR to your as of right. The community? Yes, I've been working with the community. The community spent considerable resources and time trying to find a way to meet you in the middle. And it is something that uh, we mentioned to you, we've mentioned to the mayor's office. Uh, so just trying to get a sense for whether the $100 million is enough or if, if it's anything less than 326 million, it's just, we can't do it. Council member, are you, are you referring to the full build to fill in the courtyards, no, no rear yard? So basically a 75 foot tall building, full block? That's correct. Um, so we had Len Lease, a uh, general contractor that has been consulting to the project, price out that building as was in the slide presentation. Um, because we don't have the benefit of shared costs for demolition, excavation, foundation, mechanicals, first floor, um, the shorter building uh, is being estimated to cost about $463 million. Time expired. So, so I, I guess on, on that note, in your final environmental impact statement, the no action alternative describes what would happen if the pros project is not approved. And so under your current proposal, the blood center would still build itself a brand new, under this, under this no action, you would still brand build a new 229 square foot split between 188,931 square feet for the blood center, uh, which is about the same amount of space as you're planning and then still leave 40,000 square feet of excess space for medical and biotech. Um, so is that a building you will build if this doesn't move forward? Uh, and if, if that one isn't feasible, what about this building where you'd have another 100,000 square feet? Let me, let me try to answer the question because we don't like to answer hypothetical questions, particularly hypothetical. It was in the finance, final environmental which are, impact statement. Which, which are particularly hypothetical questions that are, are have an existential quality. Look, if this project is not approved, the blood center will have, uh, have some difficult decisions to make. There's no question about it. Um, whether it will redevelop its own site purely as of right with some variation, uh, 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 presuming to some kind of zoning variance, uh, whether it'll go somewhere else, those are questions that will have to be debated. We think that it is reasonable for the purposes of analysis to assume that it will stay here. Since it's going to have to spend a lot of money anyway, if, this, uh, uh, if, it, if it is to develop a new home uh, and uh, this, 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 this project is not approved. I mean, it could also, by the way, just stay where it is in its facility if this project is not approved in order to protect its endowment. So I think the, the, the you know, part of, the, part of that question is, involves a decision by the blood center as to how it wants to spend resources that it uses for critical research into non-commercially, uh, non-commercially non uh, 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 fundable uh, solutions and cures. Uh, how it wants to use an endowment that it uses, as Chris said, uh, to be there as a safety net when we have a crisis like COVID or, or Sandy or 9-11. You know, the, the, it, 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 it may be a difficult decision, but it, it could decide that it would prioritize having a new home over those other things. Certainly the people who are saying that's what it should do are taking that position. So I think that 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 we don't really know. We think, again, what we suggested in the uh, EIS was a reasonable approach since the blood center already owns the site. And since uh, for EIS purposes, we had to assume that the building would be as of right. Because as you know, count, council member, the no action solution is really no action. It means this other solution that that's people have talked about, which modifies rear yard and, and lot coverage it is, not a, is not a no action solution. It's not, a, it's not what the EIS requires. So we did what we needed to do and we did it in a way that we felt was reasonable. All right, and then just close. Uh, uh, I gotta cut you off. We are 
we are well above the five minute time limit here. Uh, I've given you an additional four minutes since then, uh, and I need to now turn it over uh, to Council Member Reynoso, who has his hand up, uh, and then we need to go to uh, the public because we have a long list of people who are waiting to testify. So I thank you very much, uh, Council Member Carlos, uh, for your questions. Uh, and now I want to turn it over to Council Member Reynoso. Starting time. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you, Chair Moya um, and Councilmember Kalos and Powers. Just um, want to like a lot of clarifying questions here. It really doesn't feel like, you know, I, I just want to understand more and I don't think um, we're all there. Um, oh, why did you bring the, the height of the building down from its original from its original height? What motivated you to do that? Or was that a request from, this, from the community um, related to the shadows? And if you can answer con as concisely and quickly as possible, so I can ask as many questions as possible. It, it, it was, it was, it was, it was to reduce the shadows. To reduce the shadows. Um, is the idea here that the research portion um, of the center um, is there to finance uh, the work that you do? Um, is there's no, there's no gotcha moment here. It's just you're looking to lease a space to be able to fund your work. Yes, and the building and the build of the building. Oh, and the actual build of the building to finance the build of the building. Um, in the space that you are in now, um, you know, the council member Kittles asked the question about uh, whether or not you're getting more or less square footage. Um, I just want to talk about the space that you are in now. Um, is it an ideal build out for the work that you want to do or that you need to do? Um, or would the new building uh, be laid out slightly differently so that even if it is less square footage, um, you know, the work that can possibly be done there might be more efficient or maximized. Well, I'm, I'd be happy to have the architects and Donna chime in, but I think you're very wise in pointing out and appropriately so that the efficiencies would have to have improved since 1930. Yes, yeah, most definitely. It would be uh, much more efficiently laid out. There's a tremendous amount of wasted excess space. Um, this used to be um, a, a technical high school, so it wasn't perfectly built. Um, and I think that's where I was going with the initial question from the council member. In addition, um, we would be able to support uh, double the amount of principal investigators as we are currently able to. So we um, project to be able to accommodate 27 principal investigators in the new building compared to the room that we have currently, which is less than 13. Okay. Um, in, in the research and the work that you would do, um, two, you have two things that are important to me. Um, I'm looking to do a uh, black women's health or uh, maternal health and uh, morbidity. Uh, black women are dying at 12 times the rate as any other women during childbirth. Um, and we're looking to do something in Brooklyn, it's not in Manhattan, um, to really bring that number down and start making uh, it much safer for black women to have babies in the city of New York. Can you just expand a bit? I mean, it was interesting to see that slide. Can you just expand a bit on the work that the blood sensor does specifically addressing the issue of uh, women's more mobility during childbirth? Absolutely, and, and please let me commend you on the work that you have planned and we would look forward to working with you wherever borough would be most appropriate and helpful. Uh, I really can't um, draw more attention to this important piece of, of the morbidity and mortality puzzle. And it's hard to know. There are multi, multiple pieces of it that are very important. So we'll think things like access and early diagnosis and prenatal counseling. Let's leave those for a moment and go to what the blood center does. The blood center provides blood products and those aren't just red blood, they're clotting products and platelet products. And what you'll find is in very complicated deliveries, women will bleed to death. And it's terrible when it happens. And so we have to ensure that the right products are in the right place, in the right quantities at the right time. And we do everything in our power to, to do that. It's not a surprise that emergency blood products have to be in emergency rooms and operating rooms, but they have to be in delivery suites and they have to be prepared for these disastrous events. And we have a very, very strongly committed group of doctors in fetal maternal and transfusion that are related to fetal maternal hemorrhage and trying to make sure those events don't happen. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. It's a, it's a very important thing. Um, you know, we have historical health uh, complications that exist, especially with black women um, that are often overlooked by, um, by you know, medical experts. 
Um, and I'm looking to, to really change that. Um, I just want to say, uh, you know, for me, and I think a lot of people, you know, the blood center has like a great reputation, has done great work in the city. And I, I would just hope that, you know, we can have ongoing conversations here um, and come to a place where, you know, everyone's happy. Um, so uh, good, good luck on that. Uh, but um, I really appreciate you taking the time here um, and hope that you and uh, Councilman Kittles can sit more um, and get to a place where we could all be happy. But thank you so much for this opportunity, Chair. Um, just want to close up. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Reynoso. Uh, let me turn to our council to see if we have any other council members uh, that have any questions for this panel. Uh, no, Chair. It appears we have uh, no additional questions for members for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the blood center proposal? Yes. For members of the public uh, who are here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in panels up to four names at a time. If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the New York Blood Center proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing on the council website. Uh, just a quick procedural note, as a reminder to all public participants, uh, we do have a large number of registrations and we are doing everything that we can to hear from everyone and entails uh, a great deal of behind the scenes technical coordination. For that reason, we do ask that for anyone who has signed up and logged in and waiting to testify, and if you can hear me, it means you are in the right place and that we will get to you uh, in turn. And uh, further ask that you refrain from using the raise hand button. We will get to everyone in turn who has signed up um, and uh, we, we ask for and appreciate your patience. And with that, we will now hear from the first panel. The first panel chair will include New York State Assembly member Rebecca Seawright, uh, New York State Senator Liz Kruger, followed by uh, US Representative Carolyn Maloney. Rebecca Seawright. Do we have the assemblywoman? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning I'd like to thank the New York City. Good morning. I'd like to uh, thank the New York City Council Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises and my former colleague, uh, Chair Francisco Moya. It's good to see all of you this morning. And I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to testify today on behalf of my 133,000 constituents. Welcome to um, all who have joined us against this unjustifiable threat to the quality of life of our community. Uh, I'm Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright representing the 76th Assembly District, parts of the Upper East Side of Manhattan and Roosevelt Island. I chair the Assembly Majority Steering Committee in Albany and some of the committees I serve on are ways, means, judiciary codes and education. The New York Blood Center is a highly valued neighbor and our community has always been good neighbors and supported their vital work and mission. It's now time for the Blood Center to be a good neighbor. We want the Blood Center to expand and modernize and succeed. They can achieve all of these goals without putting our children at risk and destroying the character of our community. The plan to demolish their low rise headquarters on East 67th Street and build a massive 33 story high rise commercial office tower and complex is poorly conceived and makes a mockery of our hard fought and sensible zoning rules. These rules protect mid block locations from massive towers oversaturation and unnecessary intrusions that threaten our health and safety. 
you know, you all know about traffic congestion here, but that is just the beginning. The megastructure will attract up to 2,500 daily employees. That's 50,000 more people flooding into East 67th Street every month. The size and bulk of the shaft will cast dark shadows over St. Catharines Park, a neighborhood jewel and sanctuary of sunlight. And we know as we stand outside Julia Richmond Education Complex and the six schools inside, one of which teaches students with autism will lose its ambient light, which has proven to be necessary to the well being of our children. Does it make sense to build a biosafety level three laboratory so close to our schools, children's schools, and playgrounds? One vendor in the field described this facility as a laboratory that typically includes work on microbes that can cause serious or potentially lethal disease through inhalation. Examples of this worked with a BSL-3 include yellow fever, while NAR virus and the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. To date, we have heard very little from the blood center in response to the serious community concerns. Such behavior is unacceptable. Planning and zoning rules are designed to accommodate reasonable development and preserve the character and quality of the neighborhood. If we let down our guard to this threat, more ill-conceived proposals will follow. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, always good to see you. Thank you for your testimony today. Who do we have up next, Arthur? Uh, Mr. Chair, it appears that Councilmember Kalos has a hand raised. Uh, well, why don't we go through the panelists first, and then uh, he can ask questions at the end. Understood. Uh, the actually the 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 rest of the announced panel has not yet arrived, so Assemblymember uh, C. Wright was the only oh, last okay. speaker on that panel. Uh, is the Assemblywoman still still on with us? Uh, it appears that uh, we have uh, Senator Liz Kruger, I see, uh, has come on. So why don't we go through uh, uh, the Senator's testimony and Ben, you can ask uh, after uh, uh, the Senator goes, you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, welcome, Senator Kruger. Uh, you can start uh, whenever you like. Thank you very much. It's nice to see my council colleagues, if not in person, um, in little Zoom boxes, which is how the New York State Senate operates much of the time also. Appreciate you giving me a few minutes today. Um, I'm here to reiterate what I think you're going to hear over and over again as people from my community um, have signed up in large numbers to testify. Uh, but today I'm joining um, Council Member Ben Kalos, our Borough President Gil Brewer, Rebecca Seawright, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, Community Board 8, the group Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, and literally hundreds of residents of the community in urging this council to vote down the zoning request. As you've already heard, and you will continue to hear, no one is opposed to the work of the Blood Center, just the opposite. We all support the work of the Blood Center. We support the work of life science expansion in the five boroughs. We simply cannot accept this radical rezoning in a mid-block residential neighborhood that will actually set, and you understand this council members, as a precedent to challenge the zoning of hundreds of mid-blocks um, on Manhattan Island under current zoning law. A 334 foot mid block tower would be, would create severe and in unmitigatable impacts on the surrounding neighborhood, particularly this amazing complex of six schools with over 2000 students just across the street and a beloved park, because for those of you who don't know Manhattan, we don't have parks. And so this is a one park that is available in a very large zone and it would be found pretty much unusable for much of the day, much of the year. We do believe there are alternatives. We don't believe that the Blood Center has taken these proposals seriously, which I think is a shame. Um, we have worked with the community who has actually hired stellar urban planners and land use lawyers 
to come up with alternatives and as you will see in testimony i think later um, submit documents showing how much of a negative impact there would be from this one building so i'm urging you to follow the pattern of the city council to respect community preference and particularly on a private land use rezoning um, to vote no so I really appreciate your time and the testimony I've submitted goes into far more detail, but I know that your time is, is going to be used up on this topic for the rest of the day. So thank you for giving me a few minutes. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Kruger. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, glad to see that uh, you're doing well. Uh, I just wanna recognize that we've also been joined by uh, Chair uh, Salamanca um, today. Uh, welcome, Chair. I now want to turn it over to my colleague, um, Council Member Kalos, who has a question uh, for you, Senator. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank Assembly Member Seawright for taking the time to join us today for her comprehensive and eloquent testimony. Uh, for the for Assembly Member Seawright, uh, she's always prided herself on being a PTA mom, and I wanted to ask her how important it is to have a nearby playing ground with sunlight to raising not one but two children in this city. Uh, for Senator Kruger, you've been in government a long time, more than any of us on this Zoom. Uh, usually land use items have like elected officials on different sides, community groups on different sides. Why is every elected official in this case and every community group actually on the same side? And um, I know that this is the first rezoning. Uh, there have been rezonings that predate me, predate my predecessor, Jessica Lappin, who, who actually opposed a previous rezoning, what's been the impediment to, to getting a deal here? Well, I think it's because the blood center keeps coming back to the electives and the community with the same unrealistic expectations um, for not just rebuilding themselves, but wanting to make a giant real estate deal. Um, for profit purposes, I understand every not-for-profit's desire to raise as much money as possible, but I remember at the time when they were proposing taking the Julia Richmond complex of six schools across the street, taking that land, building themselves a new blood center and a giant new building, and then offering the six schools the footprint of the blood center to somehow figure out their future with. And the city disturbingly thought about that for a while. My view is it's very clear here. The community has been consistent and almost to a person in the same place. These options are not real options for this block. It's a big borough, it's a big city. I have many life science efforts going on in my Senate district, which includes, of course, Ben, your council district, but several other council members districts as well. Um, we are not hostile to life science. We are not hostile to healthcare centers or healthcare work. Um, in fact, I would argue my Senate district is nicknamed Bedpan Alley because it has so many hospitals and healthcare centers and now life science centers included in it. This is just the wrong place for the wrong block. It's as simple as that. Assembly member. That ends my questions. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Assemblywoman uh, C. Wright and to uh, Senator Kruger for your testimony today. Uh, Council, do we have any uh, other members? I, I believe we got the Assembly member back with your indulgence. Yeah, thank you. I uh, juggling meetings here. Um, this is so important, and thank you, Councilman Kalos. Uh, for your service and uh, to Senator Kruger, uh, we couldn't be more well represented. And to all the uh, council members today, uh, having raised my two kids through the public school system and now public universities, I know firsthand how important sunlight is. And um, it's so important. And so I just respectfully ask that uh, you reconsider this because this application, uh, there are just so many issues that haven't been answered by our constituents. And coming out of the pandemic, we're suffering so much. And our public school children uh, need the outdoor space and they need the sunlight. JREC is 
a very important school on the Upper East Side and we need to be respectful of our children. So thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I see that we have been joined by uh, Borough President uh, Brewer. Do we have her on? I understand that she is in. I am, I am here in my very messy office. Thank you very much, uh, Council Mayor Moya. And I am here as elders to speak in opposition as the borough president to the blood center rezoning at 310 East 67th Street. And just like everyone else, you're gonna hear this as Senator Kruger said over and over again, we love the blood center, we support the blood center. I heard what uh, council member Reynoso said and the good things that they do. But it is a situation where they've been there for 50 years. Um, they do need to modernize their facilities. We understand that. But this block where they're located is zone R8B. And it was implemented with the intent of maintaining a residential character for the neighborhood. And we know that the lower scale buildings that are part of the zoning, they offer light and air. And that's not what density offers. Density is on the avenues. They're in the mid zone. So it's just a wrong location. That's what it is. It's out of scale. Now I know that um, you know they want to go up to 334 feet, and it's actually 75 feet set by the zoning. We are going to hear. You're going to hear a lot about as we did. At, I had a hearing on this. We heard a lot about the park. And we heard a lot about the school, which is right across the street. And we also heard from the unions. And I want to say to the unions, I know you support it, but be clear that there will be renovations of other buildings, hopefully for the blood center, either here or a different location that will in fact give you the absolute deserved jobs. And that's what you said at my hearing and I 100% support it. The issue is, it is an issue for the park. There aren't a lot of parks in the area. Um, when you cut the sunlight, there is uh, admittedly by the developer, no mitigation. Park department said no mitigation. The school across the street, you know, this is not a situation where I think, I know others may disagree. Traffic in the end may not be a problem, but construction will be horrific. It'll be quite a few years. The only way to mitigate that might be to have double pane windows on the entire school. I've been through this with other schools. I know what construction does to a school. You can't think, you can't teach. It's really, really hard. That's a challenge. Now, what else are we going to do about it? We want to have other locations. We do know that, and I know others feel, and I feel the same way. If you're going to say no to something, what's your alternative? We want life science. We want the blood center. We know that Hunter College, right next to MSK, is looking for uh, somebody to build them, life scientists, for the nursing, for Hunter College. It sits there. Why can't that be a combination? We also know that 126 in St. Nick, Janice has offered the blood center space. So there are alternatives, both for the life sciences and for the building. We also know that another developer, and I'm sure you heard this, it's not been written out anywhere, has offered to come in, renovate the building for the blood center and keep within the zoning. The blood center has to work with us. And I think you heard uh, your colleague, Council Member Reynoso said he wants things to work out with us, meaning the entire community that is against this and the blood center. So we're all here to say we want solutions. And that's what we're here to say. This is not a precedent to redo a zoning in mid block that should be taken and voted for. It should be against 100%. We do want EDC and others to say financing for the blood center. Maybe there should be money coming from the city to make sure that blood center, which is a lifeline, no kidding, is successful in their current location. Thank you very much. And I know you've got a long day ahead of you and I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Borough President. Um, ben, do you, have, do you have a question? Thank you. And I'm fine with the two minute clock for the electives. Uh, Borough President Brewer, you know, I will never let you pass the council without trying to interrogate you. you you've done hundreds of rezonings uh, you've supported life sciences all over the borough of Manhattan. Uh, how is this site different? In addition, um, land use projects tend to evolve as they go through the system. There's often concessions to the community board. Uh, there's concessions to the borough president before it ultimately gets 
to the city council where the concession we are seeing isn't a reduction in floor area, but just a reduction in the floor to ceiling uh, height from 16 down to 12. Um, why weren't you able to negotiate any concessions with the blood center when it was before you and the uh, community boards? Well, I think very clearly that that was not been the uh, view of the blood center. I assume the blood center thinks that they can uh, get a, a supportive vote from the city council. And I think we're going to make a case after the long day that the chair and you have to put in that this is not the right place to have a, uh, a zoning change mid block. It's really about zoning. It's not about life science. It's not about the blood center. It's about the fact that this is not a good precedent to set. I have to say in other cases, I know recently as I indicated to you, there was a developer who could see that his particular proposal for another part up in Harlem was not going to be successful and he pulled it. And now hopefully there'll be more discussion. The blood center should pull this proposal and say, we all know we want the blood center. We want to have life sciences. How can we work together? And if we need funding from the city, state or federal government, let's try to get that. It does not have to be a completely private proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council, do we have any other um, elected officials who are uh, going to be testifying? Not at this time, uh, Chair Moya. Okay. Um, is there any council members, uh, other council members that have questions for this panel? See no members with additional questions for this panel. Okay, seeing none. Um, the uh, this panel is uh, now excused. Uh, thank you so much um, for your uh, testimony today. Um, Council, can you please call up uh, the next panel, please? The next panel will include Justice Favor, Ari Espinal, and Infinite George. First speaker will be Justice Favor, followed by Ari Espinal. Thank you. And I uh, just before you begin, just a reminder that um, there is a two minute uh, time limit uh, for your testimony. Um, and uh, infinite, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, you may begin. Sorry, one yeah. quick uh, announcement. Also uh, on this panel will be Marilyn Smith Sotillo. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having me and the opportunity to speak today. A uh, couple of times testifying. My name is Infinite George and I'm currently a member of Local 79 and a resident of Harlem. I grew up in Queensbridge houses. And um, I'm here to express my support for the development of the New York Blood Center for many reasons. For one, it's going to create union jobs in and around the city and the community. Um, and also, the Blood Center is very important. We just went through a pandemic, and it's essential. It's essential, as you heard the gentleman express, um, it's a disparity with African American women giving birth. And it's just not only about giving blood, it's, it used other things like platelets and such. I think that's very important. We need it. It's not a color issue, it's not a race issue, it's a human issue, and we all have blood. And I think that we should build this building. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Who do we have next? Uh, Ms. Justice uh, Favor. Who? Justice Favor. Oh, Justice Favor. Okay, I'm sorry. Voting time. Hi, Justice. Can you hey, how you doing? Good. How's everything? Good, good, good. How's it going? Ready? Good, thank you. Sergeant Arms, can we just start the uh, clock again at two minutes? Thank you. Good. Whenever you're ready, Justice. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Justice Favor. I'm an organizer and a market de rep, development rep for Labor's Local 79. And um, the Labor's Union stand in support of this project. <clears throat> Local 79 supports the development of the New York Blood Center East, which supplies life saving blood products and services to hospitals across the whole city. The project will open up life sciences, careers to CUNY, graduates, public housing residents, 
and New Yorkers from diverse backgrounds. The developers also, the developers have committed to building local building with local 79 union labor that provides families with health benefits and fair wages. We think that the people like our members, New Yorkers of color, public housing residents and immigrants looking to work in the Upper East Side medical corridor simply to seek medical care should be welcome, not kept out and excluded. Center East can boost wages for residents of East Harlem, South Bronx, Queensbridge, and other neighborhoods hit hard by COVID. City Council can address local residents' concerns while still supporting the rezoning through good faith discussion. Everyone who is committed to an equitable recovery after COVID, racial and economic integration. And Hold on. We like the blood center. I just want to say, you know, it takes a community, it takes a village. When we hear about sunlight and all of those things, and I'm not going to say what's important to some, to others, but I come from communities that's been disadvantaged, that's been taken advantage of, and we never had an opinion. Sunlight didn't matter. We had to worry about gunshots. So it, it's important for everyone to be equitable, right? It's important for what's the difference when construction is taking place in other cities and other I mean, other areas and other communities of color where it's being built. It's not a problem then. So I understand some people concern, but you know, them, them, the some of the statements and comments. Oh, is a little you can, it's you a can little finish, Justice. Hi, I'm sorry. You can finish. I'm sorry. It feels a little disingenuous and, and so and um a little insensitive to other communities of color that never have a voice about things that's being built. So I think, you know, we should kind of like folks should, you know, be mindful of some of the things that they some of the statements. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Ari Espinal will be the next speaker, and if she's available, then Marilyn Smith Sotillo. Ari Espinal. Starting time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ari. Good to see you. Hi, Councilman, and thank you for your time and the committee also. My name is Ari Espinal, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Neighbors Local 79 the largest union of construction laborers in North America. We represent all five boroughs within 10,000 members. Local 79 supports the development of the New York Blood Center, a life science facility that will create thousands of family sustainable jobs New Yorkers and for New Yorkers and for low income households. The Blood Center is a leading supplier of disease like sickle cell that impacts community of color. The developers have committed to working with Local 79 to ensure the project supports our community, not only with medical services, but also by building union labor that provides family health benefits and fair wages. They're also partnering with the local educational institution to train and place New Yorkers from diverse backgrounds into medical and clinical lab jobs at Center East. These career pathways in both union construction and life sciences would advance racial and economic integration in one of the most segregated neighborhoods of the city. Sensor East can boost wages for residents of East Elmhurst, South Bronx, Queensbridge, and other neighborhoods that hit hard by COVID. City Council can address local residents' concern while supporting the rezoning. Good faith discussion and negotiation can be a product part of getting to a yes. A board diverse coalition representing thousands of New Yorkers in labor unions, community and organization and grassroots groups is eager to benefit the Censor East. Thank you again for the opportunity to express our support for this project. Thank you again, Councilman and Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ari, for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. The next speaker will be Marilene Smith Sotillo. Starting time. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Marlene. Whenever you're ready. Yes. Thank, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the discussion here today to urge the council to support the New York Blood Center proposal for the East Center East. 
the New York Blood Center work in researching sickle cell disease is of crucial importance to the future of our city and to, to New Yorkers affiliated with sickle cell disease. As a parent and advocate, I see the actual treatment that sickle cell patients receive. Oftentimes, the care is inadequate and unsafe because of the lack of trained sickle cell doctors that can be determined detrimental to sickle cell patients and result in fatality. The New York Blood Center serves a crucial function in our city's health system, providing safe, affordable blood to nearly every hospital across the five boroughs. Through its groundbreaking research supporting cures for blood-related diseases, including HIV, Hep C, and sickle cell anemia. The Blood Center has also been an important resource and advocate for unserved, underserved communities at risk across the city, including LGBT Black, Latino men, women, and the youth population. The Blood Center has a long-standing commitment to patients with sickle cell disease, an inherited red blood cell disorder that affect all races and ethnicity, but predominantly in the African American, Hispanic, and Indian community, affecting an estimated 10,000 in New York and millions worldwide. The center is an international leader in sickle cell research aimed at preventing and developing novel strategies to help cure the disease through stem cell transplantation and gene therapy. The blood center is seeking to modernize the state of the art research center for these that would significantly expand research centers, supporting new treatment, not only for sickle cell, COVID-19 and HIV, but many blood diseases. Marlene, yeah, I'm gonna let you wrap it up now. Uh, the two minutes have expired, so if you want to close out, I'll give you a couple of seconds. Okay, so on behalf of New York Blood Centers and affiliate individuals around the world, we land the Blood Centers life saving to everyone. The Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation Corp in Orange U to support the proposal for the building that would directly improve the lives of individuals affected with these debilitating blood disorders. Once thank again, you. thank you. So Yes. Thank, you. President of the thank, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for your testimony today. Uh, thank you. Uh, council, do we have any council members that have questions for this panel? I chair, I see no members with questions. Uh, seeing uh, no further questions for this panel, uh, this panel is now excused. Uh, council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Rachel Levy, Karen Mira, George James, and Chris Collins. The first speaker will be Rachel Levy, followed by Karen Mira. Rachel, um, whenever you're ready, Rachel, you can you can start. We have a little bit of an order, so I'm actually going to ask Karen to go first, if that's okay. Okay, uh, Karen, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Moya, members of the committee. I'm Karen Mara of Carter Ledyard in Milburn, representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Respectfully, Friends urges you to oppose this application. As you've heard, the Blood Center is asking you to substantially upzone a low scale uh, residential mid block, double the FAR, nearly four times the height, even with the reductions announced today, huge floor plates, almost seven FAR of commercial uses, resulting in a hulking building with no precedent in a location like this. And the blood center doesn't want or need all that space. It would occupy only one third of the new building with the other two thirds owned and controlled by Longfellow. So a building like that might be appropriate in East Midtown or on a hospital campus, but that's not the context here. And I'll have to respectfully disagree with Mr. Selver who uh, called this an atypical block. The site is surrounded by low scale uh, residential uses, a library, a school, low to mid-rise apartment buildings and medical offices, and of course, St. Catherine's Park. So the proposal is unprecedented and not warranted. Um, there are viable alternatives, and I won't belabor the as of right uh, alternative since uh, that was discussed extensively earlier, but I will say Friends has developed an alternative that George James will describe in more detail that would 
that would uh, go a long way to meeting the blood center's needs. It would give them as much FAR as they um, seek in this rezoning, plus over 100,000 extra square feet that they could use to generate revenue while still respecting the community. As for the Longfellow Tower, the idea that the council would create 400,000 square feet of new commercial space on the residential block at a time when there's a crisis of excess commercial space just blocks away is perplexing. Uh, life science developers can and have been repurposing existing buildings on sites zoned commercial or manufacturing across the city, including, for example, a commercial site on Park Avenue South in Councilmember Revere's district. I'm inspired. And the applicants claim. I just have one last sentence. Yeah, no, it's okay. I'll give you some time. Okay, the applicants claim that close proximity to medical institutions is somehow essential is contradicted by the actions both of life science developers and ma major medical institutions like Mount Sinai, which just announced that it's leasing life science space on the far west side. In sum, uh, we urge you to reject this proposal and I'll turn it over to Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Rachel, you're up. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, Chair Moya and Council Members. I'm Rachel Levy. I'm the Executive Director of Friends of the Upper East Side. In 1985, most mid blocks of the Upper East Side were rezoned to R8B, a contextual zoning district that caps new building heights at 75 feet. This was no accident. It was in response to community advocates dismayed with the towers that had begun to spring up on narrow side streets, violating the bedrock planning principle that tall buildings and commercial uses belong on wide streets with narrow streets reserved for lower scale residential uses. Hundreds of similar low rise zoning districts have since been mapped on side streets throughout the city. For example, R6B in your district, Mr. Chairman. As the CPC said in its 1985 report, the low rise mid block provides, quote, a quiet refuge from the busier avenues, unquote. To be clear, Friends supports high density development on the Upper East Side when it's in the right places. For example, the blocks east of First Avenue, south of 72nd Street were carved out of the 1985 zoning to allow for institutional growth by MSK, Wild Cornell, and Rockefeller, and are currently zoned R8 to R10. A development of this type on one of those blocks would not have generated such unanimous concern from every corner of the community. Instead, the Blood Center asks you to allow a 334-foot commercial tower on a mid-block where the overwhelming majority of buildings are less than 75 feet. The few buildings that exceed this height are less than half the Blood Center's proposed height. And the site is surrounded by quintessentially residential uses, as you've heard, a school, park, library, residential building, and doctor's offices. The pedestrian experience in this immediate area is one of remarkable consistency with low-scale buildings, including the blood center, sandwiched between taller structures on the council on the on the avenues. Council members, imagine a building of this scale on a low-rise residential block in your district. It's unprecedented and not necessary to meet the blood center's goals. As George will explain in more detail, the blood center could build just as much space for itself as of right, or even more via a full coverage alternative. If approved, this application would diminish- Time what makes our, I'm Just finishing my last sentence. Um, would diminish what makes our neighborhoods livable, dismantle decades of consistent land use policy and practice, and send the message which will be heard loud and clear that it is open season on low scale residential mid blocks across the five boroughs. Friends strongly urges the council to reject this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, for your testimony. Uh, George, you're up next, and then we go to Chris. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is George James. I'm an urban planner working with Friends. Uh, we agree the Blood Center's facility needs to be upgraded. And yes, city council should help them do that. But the strategic need for New York City to develop a life sciences hub has gotten mixed up with the blood centers facility planning. They are different things. The life science hub would be better elsewhere and a better, larger blood center can be rebuilt without it. Prior to this application, the city identified sites for a life sciences hub and the blood center was not one of them. I will be submitting written testimony about the sites identified and how the current proposal compares with other life science campuses you will see that there is nothing quite like this proposal. Nevertheless, small changes to the current application could facilitate the rebuilding of the blood center. We have developed a full coverage alternative that allows the blood center to build 321,000 gross square feet on its current site while keeping the building at a mid-block scale. It would allow the blood center's new facility to be the same size as it's currently proposed and they would get an extra 100,000 square feet of space that could be leased. 
It is a plan that would allow the blood center to modernize, to have huge floor plates, and to collect income from tenants. But this is a terrible site for a huge life science hub. Narrow streets, residential block, directly across from sensitive uses, the far more substantial waiver sought should be rejected. Finally, our city is better when we develop considered plans and implement them, especially for critical industries like this one. You should not simply respond positively to an application because the applicant wants you to. You should be asking yourself, is this part of a well-considered plan? Is it good for the city? Is it good for the community? Any careful review would find that this application fails on all counts. Thank you. Thank you, George, for your testimony today. Um, Chris, whenever you're ready. Uh, Chris, before you start, you just got to mute yourself. Thank you very much. Chairman Moya, council members, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Chris Collins. I am a retired zoning and land use lawyer for the city of New York. For 13 years, I served as counsel to the land use committee at the city council. And for eight years, I was a commissioner on the board of standards and appeals. Uh, much earlier in my career, I was the chairman of Manhattan Community Board 8, where this proposed project is located. In retirement, I serve on the Board of Advisors of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, and it is in that capacity that I appear before you today. The small lapel pin that I am wearing today dates back to 1985, and it reads R8B Now. I think I was a Block Association president at the time, and I wore that button to the City Planning Commission and Board of Estimate hearings that resulted in the mid-block zoning that is under attack by this application. As others have said, in my judgment, this application is not really about the fine work that is done by the blood center. What it's really about is whether the city of New York is willing to violate good planning principles and abandon smart zoning to support a real estate deal that is as egregious as it is unwarranted. The sheer size and massing of this building surpasses anything that could be called reasonable. And its placement on a residential mid-block facing both a school and a small park cannot be justified even in a crowded city like New York where competing forces bump up against each other all the time. I urge the committee and the council to disapprove this application. At a minimum, I ask that you seek to bring the parties together to seek a compromise solution that could meet the needs of the blood center without wreaking havoc on the 35-year-old R8B mid-block zoning. Thank I'm you expired. very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I see that we have um, Council Member Kalos's hand up for questions. Uh, Council Member. Uh, thank you. Uh, the First question that I have is uh, whether or not uh, they can, how tall a tower blood center could build if the zoning proposal is approved. Is it, is it that tall? Is it 500 feet or more? Uh, the panelists need to be unmuted. Uh, George, James, Karen, Mira, Rachel, and I need my time back while I'm waiting. Uh, yes, so um, C27 is a standard tower district because this is further than 100 feet from a wide street. You could do a standard tower there. It could be 500 feet tall. It would be a mixture of community facility and commercial uses um, to, to do the image that you're showing in the background. You'd have different uses with a residential tower, of course. Um, but yes, you can do a tower on this side. And there's nothing to stop it. Uh, during the te sworn testimony, the Blood Center feigned ignorance under oath regarding the full build alternative that you mentioned in your testimony, is this the first time that they've been, uh, that this has been proposed and how much additional FAR is being offered in this full build alternative to the as of right? Um, so I, I would like to actually defer the, in terms of whether they've heard this or not to someone else on this panel, because I don't know that. Karen? I'm unmuted, so I'll oh, go, go ahead, Karen. Oh, 
we have brought up the full coverage alternative in all of our public statements. And I, I believe, I'm not 100% positive, but I believe we included it in our written comments to um, city planning, which we also shared with the applicants. Thank you, I lost time due to muting. The, the last question is, is here is a map of uh, half a mile from uh, the St. Catharines Park uh, where's where's all the Expired. parks and playgrounds? Is St. Catharines really the, the only option in this part of the neighborhood for a playground of this size? Um, the answer is yes. The closest one is John Jay, which is, you know, at the very edge of that blue line. Thank you. Thank you. Um, council, do we have any other council members uh, with questions for this panel? No, Chair, no other members with questions. Okay, thank you. Seeing uh, there is no more questions for this panel, this uh, panel is now excused. Thank you uh, for your patience and thank you so much for your testimony today. Um, Council, if you can please call up uh, the next panel. The next panel will include Santos Rodriguez, Jessica Walker, Rakshanda Mirza, and Mitchell Taylor. Santos Rodriguez will speak first, followed by Jessica Walker. Starting time. Do we have Santos? I do see Santos Rodriguez. Santos Rodriguez will be the first speaker, followed by Jessica Walker. I'm sorry, I was uh, not being able to unmute myself. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon, I am Santos Rodriguez and I am testifying here on behalf of Gary LaBarbera, President of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York, in support of the New York Blood Center project. The Building and Construction Trades Council is an organization of local building and construction trades unions that are affiliated with 15 international unions in the North American Building Trade Union. Our local union affiliates represent approximately 100,000 union construction workers. To advocate, uh, the Building Trades mission is to, to raise the standard of living for all workers and to advocate for a safe work condition and a collective advance the condition of our affiliate members and all, as we all are workers in New York City. We have repeatedly testified in support of the project. We believe that this project contains numerous benefits for, for the city of New York and its residents. The expansion of New of the expansion, excuse me, the expansion of the New York Blood Center East at 310 East 67th Street headquarters will allow the Blood Center to expand its research facilities, improve collaborative amongst project teams, pr provide space for life science startups while con continuing to provide life-saving blood products in the service for the New York City area. This is an important project as the blood center research facilities are utilized for research and development in the field of the blood related disease, including potential treatments for COVID-19, as well as research into re regenerative medicine. The ability to provide space to startups, private institutions and partners will only improve the facilities, facilitate the, the important research conducted at the blood center. The public health benefits provided by the project are reason enough to move forward on it. However, it is important to note that New York City trails other cities in the country and development lab space. This is important. This important, excuse me, this is an important, has life science industry is important to the growth industry of the city. Uh, I'm, our, our city wants to, I'm sorry. You can, you can, can wrap I, it up. Yeah, you can. Thank you. In addition to us, to assisting the blood census fulfilling it's public mission to provide our city's lab space to help grow the life science industry. The project will provide economic stimulus as it anticipates a spur of creation of over 5,000 total new jobs, including 1,570 construction jobs. The project is expected to generate total new income output of $1.1 billion. The construction jobs created by this project will provide wages and benefits that will support the middle-class lifestyle for workers and their families and create new opportunities for the residents and the and the uh, to enter the industry. Uh, the building and construction trade council and facility support projects like the New York and Blood those, Center. I, I need you to I need you to close out. I'm you done. We, 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 we support the projects. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Santos. Thank you for your testimony today. Jessica 
excuse me, Jessica Walker will be the next speaker, followed by Rakshanda Mirza. As a reminder, we ask that all panelists, uh, when it comes your turn to testify, to please accept an unmute request if you see it uh, so that we can hear you. Jessica Walker. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, Chair Moya. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. I know that there uh, is going to be a, it's going to be a long day for you. So thank you. Uh, I'm Jessica Walker. I'm the president and CEO of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, obviously, we represent the business community and help, want to help them uh, thrive here. Most of our members are small businesses. But I'm actually uh, speaking today on behalf of the Five Borough Chamber Alliance. And that includes our chamber in Manhattan, but also the chambers representing the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Uh, we are all in favor um, and strong support of this proposal. And I think that just highlights the economic benefits that this project has um, or could have for the entire city. Um, as you know, I think we lost Jessica there. Appears to be the case. Uh, we will, in that case, go to Rakshanda Mirza, and we can try to come back to Jessica. Rakshanda Mirza. Starting time. Hello, my name is uh, Rakshanda, and I'm a single mother supporting my children and broadening my IT skills thanks to New York Blood Center, providing me a current and amazing internship opportunity. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and show my support for Blood Center and its plan to revitalize its current building into a state-of-art research facility. Thanks to the Blood Center and its partnership with the Knowledge House, a nonprofit that supports career development for the student from the Bronx and other New York City areas like me, Local students have opportunities to work and learn from this important institution and its many partner organization. During my time as an intern, I have had the opportunity to learn in an hands-on research environment and develop skills that will help me advance my career in the life science. The Blood Center proposal to rebuild and expand its space, not only expand its ability to conduct research, but open up more opportunities for students to enter internship and start career in the life science. My own internship was already extended and I have gained invaluable insight and confidence in my own abilities to contribute positively to the community. I fully support the Blood Center and its proposal, and it would contribute even more value to the New York City students' education and career growth, just like it did to mine. And I appreciate everyone's time and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. I see that we got Jessica back. So Jessica. Whenever you Jessica, want. Jessica Walker will be followed by Mitchell Taylor. Mitchell Taylor, if you can hear me when you see the unmute request or invitation to be promoted, please accept. Jessica Walker and then Mitchell Taylor. Thank you. Apologies. Don't know what happened there. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Five Borough Chamber Alliance uh, because we think that citywide that this is really important for job creation in the city. And that's you know more important than ever in the wake of COVID. Um, as you know, we lost over 600,000 jobs during the crisis. Uh, and so this really is a project that we think could really help build the life sciences industry and help to create thousands of jobs uh, here in New York City. Um, I wanna, the last thing I wanna say is that, that we really think that this is um, a real opportunity to really try to help move people of color, particularly into STEM careers. Um, it's something that we, we think that the New York Blood Center has been really strong on trying to help some of those programs. Uh, I'm gonna submit written testimony with more details about all of this, but um, long story short, we think that these are the types of opportunities that don't come along every day. Um, we don't think that we should take, take this opportunity for granted. And that's why the five chambers really do support this project. Thank you. Mitchell Taylor is the next expected speaker. Mitchell Taylor, if you can hear me, please accept the unmute request or please accept the promotion to panelist. 
so that we can take your testimony. Mitchell Taylor. Okay, Chair, we seem to be having some technical issues with Mitchell Taylor. I see that uh, Councilmember Kalos has a hand up for this panel. Go ahead, Councilmember. I have a quick question for Jessica Walker. I wanna thank her for all the great work she does at the Manhattan Chamber. Uh, in my opening, I shared that we've actually identified a million square feet of vacant office space with 45,000 square foot floor plates, uh, would it be helpful if we could fill those vacant, those square feet of vacant office space? Would that be good for the city? Uh, it appears that uh, Jessica Walker is muted. Thank you, Councilman. Um, of course, absolutely. Um, and, and right now, more than ever, um, I do think that we're very concerned about the vacancy rate in Manhattan, and I think that that probably will go up before it uh, gets better. Um, so there's no question that we, we really do need to find um, ways to fill those vacancies. Uh, when I opened, I shared that we're, we're open to adding another 100,000 square feet. Uh, I believe in their conversation, they shared it was uh, around $1,000 per square foot. So that's uh, several a uh, hundred million dollars, it's a hundred million dollars, give or take, uh, that we can print for the flood center. We found uh, developers that, uh, at least one developer is willing to build them a new center. Uh, what, what do you think of the idea of filling a million square feet with biotech a couple of blocks away that's currently vacant, uh, getting the blood center a, a new building exactly where they are, plus providing additional funding that they may need to cover any additional financing where everyone can win? Well, I mean, as I said, I think that you have to be careful in terms of um, not taking something for granted, uh, meaning that, you know, it, it, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. And if this is a project that is um, not adopted, uh, that doesn't mean that they're going to come back and there's going to be other alternatives that are going to be workable for them. Um, so I do think that it's one of those opportunities that we need to really try to to um, work with them to get this done for the city. I'd, I'd argue that advice goes both ways. I look forward to working with you and them and every business to get this borough back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, do we have... Uh, Chair, we're going to see if Bishop Taylor yeah. is available. Uh, Bishop Taylor. Yes, I'm here. I, I Bishop, whenever you're ready, uh, you can put your uh, Okay, uh, one second. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Councilman Moyer and team. My name is Bishop Mitchell Taylor, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Urban Upbound, an organization committed to breaking the cycles of poverty of public housing residents by providing them the tools and resources needed to achieve economic mobility and self-sufficiency. The New York Blood Center's East proposal not only represents an important opportunity for, the New, York, for New York City to solidify and improve the city's credentials as a life sciences hub, but also represents an economic opportunity for all New Yorkers. The Blood Center's proposal to, is estimated to create approximately 1,600 jobs directly through construction, more than 2,300 jobs in new life sciences, and a facility itself that will have 3,000 indirectly permanent jobs for the surrounding neighborhood. These jobs will benefit communities and public housing neighborhoods surrounding the area, such as the largest public housing development in the country, Queensbridge Houses, which is located just two miles south of the center east proposal and in the other direction two miles north a large community of public housing neighborhoods in east harlem in addition to creating these much needed jobs through this proposal the blood center project will also serve as a crucial workforce development resource for new yorkers pursuing careers in stem and advanced racial and economic integration in one of the most segregated neighborhoods in our city the blood center is all the Blood Center already offers on-site training and internship opportunities and partnerships with schools and communities and organizations. 
with a campus like Center East, which doubles its capacity and provides space for several more innovative employers. The opportunities for partnerships that advance career building and skills development will grow considerably. Center East has the potential to be a model for how we cultivate the next generation of STEM talent here in New York City. Through its partnerships and programs that ensure children from underserved communities get the same opportunities in STEM, it can... Go ahead, Bishop, I'll let you finish up. It can expand the opportunities available to the bi BIPOC young professionals and underrepresented groups in life science industries. Approving the center's East proposal means that not only STEM jobs in New York, but also more pathways for professional development for our students. The project has my full support and I urge the council to consider the positive impacts that this new life science campus could have for our city and for our children and for our residents in public housing. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Bishop. Who do we have next? Chair, council member Kalos has a hand up for this panel. That was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Thank you, uh, Bishop Taylor, for your, your testimony and all of your amazing work. You're at Queensbridge Houses over on Vernon Boulevard in Queens? I think the uh, Bishop, Cal yeah. Yeah, Councilman, I, uh, uh, Urban Upbound is a citywide agency. We have offices in East Harlem, Bronx, Far Rockaway, Astoria, and our flagship is in Queensbridge. Amazing, and is Queensbridge Houses over by Vernon Boulevard? Uh, Queensbridge Houses is Low, yes, yes, it is. It borders Vernon Boulevard. Uh, have you ever had, had occasion to walk by Forty uh, Fifth Street and Vernon Forty Fifth Avenue and Vernon Boulevard? Well, I've lived in Long Island City my entire life, so I'm sure that I've walked, crawled, uh, and done all kind of things on Forty Fifth Avenue and Vernon Boulevard. Amazing. Uh, do you currently have programs with the New York Blood Center's uh, location there? They have a huge lab space where they actually do incredible amounts of work. Uh, actually, more work yes. than they do at 310 East 67. Yes. Well, one of the reasons why I'm on this call is because the Blood Center is one of our neighbors and a very good community partner. And, Can you tell uh, me about the specific work you do with them at 45-01 Vernon Bellevue? Well, as you know, uh, Council Member Urban Upbound is a big workforce development provider, and all of our big employers in our neighborhoods are part of our community of employers that are part of our Jobs Plus network. The Blood Center is one of those entities that participates in receiving folks How from our- How many folks at Urban Upbound are, are employed at 45-01 Vernon Boulevard in Long Island City, Queens, four blocks from Queensboro, uh, Queensbridge Houses? Uh, I'd have to get back to you on that number, council member. I don't, I don't carry those numbers in my pocket. That's okay. I, I thought you might have them ready uh, for this. And then for folks at Queensbridge Houses, is it? Thank is you. It, I'm thank expired. You, council member. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your questions. Thank you, Bishop Taylor. Um, we are on a tight schedule here, council members, so I'm keeping it to two minutes. Um, do we have any other council members that have questions uh, for this panel? No, Chair, no, no other members with questions. Thank you. Uh, seeing none, uh, this panel is now excused. Uh, if you can please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Anthony, excuse me. Next panel will include Bill Angelos, Paul Graziano, Mark Bresky, and Anthony Barrett. The first speaker, Bill Angelos, followed by Paul Graziano. Starting time. Hello, Chairman Moya and members of the, the committee. My name is Bill Angelos. I'm the president of the condominium board of 301 East 66th Street, which is located directly adjacent to New York Blood Center. During this hearing, we hope that residents in our building and community finally have heard our voices. On 66, 67th Street, there are over 1,300 apartments and changing the zoning on these blocks from residential to commercial would undermine the people who live in this neighborhood and harm our quality of, of life. Not only would loud noise occur, but dust, uh, diesel fumes, nitrogen, and asbestos would fill the air. Would also create dangerous situations with steel beams and other hazards that would clog our one-way narrow block. When complete, an estimated 3,000 additional people will be walking on the block. 
causing even more congestion that our infrastructure lacked the capacity to handle. Would also reduce the important role of St. Catherine Park plays in our neighborhood. Uh, one of the least green areas in the entire city, the park is always crowded with children who live in the area or whenever the school at Julia Richmond Education Complex is out. But if the building is erected, shadows will, will be cast over it the majority of the day. The Blood Center can still build a new building under the current Joni Code, just like, like many other life science institutions have done on the Upper East Side. That will give them an additional 200,000, excuse me, 200,000 square feet and we'll have no objection to it. But the plan that I presented today and throughout this process would completely change the character of the neighborhood and I urge you to vote against it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker will be Paul Graziano, followed by Mark Bresky. I, I'd prefer if Anthony Barrett went first, followed by Mark Bresky and me last, if that's possible. Is Anthony Barrett available? Anthony Barrett, if you see an unmute request, please accept. If you see an invitation to promotion, please accept so that we can take your testimony. Anthony Barrett. Ah, uh, yes. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, council members. Um, my name is Anthony Barrett, board member 301 East 66 Street. Claim 11 has made numerous false claims. Our block 1440, uh, 1441 is not atypical. We have 688 residential units. The block immediately south has 632, 50 less, and the block north on 68th Street has 586 units, 100 less. So the only thing atypical is that we have more residential units on this block than on the blocks immediately south and north of the park. In total, over 2,500 units are within one block of the development, and Claim 11 is telling you it is atypical on C27 zoning with text amendments to build a 600,000 square foot monstrosity. Claim 11, following the advice of city planning, amended the initial application to include our lot and the lot across the street on 2nd Avenue. Why was this done, you should ask. The reason is that it would look a whole lot less messy if Craven 11 could make the argument that this is a rezoning of multiple lots instead of a single lot. They knew that a single lot spot rezoning would be illegal and unprecedented. They de 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 uh, developed this ridiculous narrative that movie theaters across the street were not as of right. And because they were such good neighbors, they would help and get them rezoned as of right. This proposal will have a devastating impact on our neighborhood park and school while the applicant did offer a payoff of over $3 million to the Parks Department that helped fund the planning of shade-loving hybrids and repave the sidewalks and the comfort stations. St. Catherine's Park is the only area of respite for the neighborhood. The park is packed all day with kids from various schools, parents and infants using the playground and medical workers who walk all the way from York Avenue to enjoy lunch on the tables and in the sun. Late in the afternoon, after 3 p.m., the basketball hoops are all occupied with pickup games of all ages. The park is busy until closing. It will be a real shame to allow permanent shadow to be cast over the thousands of people who use this park every day for a payoff of three, over $3 million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Who do we have next? Is, is it Mark Bresky next? Mark? Starting time. Uh, good afternoon. Chair Moya and all city uh, council members. My name is Mark Bresky. I'm a member of the Bresky Law Firm and I've been a practicing attorney for approximately 39 years with an emphasis in part in land use matters, cooperative condominium law and commercial litigation. During this time, I have rarely if ever observed a more out of context proposal in any neighborhood of New York City. My firm has been retained by both 301 East 66th Street Condominium Corp, a condominium with more than 200 residential units adjacent to the west of the Blood Center, and 33 East 66th Street Corp, a cooperative apartment corporation with 171 cooperative apartment in its building situated directly to the east. Incredibly, 301 finds itself as an unwilling participant in these applications as it falls within the proposed areas and immediately adjacent extending 100 feet therefrom. We consider these applications to be tantamount to a hostile takeover of 301's building and property rights. 
We believe that the applicant stands to realize a windfall profit of millions of dollars through the creation of speculative air and development rights, which currently don't exist, while 301 stands to lose untold millions of dollars in value and less quantifiable quality of life intangibles, including a loss of light, air, and other benefits guaranteed above the seventh floor by the present R8B zone. A similar outcome appears likely for the approximate 340 residents of 333 due to their proximity downwind from the proposed new tower. Our clients are inclined to file a protest with the city clerk under section 200A3 of the city charter, which we believe would have the immediate impact of shutting down the Euler process unless a 75% supermajority of the city council will to override it. We urge the city council to persuade the applicant to withdraw their application today in order to avoid this drastic action. Time expired. Thank you. Paul Graziano will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Graziano. I'm an urban planning, land use, and zoning consultant retained by both 301 and 333 East 66th Street, buildings which are adjacent on either side of the New York Blood Center. For the purposes of this hearing, my spoken testimony will focus on one troubling aspect of this proposed rezoning. Last week, the applicant, for the first time during the Euler process, showed a slightly modified proposal for the Blood Center Tower. While the building is at 284 feet tall, 50 feet lower than the original proposed height of 334 feet, all of the, quote, savings of height are through A, significantly lowering the height and size of mechanical spaces at the rooftop, and B, lower floor to floor heights throughout the building in both the base, 85 feet versus 68 feet or 17 feet difference, and the tower itself, 249 feet versus 216 feet or 33 foot difference. Throughout the process, the blood center has been insistent that the floor to floor heights must be at least 16 feet in height. In fact, this is one of the key findings in the final EIS justifying the height of the tower under the section entitled description of the proposed project. To quote, the design of the proposed project comprises a four story base covering the entire lot and above that would be a laboratory tower providing floor plates of a minimum of 29,000 square feet. Uh, with uh, 29,000 gross square feet with 16 foot floor to floor heights required to accommodate the robust mechanical systems needed in laboratory buildings. These building dimensions were established on rigorous laboratory planning dimensions. If this statement is actually true as the applicant has insisted since pre-certification, how can they now justify lowering the floor to floor heights if this will no longer quote, accommodate the robust mechanical systems needed in laboratory buildings as per the final EIS? Won't this result in the construction of a suboptimal building for the purposes purported by the applicant. And if it isn't true and is in reality a self-serving untruth disguised as a quote fact in order to justify the inflated heights sought by the applicant, should we now question the veracity of the final EIS in its entirety? This is the second time in 35 years that the blood center has tried to build an inappropriate zone building on their site. I have one sentence. We urge the city council to immediately disapprove this wrongheaded application and the blood center can rebuild as of right under the current R8B zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. And I see that Councilmember Kalos has a hand up for questions. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I heard two things that I'm not previously familiar with and still like to learn. Um, I heard uh, Paul Graziano uh, say that the environmental impact statements stated they needed 16 foot floor to ceilings versus uh, the now proposed 12. And I guess just how important is the final environmental impact statement and what does it matter if they uh, changed things between them. Uh, and then the other piece is just, I've, I've never heard of section 200 of the charter and anything in the council requiring a three quarters vote. Uh, if you can just share information on both. Sure, I can go, I can go first, Mark, you can follow up. Um, so very simply, I'm just quoting directly from the final EIS where they make it very clear they need the 16 foot height because this is best what we call best practices, and this is what they desperately need for their mechanical systems. What, what I, what's really shocking to me is they didn't remove any square footage, meaning they didn't get rid of a floor or two of 
partner laboratories, which is how you would lower the height of the building typically. No, they just lowered the heights of the ceilings. So now, if they need the 16 feet and they're 12 feet, what's the truth? I mean, it's really that simple. Do they need 12 feet or do they need 16 feet? And if they put in 16 feet, was that the correct number, which they have been pushing this narrative from the beginning? I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way I'm reading it. Mark? Yes, and, and in response to your question concerning the city charter, section 200 of the zoning resolution, uh, specifically uh, 3A and 1 and 2, provides a mechanism under which certain property owners can challenge the Time proposed, resolu proposed resolution. Um, the condo, we believe, has standing under sections 300 of uh, 3A1 in the fact that the land immediately, um, excuse me, the land included in the change is proposed in such a resolution is contained within this area. Um, and similarly, we believe the uh, condo has standing under subdivision two in owning land immediately adjacent, extending 100 feet there from. We also believe that the co-op has standing to proceed under this second category of section number two um, the statute uh, specifically provides that the res resolution will not be effective after the filing of such protest unless approved by the council by a three-fourths vote with 180 days after the filing of said resolution with the city clerk. We have been authorized to file the protest. We intend to do so tomorrow. We, we don't want to do this. And we thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. And we, thank and you. we again request you. that the city thank council ask the applicant to withdraw its Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other council members that have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no other members with questions. Okay, there being no further questions uh, for this panel, this panel is now excused. Uh, council, if you could, uh, please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Laura Cola Curcio, Diana Fenn, Gloria Rochester, and Sinead Wadsworth. Uh, for all panelists whose names I just called, please accept any invitation to be promoted and please accept any unmute request when you see it. Laura, Cor Laura Cola Curcio will speak next, followed by Diana Finn. Starting time. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Association for a Better New York. My name is Laura Colacurcio, and I'm the vice president of ABNY. ABNY is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the healthy growth and renewal of New York City's people, businesses, and communities. As New York recovers from the concurrent public health and economic crises, it is critical to advance projects that make our city more resilient, stimulate our economy, and deliver jobs for New Yorkers. Life science is a key growth sector that offers the opportunity to accomplish all of these goals. At the same time, the expansion of the life sciences industry has the potential to address the disproportionate health outcomes of our most vulnerable communities, those who bore the brunt of COVID. But if New York is to capture a meaningful share of this industry in the aftermath of the pandemic that underscored its importance, we must invest in the infrastructure that enables a thriving biotech ecosystem here, just like we did successfully for the tech industry more than a decade ago. The New York Blood Center's proposal for a 21st century life science center located at the heart of the city's greatest cluster of health and research institutions on the Upper East Side, similarly has the potential to be a transformational project for the sector. The COVID-19 pandemic made it clear that our city has underinvested in life sciences and the infrastructure to perform critical research. Despite having many of the assets to become a, become a global life science hub and unmatched talent pool, world-class institutions like those on the Upper East Side and robust funding, New York's lab supply has lagged far behind industry leaders like Boston and San Francisco. Center East will help New York begin to close that gap and compete. The Blood Center's vision for an advanced research campus among first-rate institutions like Memorial Sloan Kettering, Rockefeller University, and Wild Cornell Medicine will help attract and retain biotech companies that have previously left New York for cities with more robust infrastructure. Beyond the 1,570 total construction jobs generated, Center East is projected to create more than 2,300 new life science jobs, along with an additional 3,000 indirect and induced jobs offsite. 
I urge you to support the New York Blood Center's proposal for a new life science center on the Upper East Side. This is the right project at the right time for New York. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Sorry, Diana then will be the next speaker who will be followed by Gloria Rochester. Hello, oh, my name is Diane Fenn. I'm a tech instructor and college counselor at the Knowledge House and a graduate of Hunter College and uh, a former intern of Councilmember Keith Powers and Borough President uh, Gail Brewer. Um, so I'm really familiar with the area. Uh, the Knowledge House is a nonprofit organization that focuses on expanding employment opportunities and access to the tech field for high school students and young adults in New York City. Uh, and since 2014, we've served over 1,700 students. Uh, we see the Blood Center's proposal to expand its facility, not just as a project that positions New York City as a leading life sciences hub, generate, generating thousands of jobs, but also a major workforce development opportunity uh, for the young people of our city, of our city interested in, in the STEM fields. Uh, the Blood Center's Center East proposal would double the Blood Center's capacity for research and blood collection at a time when our city desperately needs space for both. Uh, it would also enable the Blood Center to form more workforce partnerships with organizations like ours. Uh, that create high quality jobs for our students, increasing inclusivity in the professional tech uh, and science communities in New York City. Um, having access to a diverse field of talent is essential for all successful industries, students, and young professionals from diverse racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, we play a pivotal role in the future of development in the STEM field, uh, and a campus like the Center East provides a central space uh, for nurturing this talent. Uh, and it's only a few stops away from our Mont Haven neighborhood. Uh, the Blood Center's proposal will provide our students career building opportunities in state of the art facility uh, with world class practitioners, strengthen our city STEM workforce, and help to alleviate the inequality of, um, that exists throughout the city. Uh, I support the Blood Center's proposal as a project that will not only help our city recovery, uh, in our city's recovery, uh, but expand career opportunities and promote equitable access uh, to the life science sector. Uh, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony today. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. I'm stepping in as subcommittee counsel to call in the next witness. I'm Angelina Martinez Rubio, and the next witness will be Gloria Rochester. Starting time. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm the president for the New York State Sickle Cell Advocacy Network. My name is Gloria Rochester. I'm the mother of a 46-year-old daughter with sickle cell whose life depends on blood transfusions and blood exchange. Um, the New York Blood Center saves the lives of New Yorkers every day, providing blood for transfusions that are essential for people with sickle cell disease and other chronic conditions. Center East is critically important for the lives of myself and my family and all New Yorkers. I urge you to support and uh, the resonating for the New York State Blood Center. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Gloria. The next next witness is Sinead Wadsworth. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chair Moya and counselors. Happy Wednesday. My name is Sinead Wadsworth, council representative for the New York City District Council of Carpenters. Today, we would like to testify on behalf of the 20,000 members in support of the New York Blood Center's proposed expansion. Manhattan is the spine of New York City, and it is so important that we continue building New York's best for the working class. Projects like this set the tone for responsible development in the future and will change the culture by raising the standard of living because everyone deserves to be well compensated for their work, as well as the opportunity to retire with dignity. This is why we support the New York Blood Center rezoning. This project will provide many of our New York residents with career opportunities the pandemic took away from us. And most importantly, the developers have committed to building, building this project union. I commend them for doing the right thing because building union in New York City has become very, very rare. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support and please consider our testimony on behalf of the 100,000 building trades members across the city. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Chair, I don't see any council members with questions at this time, so I can call the next panel. Great, thank which you. Will be Darcy Green, Moses Ann, Russell Squire, and Ashley Wolcott. So the first speaker is Darcy Green, followed by Moses Ann. 
start in time. My name is Darcy Green, and I'm testifying today to express my opposition to the proposed blood center tower. I'm a junior at Urban Academy, which is one of the few high schools located in JREC across the street from where the proposal will be built. I also live one avenue away from where um, away from this proposal, and I will not only be affected by this project as a student, but also as a resident of the area. The well-being and education of New York City students have been deprioritized during the course of this pandemic. Just as with 2,000 students of JREC are beginning a return to normal, the city intends to rezone our community to allow for a massive commercial tower to be built directly across the street from our school. I know you've heard every possible argument against this flood center, but I'd like to give you a glimpse inside our classroom to show you the individual impact this construction project would have on the students of JREC. At Urban Academy, our classes are discussion-based. The effect of constant construction and noise pollution on the flow of our conversation would be detrimental. The bedrock principles of our school are dialogue and conversation. So the invasive construction noises would render our discussions unproductive and frustrating to conduct. Many high school students turn to Urban Academy because they've already been failed by the New York City public school system and they found an alternative at JREC. But if this proposal is passed, my school's biggest strength of discussion-based classes would be drowned out by a massive construction project. I urge you to take this position into consideration when casting your vote because this letter represents not only my own opinion, but the thoughts of countless other JREC students whose education would be immeasurably impacted by the negative effects should this proposal be passed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you for your testimony. The next speaker is Moses Ann, followed by Russell Squire. Starting time. Hello, thank you, Councilmember Moya, for your time. My name is Moses Ahn, the Assistant Principal of the Manhattan International High School. I'm one of the speakers speaking on behalf of the six school communities of the Julia Richmond Education Complex, also known as JREC. We're located directly across the street from the New York Blood Center on East 67. Now, JREC, uh, the Julia Richmond Education Complex is not in support of the Blood Center East Expansion Project. We've been down this road before with the Blood Center. They clearly did not learn their, les their, their le lesson from their defeat by our neighbors and supporters when they attempted to take over our building in 2016. Now we are Manhattan's earliest and most successful shared school campuses that services students from e every school el eligible age, walk of life and borough. Our building serves over 2000 children from infants to seniors in high school, from diverse communities in all five boroughs of New York City. The JRA campus serves students from pre-K to 12th grade, including a life program for children of young parents, four high schools, a K-8 elementary school, and a middle school for children with autism. The Manhattan International High School that I serve in part, uh, works with students who are new learners of English, recent immigrants who have been in the country for four years or less. We serve a very diverse student body of roughly 300 students with over 60 nationalities represented and 30 languages spoken. 23% of our students live in Queens, many in the council members district. 17% live in temporary housing or, on, or are housing insecure. The JREC building is a sacred and safe space for our students and their families. Now we are extremely concerned about a multi-year construction project that will spew dust, asbestos and lead, various construction chemicals and the potential of danger, dangerous falling debris. As the city is asking us to keep all windows open in our classrooms to circulate the air that, and to prevent the spread of COVID, the increase in this diesel exhaust, carbon monoxide, and noise will not only endanger our students, but make teaching especially difficult and distracting. Some of our students already have health conditions and they don't- Time expired. For six days, six hours a day in, in an area with questionable air quality. Not only is it dangerous and unhealthy to have a major construction project across the street that serves infants up to teenagers, but our school buses already cannot safely drop off and pick up our cognitive, cognitively disabled medically vulnerable and elementary school age children. The blood center vehicles often block egress by parking in the no parking bus zone in front of our entrance. There is one parked in front of, this, in front of our building this very morning. This, already, this is already a very congested street with a well-traveled crosstown bus route. How will children make it safely into our school during construction? Now we have many, many different concerns, uh, but we invite you council member Moya to come visit us meet our students and hear our concerns in person. Thank you for your time. Happy to come. Thank you for the invitation uh, and look forward to uh, making that happen. Uh, Council, do we have uh, our next panelist? 
Uh, we have our next panelist, Russell Squire. Should we, but Council Member Kalos has his hand up. Should we call on him or Russell Squire? Chair, you're on mute. We'll wait till the end, thank you. Okay. Russell Squire is our next panelist, followed by Ashley Wolcott. Starting time. I'm Russell Squire, Chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan, where the proposed New York Flood Center Longfellow Project is located speaking in opposition to the proposal. At the outset, it bears pointing out that this proposal remains completely unchanged from the first time it was presented to CB8 last November. Since that time, CB8 and its committees have had multiple meetings on this subject and expressed many concerns, but the proposal has not been changed one iota in response. That is shocking and indicative of the disregard for community concerns and quality of life that characterize this proposal. In addition, CB8 has always supported the Blood Center's research mission. The expanded space that the Blood Center seeks for itself in this proposal does not require any zoning changes. That added space and any additional jobs at the Blood Center, as well as construction jobs for the expansion, can be achieved with an as of right project. CB8 opposes this project for several reasons, which are set forth more fully in our resolution and supporting materials, but I'll briefly emphasize some of the points that we made. First, the proposal is totally unacceptable from a zoning perspective. The Upper East Side, like other Manhattan neighborhoods, prefers less density on mid-block lots as opposed to on the avenues. The proposal would undo mid-block R8B zoning, which has been a shining example of city planning done right and in a way that is responsive to the community and reflective of its needs and preferences. If the rezoning of an R8B district in the face of community opposition goes forward, it will jeopardize R8B zoning everywhere in Manhattan. The proposal also constitutes impermissible spot zoning. The applicant's attempt to tack on gratuitous changes to other lots do not change that fact. Second, the proposal would permanently and irremediably impact St. Catharines Park, which is a cherished open space in an area of the city that sorely lacks it. Most of the year, the proposed tower would cast shadows over most or all of the park during the afternoon hours when children use the park the most. There is no way to mitigate a loss of sunlight. Nothing can be done to bring sunlight back once it is lost. Third, the proposed tower would cast prolonged and significant shadows over JREC. The shadow impact on JREC is particularly problematic for the significant number of autistic students at JREC as sunlight is very important for those students. I wanna emphasize that the students and teachers at JREC do not just come from the Upper East Side. Most members of the city council have students and teachers at JREC among their constituents. Time expired. Or the proposed project would be vastly out of proportion with the rest of the neighborhood. It, this would be so even if it were on an avenue, but on a mid block, it is doubly inappropriate. Finally, I cannot overstate the degree of local community opposition to this project that we have seen in the community board. Every single CB8 meeting that has looked at this has been packed to capacity. With Russell, residents expressing I'm gonna, strong I'm gonna opposition to this proposal. I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up, please. Sure. Uh, I'm okay. here with the end. So our board resolution on the proposal passed without a single no vote. We also solicited written comments from members of the public as part of our review. Those also were overwhelmingly opposed to the project. Thank you, Russ. Okay, the last speaker on this panel is Ashley Wolcott. Okay. Start in time. Um, hello, I'm Ashley. I am an alumni at JREC from Urban Academy. Um, Okay, uh, I know we understand that the blood center does a lot for people of New York and just for people in general, but we don't, but we need to understand it's also gonna help, it's gonna hurt people as it's being constructed. Um, this tower being constructed, especially near so close to a school and so close to a park will um, cause people who, with allergies um, to, you know, have a problem and we will start develop, all this construction work can also, lead kids to developing more allergies. It's also possible for young children to inhale asbestos, which can lead to them having lung and breathing problems. The safety and well-being of children is something that should be taken seriously and be put before the building of a tower. Another point to, that should be brought to your attention is how crowded the streets of East 67 are currently without any construction or anything going on nearby. The school buses barely have any space to come in and pick up the kids and drop them off every single morning after noon. And with the construction work that would be happening so close, um, there will be little to no space for these kids to be able to get home safely and they will have to worry about other things on top of that. Um, these streets already constructed enough, they should not be congested anymore. And having this construction works so close will increase the chances of children getting hurt. Mm. Another thing that should be taken in, into consideration is, as many people have stated, the Black Center has already attempted to take over JREC um, before, and their attempt was unsuccessful. It's This is yet another attempt to push everyone out of the building, and it's causing everyone um, 
to feel unsafe. JREC is a place where kids have come to feel safe and grown an attachment to, and now they're trying to force us out by um, causing the kids to get, possibly causing kids to get sick and to feel unsafe because now they have to worry about um, not getting the things that they need, not getting the nourishment that they need because they're no longer able to go outside. Um, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for your testimony today. Councilmember Kalos has his hand up. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do my best and ask every, I'll ask the questions and if we can have enough time for the panelists to answer them. Uh, as long as you can keep it under two minutes, Ben, I will do it because we have a long list of people there. So they, they're all here because we invited them. And so just to be respectful of the time that they have. So like, let's keep it to two I minutes. I have the time Thank restored you. to the clock, please. We'll have it at two minutes then. Uh, Thank you. at Arms can restart it. Thank you. So a question to uh, the students. We don't usually get students testifying. So that's kind of a big deal for us. Um, we're here to work for you. It's your city. Uh, you're the ones taking over. How many of your classmates at Urban Academy are from the Upper East Side versus all over the city? Uh, is Urban Academy just a local school or is it citywide? For Moses, um, I've been blown away by all the testimony I'm getting about the great programs Blood Center will be doing with uh, folks all over the city. You're across the street. Can you tell me about the programs Blood Center does with the Urban Academy and Julia Richmond to, to help your students right across the street. And for Russell Squire, uh, the flood center is represented. They've been unable to, to negotiate for one reason or another. The borough president indicate they didn't negotiate with her. Uh, as board eight chair, did they negotiate with you or community board eight? Thank you. If we can start with the students, their voices are most important. Yeah, I can respond to that first question quickly. Um, yeah, JREC and Urban Academy specifically, we serve a really wide range and diverse um, pool of students from all over the city. I believe it's all five boroughs, maybe not that, and I'm not sure about that. But yeah, we have students from all over the city um, who come to school. Moses? Thank you, Councilman Member Counts. Uh, so I've been in this building for 18 years. To the best of my knowledge, uh, we have never worked in partnership with the Blood Center before. Uh, our students have never gone over there uh, and then we've never been invited, frankly. Thank you, and um, Mr. Squire, uh, he needs to be unmuted, please. And we'll need the time restored. He's gonna get unmuted. Nice. So you are correct that uh, we have not gotten any proposals for negotiation and uh, we've made our position very, very clear in many, many meetings about what our concerns are and the nature of those, and we haven't heard anything in response to those. And I have a family emergency, so I'm going to hop off briefly, but I will be back. Thank you. Okay. Um, council, do we have uh, any uh, other uh, council members that have questions for this panel? Not at this time, so we can move on to the next panel which consists of Christina Pecorelli, um, Bomi Kim, Ilona Namath, Namath, and Dr. Danielle Goro. And I understand maybe Christina Pecorelli may be on standby, so we can start this panel with Bomi Kim. Time starts now. Hi, uh, this is me, Daniel Goro. Um, speaking on behalf of Sergi Vance from live from the Blood Center. I thank you for taking up this issue and for the floor for my testimony. And so while it is beyond my purview to uh, s comment on the zoning issues, I can certainly speak to my expertise on both sides of this issue. Um, uh, when I was inventing the technology that we licensed from Sloan Kettering and spun out from Sloan Kettering, I lived at 312 East 66, which is between 1st and 2nd Avenue. And uh, that was between 2005 and 2008 when MSK was constructing their imaging center. That's number 49 on your plan. I was in 45. And so I understand because the dust and the vibrations and the light blocking were tough at that time. And I can imagine 
I can't imagine living with kids through that. So I can say that this residential community, ours, has been affected and is sensitized. But regarding the value of startup space, the biotech entrepreneurship is really the nexus that, that brings us all forward. So, so these resources are, are, are indeed critical. And I think that to a certain extent, the community and academia live in fear that industry will adversely influence or, or, or affect us. So there's this aversion to development and stepping back, I think we're undergoing a, a change wherein the community is taking its rightful place as the owner of industry and really the birther of industry. So my perspective that I'd like to share is that if this proposal succeeds, that will be another step in that evolution. And um, if it fails, it will have been too early. Um, so one thing for sure, though, is that this is about all New Yorkers, and it's the children, my children. Um, and it also includes the me of 15 years ago, the inventor, and the opportunity for which the biotech ecosystem has benefited me. Um, 919 Third Avenue is too far. Proximity is an issue. And I'll just leave it there. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Okay, the next speaker is Christina Pecorelli, to be followed by Bomi Kim. Time starts now. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Christina Pecorelli. I'm a director at HRNA Advisors. We're an economic development consulting firm based here in New York City. Uh, we were engaged by the Blood Center earlier this year to conduct a proximity study to understand the benefits of geographic clusters clustering for life science uses, including in relation to this site. Um, and our study showed that life science firms are indeed incentivized to physically cluster near academic and medical research institutions. And it is this strength of the proximity cluster that enables the individual one-off life science facilities, um, such as those that the council member and others were mentioning earlier, to exist and survive. We can't um, both be in favor of the growth of life sciences in New York City and against the strengthening of these core clusters and not to take advantage of every opportunity to, um, to establish and grow clusters that include both the institutional, um, the institutions that do the research as well as the companies that, that bring that research to market ultimately undermines the city's efforts to establish New York City as a leader in, in life sciences. Um, and since we can't really expect the medical and academic institutions to pick up and move, there are only a few locations in the city where such clusters can realistically take root, um, namely the Upper East Side, the area surrounding NYU Langone and Columbia Medical Center. Um, and to that end, I, I just wanted to briefly respond to um, a peer review of our study that was uh, submitted to the City Planning Commission refuting the benefits of proximity. Uh, we have concerns with both the substance and nature of this review, uh, which we articulate in our written testimony, but uh, particularly given the organization that was hired to write it is an affiliate of one of the firms that bid unsuccessfully to work on the same project that's before you all today. So, you know, their, their new and, and, you know, somewhat contradictory conclusion that this is now the wrong project in the wrong place, despite Time having expired. enthusiastically proposed to work on the blood center's behalf previously um, undermines the credibility and uh, objectivity of conclusions about the lack of importance of proximity. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Council, who's our next uh, speaker? The next speaker is Bomi Kim. Do we follow by Ilona Namath? Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Bomi Kim, and I'm the Vice President of MWB Services and Outreach at McKissick & McKissick. We're the nation's oldest black and women-owned design and construction management firm. We have offices in New York and Philadelphia, and we've been involved in tr transformative economic development projects for generations, including the rebuilding of the World Trade Center, the Terminal One at JFK, and many others. Center East has the potential to be one of those projects as well, spurring job creation and economic development while improving New York City's life science research infrastructure and securing a safe blood supply for our public hospitals, which all rely on the blood center to function. This proposal is estimated to create, a thousands, create thousands of direct and indirect jobs, not to mention the life science careers that the facility itself would support. This is a shot in the arm of our economy, shot in the arm that our economy needs right now, especially on behalf of the nonprofit that fulfills critical functions within the New York City's healthcare system. 
Beyond the jobs created during the construction phase, the Blood Center has committed to working with workforce development partners, including local high schools and city colleges to ensure that this project fosters a long-term pipeline for job creation. We recommend both the Blood Centers and Longfellows pledge to open opportunities for underrepresented groups in the life science industry, including local NYCHA residents. The Blood Center is not only the beating heart of the New York's blood supply, it also performs life-saving and groundbreaking research on many life-threatening biological diseases, including conditions like the sickle cell anemia and HIV that disproportionately impact New Yorkers of color. We must now move forward with a central project that support both our public health and economic recovery simultaneously. That is why we fully support the Center East project for the Blood Center, for the health and benefit of all New Yorkers, we strongly urge that the council does as well. Thank, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. And the last speaker on this panel is Ilona Namath. Time starts now. Hello. I don't know if you can see me or hear me, but can thank you, you for the... You can hear me? Good, good, thank you. So thank you for the time today. I am Ilona Nemeth. I'm the CEO of a biotech startup called Rumi Scientific, and we are based at the New York Blood Center. I speak as an example of the biotech community of startups who want to be in New York for various reasons, but find ourselves more courted by communities in other reason, regions, such as San Francisco or San Diego or the Research Triangle, where there are more biotech core clusters there and newer infrastructure which is very attractive to employees. However, because we are based on technology developed at the Rockefeller University, we had a local draw to New York City and we really believe in being in New York City and having more of an ecosystem here. So it's very important to us to be near our founder's lab at Rockefeller. And when we looked for lab headquarters, we consider ourselves very fortunate to find a home at the New York Blood Center. Like the New York Blood Center, we aim to help change and save lives. We were also drawn to them because they foster a collaborative environment, are user-friendly, and have a large positive social impact footprint. As you've heard, they're a life-saving institution for New York City, and I'm speaking from a different perspective as a satisfied tenant of the Blood Center, but also as a firm supporter of the need to have a world-class life science hub right there in the region near the, such a core cluster. We completely support updating the New York Blood Center as this important hub for scientific innovation as well as blood services. And it's really just not optimal to continue to operate up, out of the current dated building where it's also harder to attract employees. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Council, do we have any other comments? For the panel, no council members with questions. So I'm gonna call the next panel, which will be Julie Menon, Betty Cooper, Ellen Burke, and Lynn Alessi. And the first speaker of that uh, panel will be Julie Menon. Time starts now. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I want to thank Chair Moya and the committee for inviting us to testify. My name is Julie Menon, and I'm the Democratic nominee for City Council in District 5, the district that is home to the Blood Center. The community has, over the course of the ULERP process, expressed concerns about this project, and I urge the committee to listen to the community's concerns. Before turning to the community's concerns, I want to be very clear that the Blood Center does important work for our city and for the medical community. I support the critical mission of the Blood Center and want to work with them so they can continue to thrive in our neighborhood. I also recognize that this redevelopment project will bring important jobs during a time when our economy is struggling. However, the Blood Center can redevelop their facility and expand their space in a way easily within compliance of the zoning code. The current plan does not have the Blood Center expanding its footprint. They will continue to occupy only three stories of the proposed building, just as they occupy three floors of their current building. They can renovate and expand the facilities easily within a tower that complies with the RAB zoning and fits the contextual zoning of the neighborhood. The Blood Center doesn't need to build this tower to expand. I also want to make a critical point about contextual zoning and location in terms of this project. The Blood Center is trying to build this tower on a residential mid-block uh, with RAB zoning, an important contextual zoning that this neighborhood has for almost 40 years. The zoning is very clear. Bulk dense buildings are meant for the frontage of the avenues and not on the mid-blocks. 
Finally, as a former seven year community board chair and commissioner of three different city agencies, I've dealt with countless youth groups. Normally, um, the applicant takes the feedback of the community into account and modifies its proposal based on that community input. To date, the proposal has been presented on numerous times to the community and the proposal has not changed based on the community's concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Council, who's our next panelist? The next speaker is Betty Cooper to be followed by Ellen Burke. Time starts now. Do we have Betty Cooper? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Betty. Thank you so much, thank you. The Blood Center used to be a very much admired, respected, and important part of its community and beyond. As a great number of people from all boroughs who worked in the city came to donate blood there, I am shocked and disappointed that the Blood Center chose to align itself with a developer who seeks to destroy the important and necessary zoning law RHB, which protected the, the narrow mid blocks from the overly tall buildings, which we knew to see and expect on the wider avenues. The additional space needed by the blood center could be fully accomplished within the zoning law. And is my hope that our city council members of all boroughs will vote against this unnecessary violation of the RHB. As I've been listening to people speak, and they are all speaking about the neighborhood right where the blood center is, and everything they're saying is correct, but no one has yet spoken about the thousands and thousands of apartments that are on the mid blocks in this whole area. And they also deserve to have the understanding, which I hope we can expect from the, from the members of the council, that this is an issue for the entire area, that once this violation of R8B occurs, then all of the other R8B mid blocks are also going to be open to higher, higher construction. I'm asking the various members of the council who represent all the boroughs to understand that this is an issue that affects thousands of blocks. Time expired. It is not only this area. I was one of the three people who went in 1985 to get this zoning. It was so important to protect the mid blocks. I hope that that will continue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Betty. Thank you for your testimony today. Council, our next speaker. Sure, the next speaker is Ellen Burke, to be followed by Lynn Alessi. Time starts now. I'm Ellen Burke, board president of 333 East 66th Street, a large co-op directly east of the proposed blood center tower. I'm here representing both myself and the variety and vast majority of our co-op's shareholders. I wish to voice my strong opposition to the land grab by the blood center and its for-profit partner Longfellow. We are adamantly opposed to the three resolutions, rezoning, text admit, and special permit that you are currently considering at this community hearing. Along with St. Catharines Park, JREC, and the 301 East 66th Street apartment complex on 2nd Avenue, our building is one of the most affected entities due to our immediate proximity to the blood center. The grotesquely out of size tower will ruin the quality of life, not just for the local residents, but for all of those who come to learn and work in our area from every part of New York. It will set a terrible precedent by being the first upzoning of an RAB mid-block since its adoption 35 years ago and commercialized low-rise neighborhood residential streets. This is not the first time that the Blood Center proposed building a 30-story tower at this location. In 1985, they went through the environmental review process to build a tower of residential units rather than what they are proposing today. However, as has been mentioned many times throughout the process, if these resolutions are approved, Nothing legal will stop the blood center from flipping the project so that a gigantic commercial residential tower can be constructed. 
If the Blood Center wishes to build by their own admission a mid-Manhattan type of commercial tower, one with massive external signage, no setbacks, and multiple floors of noisy machinery, they're more than welcome to do it on an avenue, which has higher right of zoning, or even better, a midtown or another non-residential area, which is where this building really belongs. Please oppose this application by voting no. Thank you for your testimony today. Okay, the next speaker and the last speaker on this panel is Lynn Alessi. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Lynn Alessi. Uh, thank you to the council members for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I live at 333 East 6th Street for over five decades. I am also a board of directors of uh, the cooperative building. Uh, 333 is 75 feet from the blood center. I am, or I was, a blood donor at the blood center. I have now switched to Sloan. Since the blood center started to reveal their plans to build the blood center, there was arrogance and deafness to our, our, our uh, requests. And at, as a last minute, concessions were made but not enough. Uh, Paul Silver refers to the blood center that it does not have residents. There are residential apartments on 66th Street, both sides of the uh, blood center. There's a convent on 66th Street directly across. On the 67th Street side, of course, we know that there's uh, 2000 students with a park and a library. This is my neighborhood. Um, the Blood Center and Longfellow have no concern for the safety of our neighborhood. We ask the committee to deny the Blood Center to build this disastrous tower. Thank you. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. So, and there are no council members with questions. So I will call on the next panel, which will be Jerry Vinokuro. Deidre Fields Wilson and Alexander Bruno. So the first speaker is Jerry Nokro. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Jerry Vinokurov. I am a resident of the Upper East Side. Um, I'm speaking in support of the Blood Tower. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, partly uh, because of the positive uh, economic and scientific impact. But one thing I really wanted to say is that uh, I think that this conversation has been marred by a bunch of misinformation about specifically the shadow issue. Um, I have a four-year-old son. I take him to St. Catherine's Park uh, on a regular basis. Um, that place is baking. It's a baking inferno in the second half of the day in the summer. And I would absolutely welcome more shadows there. I mean, it's preposterous that we're talking about um, this issue of like shadows falling in the summer on a place where there's a blacktop concrete uh, that is uh, that just radiates heat all the time. And anybody who takes their kids there knows that that is the case. Um, and so it is ridiculous to me that we are having this conversation about shadows on a park where uh, it's just unbearable in the summertime. Uh, and, and so uh, I wanted to you know, correct the record there as a, both as a, you know, as somebody who uh, lives there and supports the project um, and as a parent who takes this uh, child to the park. I would absolutely welcome more shadows there. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, the next speaker on this panel is Deidre Fields Wilson to be followed by Alexander Bruno. Time starts now. Thank you for um, having me, have my voice heard today. My name is Deirdre Fields Wilson. I'm a resident of Queens. I was raised in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. I'm a sickle cell patient and a member of the New York State Sickle Cell Advocacy Network. The black community is in desperate need of this blood center. Having this available is very important to those who need regular transfusions. It's important for this and future generations that this center east be duplicated uh, with satellite programs in different areas for easier access. 
maybe if we had satellite programs, the building could be smaller and less obstructive to the um, to the neighborhood. Unders underserved communities do need this facility. It's upscale and full service, and transfusions are, can be very um, important in a time of crisis. So. Though I'm not sure if I really recommend that it be built in that location, I do recommend that it gets built. So I hope we come to some type of conclusion where everyone agrees and something gets done as opposed to just talked about. Thank you for this opportunity and I wish everyone a safe and well day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deidre, for your testimony. So the next speaker and the last speaker on this panel is Alexander Bruno. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Alexander Bruno. I'm Secretary Treasurer of Local 6A, Cement and Concrete Laborers of Greater New York area. Um, I want to promote this uh, project for a couple of reasons. One is for progression. Um, I believe New York needs to step into the uh, 21st century and update all of its medical equipment, facilities, and medical staffing. Um, also, the second thing I would like to in promoting this project is the fact that this will create quality union jobs and it also give training opportunity for students and workers of the communities throughout New York City. Um, I feel that New York is left behind when it comes to modernization of medical. Um, if you go around the country, especially in Europe, you see how advanced they are compared to what we have. I believe this facility will advance us and also afford opportunities uh, for, for many people. So I would like to show my support and also my local support, Local 6A, for this project. I appreciate everybody's time and I hope... Uh, Wiser minds will prevail when it comes to this. Thank you and have a nice day, guys. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for your testimony today. Our next speaker. Yeah, that was the last speaker on the panel and I don't see any council members with questions. So we can move on to the next panel, which will be Valerie Mason, Stephen Albanesti, Andrew Fine, Miranda Purvis and Craig DeBona. So the first speaker will be Valerie Mason to be followed by Stephen Albanetti. Time starts now. Can you hear me? We can yes. hear you, Valerie. Sorry, I was waiting. Apologies. One second, if you don't mind. Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. No worries. Good to see you again, Chair Moya. Good to see you, Valerie. Okay. Well, I'm Valerie Mason, and I'm appearing at this hearing on behalf of the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association in my capacity as its president. I'm also the second vice chair of Community Board 8 and a member of the zoning committee of the Community Board. East 72 NA represents more than 5,000 residents on the Upper East Side, none of whom live on East 66 or East 67 streets, and we're here in opposition to the proposed application we appreciate the opportunity to speak to the council through this hearing, but honestly, we're extremely saddened that we are this far along in the process and baffled that in the face of unanimous community opposition, the support, the support of all our electeds and the Manhattan Borough President, the City Planning Commission has supported a spot zoning in contradiction of its RAB rules, which were enacted to stop this egregious commercial development from happening in the first place. Um, we are blessed to have so many of the nation's premier health and research institutions in our neighborhood. I'm not going to name them all. We include the New York Blood Center in that group and we support their work. We get that they are important. We so get it that we, the community, raised money not, and hired a planner, not a lobbyist, but a planner who came up with a plan so that the Blood Center can stay on East 67th Street and have an additional 100,000 square feet more than they will have in Longfellow Tower. And as other speakers have said, we need to separate what the blood center does from a commercial tower. I mean, what more can we do? We cannot do what the blood center wants. We cannot support tinkering with RAB. When Paul Selver talks about there are 25,000 to 45,000 square feet all over New York, 
and then he names the Zuckerman building and the Coke building. Those are not on time R8 expired. B Take your time, Valerie. Okay. Those are not on RAB streets. They are with they are outside RAB. We're asking you to support our community and support RAB because we think that this is important for our entire city. Please recognize the importance of the mid blocks. Look at the city planning commission study. If you do that, you will be with us and we can find a solution with our neighbor, the blood center. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you for your testimony today. Sure, the next speaker is Stephen Albanese to be followed by Andrew Fine. Time starts now. Hello, uh, my name is Stephen Albanese with the Municipal Arts Society. MAS supports the mission of the Blood Center and recognizes its need for modern facilities near other life sciences institutions. However, we cannot support the proposal for the following reasons. Zoning. In breaking with the 1985 contextual zoning, the project would set a dangerous precedent for residential mid-block development. The building would be almost four times taller than currently allowed, and its FAR would be more than double what's currently permitted. Community planners have noted that the building's floor plates would be similar in size to the city's largest office buildings, including the Empire State Building. Such a significant departure from the existing zoning should be considered comprehensively as part of an intentional land use plan, rather than on an individual spot zoning basis. Alternatives. The Blood Center has not presented a convincing enough rationale for the size of the proposed building beyond the general argument that it is necessary for the expansion of the life sciences industry. Moreover, community planners have identified additional alternatives that would exceed the Blood Center's requirements for space while fitting in much better with the neighborhood. These merit consideration from the applicant. Shadows. The project would cast three to four hours of new shadow on St. Catharines Park during the times of day and year when it is most heavily used. During much of the afternoon, the park's athletic facilities and playground equipment would be nearly covered in project generated shadow. Ensuring the, use the continued usability of St. Catharines Park is important because it's located within an area that is considered underserved by open space and demand for the park would only increase with the addition of almost 2,000 new workers under the proposed project. So in conclusion, MAS challenges the Blood Center to come up with an alternative that meets life sciences needs without significantly altering the scale of the mid block or jeopardizing the role that St. Catharines Park plays in the health and the social life of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. The next speaker will be Andrew Fine to be followed by Miranda Perps. Time starts now. Hi, this is Andrew Fine, Vice President of the East 86th uh, Street Association and a JREC parent, parent of uh, an Urban Academy child. Uh, we're all familiar with the arguments um, on, in this debate. Children of all ages will be left in the shade at JREC and St. Catharines Park. The egregious proposed tower is four times the limit. And granting such an exception sets a dangerous precedent and destroys decades of reasonable zoning limits mid-block. This is a giveaway of public air light for solely private interests. The larger question here is why are we even here? The community is virtually unanimous in opposition to this project. We rallied hundreds in 90 degree heat in, in, in the middle of a pandemic. Community board eight voted 38 nothing to, to oppose. Every elected official from council members Powers, Kalos, our uh, Manhattan Borough president, and Congresswoman Maloney are all opposed. Everybody opposes this. The city council exists to represent the interests of all the citizens of New York City, not just a few connected real estate interests. To come to any conclusion aside from rejecting this egregious tower would illustrate that our city council and our gov city government is both corrupt and broken. I thank you for your time. The next speaker will be Miranda Purse to be followed by Craig Debona. Time starts now. Hi, um, my name is Miranda Purvis. Um, I'm a journalist and editor. I've written for the New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, the Wall Street Journal, amongst other places. Um, my, my son is a junior at the Urban Academy at the Julia Richmond Center. 
Uh, during this pandemic, we saw as never before that schools mean everything for society to function, for women to work, for families to stay solid, and, and this is not an exaggeration, for children to stay alive. Um, yes, the blood center saves lives, but so do schools. According to the CDC, teen suicide increased by 60% between 20, 2007 and 2018. It's the second leading cause of adolescent death after car crashes, and this was before the pandemic. During the winter shutdown, uh, the CDC reported a 39% spike in ER visits related to teen suicides. I spent months of last year outside my son's door on suicide watch. All around me, I saw teenagers turning into zombies, unable to leave their bedrooms. I heard an ambulance arrive in the middle of the night. A previously healthy teenage girl next door was taken to the hospital because she couldn't stop screaming. In my house, my son tried dangerous pharmaceuticals he'd never shown any proclivity toward. I watched Becky Wolzer and Christine Olson, who run the Urban Academy, work absurd hours with their own children stuck at home to get their students together at parks anywhere and then to get them back in the classroom as soon as humanly possible. This year with full-time school back, the change in my son feels like a miracle. He's alive again and so are his friends. He's thinking about calculus and he looks forward to going every day. This is a very special school. It is not just any building. It, it, it lets in light. It's a beautiful example of good public architecture and because of the low-lying blood center as it now exists, these teachers can engage with their students in a pocket of relative calm in a relentless city. Time expired. I beg you for once, council members, vote for education. This time, listen to the teachers, put them first. The blood center can expand elsewhere. They will still be proximate. It's a small island. If they're 10 blocks away, if they're 15 blocks away, it's close enough. Save JREC, please. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, council who's on The last speaker on this panel is Craig DeBona. Starting time. My name is Craig DeBone and I live, I've lived at 333 66th Street for 45 years. During the 1950s, my father worked for the government filming the atomic bomb and germ warfare tests in Nevada. At the time, we had no idea the dangers, radiation and other hazards would cause us. As a result, decades later, I came down with one of the most deadly cancers and given three months to live. It was the same cancer people living in Chernobyl contacted. Incredibly, I've survived twice Unfortunately, my brother did not. These tests, however, were not conducted in a densely populated urban center for obvious reasons. The fact that the blood center works on BSL-3 lab type projects like SARS and COVID by their own admission and the thought of the tower spewing airborne matter into the surrounding air of the residential area using high speed exhaust fans would be disastrous. Trucks carrying biological waste onto West East 66th Street is an unnerving thought. With 2,500 workers traveling to and from this site using crowded public transportation poses a more serious threat of contamination than Wuhan, which we have all witnessed. In the last year and a half, sub spread caused by a human error cannot be ruled out. The idea of building a 284 foot tower casting a perpetual shadow over the JREC complex and St. Catherine's Park in addition to what we have learned from the pandemic should render this project dead on arrival. We are literally fighting for the survival of our community and neighbors. I implore you for the safety of your community and New York City to vote no. This project is nothing but an attempted land grab by a greedy out-of-state corporation, Longfellow. And remember one thing, they can build as of right a bigger building than they would actually get with this tower. Keep that in mind, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Who is the last speaker of the panel chair? And we don't have any council members with questions, so I can move on to the next panel, which will be Rose Hatche, Martin Bell, Allison Bell, and Maria Andriano. Rose Hatche will be the first speaker, followed by Martin Bell. Starting time. Mm -hmm. 
Rose, we can hear you. Can you, you're on yeah. mute. Um, my name's Rose Hache. I live 333 East 68th Street. I oppose the waiver of the New York City's mid-block zoning law to allow the new blood center tower. During the May 12th CB8 meeting, the Longfellow attorney, Paul Silver, countered concerns about additional BSL-3 biohazard labs by committing to add language to space leases prohibiting it. As lawyers, we all know leases are contracts that can be amended and provisions waived. It's a particularly hypocritical position considering it's a zoning waiver that Longfellow requests in this particular instance. All of my other points have been covered and I thank you for this time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. There, I just got notified that we have Congresswoman Maloney here to testify. Okay. Thank you. We'll get back to the rest of the panel. Um, right after the Congresswoman's testimony. Do we have the Congresswoman? Here we go. Oh, I see her. Hello. Hi, Congresswoman. Can you hear me? We can hear you whenever you're ready. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you so much, uh, Chairman Francisco Moya and the New York City Land Use Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises for allowing me to virtually present my testimony today and for accommodating my schedule. We're literally on the floor in between votes. But I live in the neighborhood and I am strongly opposed to the modification of the current R8B contextual zoning proposed by the New York Blood Center to allow for the construction of a 334 foot mid block uh, breaking all precedents commercial tower at 310 East 67th Street, which is located in the 12th Congressional District, which I have the privilege to, to represent. As you know, this project would provide the Blood Center with a new state of the art facility. However, over 60%, 60% of the building would be commercial space having nothing to do with the Blood Center controlled by a private developer. In other words, it's a real estate development project. I, I support the laudable work of the Blood Center and recognize its need for space, but I do not believe that this project is appropriate or, or honest or fair to the neighborhood. And uh, it is, and 60, over 60% 60 is not related to the Blood Center. I'm particularly concerned that the rezoning actions necessary for this project would inappropriately greatly increase density and traffic in a neighborhood that is already one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in our entire city, probably the entire world. The proposed zoning change would allow for out of context, mid block high rises, reducing light and quality of life. Alarmingly, this rezoning and the anticipated increase in traffic poses a tremendous risk to the thousands of children who use St. Catherine's Park or attend Julia Richmond School. The modification of the current R88B contextual zoning threatens the character of the neighborhood and represents a dangerous precedent for the entire Upper East Side and other neighborhoods throughout the five boroughs. Everyone would want a variance like this variance. Since my days in the city council, I have worked diligently with my, my neighbors to preserve our historic residential community of which this is one. Therefore, I strongly oppose the rezoning application. Additionally, I, I ask that you maintain the important tradition of member respect and deference in decisions such as this. It is a policy that protects each and every community in New York City. And not only is our council member Ben Kalo opposed to it, every single elected representative, every single block association president, every single neighborhood not-for-profit, the entire neighborhood is unified in opposition. The entire neighborhood, the entire Upper East Side cannot be wrong. This is an ill-advised uh, a project. It is a, a profit-making project for a profit-making private individual. It harms the neighborhood. 
And this is an issue that deeply affects many of my constituents and neighbors. And I wish I were able to join you when you called on me earlier. However, as fellow legislators, I hope you understand that the vote schedule required me to be here in Washington. I wish I was there in person with you. I wanna thank you for considering my testimony consistent with all rules and regulations. And I ask you to listen to the voices and concerns of the parents, the teachers, the neighborhood leaders, the elected officials, all of whom have uniformly come out in opposition to this project. I yield back and I'm going to the floor of the United States Congress to vote for you. Please excuse me. Thank you. Are you? Thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman. Team, listen to listen to the team. You Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Chair, resuming our panel. Um, the next speaker will be Martin Bell to be followed by Allison Bell. Starting time. From Dr. Hillier's first presentation to CB8, the blood center has been misrepresenting things. He showed a map of the tower compared to other buildings in the neighborhood, claiming the tower was on the lower end, but failing to point out that those other buildings were all along avenues with huge setbacks, while their tower was mid-block occupying the entire site. He then said, New York isn't just our name, we're New York through and through. Not mentioning that the New York Blood Center is also in Connecticut, New Jersey, and Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, and Rhode Island and Kansas, Minnesota and Missouri, and Nebraska. They hype their collaboration with MSK while Cornell and Rockefeller claiming it's essential for collaborating researchers to be in close physical proximity forgetting to mention that their researchers also collaborate with researchers in China three times as much as with those neighboring institutions and with researchers in 20 other states and more than a dozen other foreign countries. I don't mind being lied to as much as I resent being treated like a fool who's not going to check the facts and accept their bullshit. I, ho I apologize. I hope the council members also see through all the talk today about the blood center and life science when this application is really so a tower can be built by a, by a Boston developer who isn't even here. But it's not that hard. You can forget all the testimony you heard today from both sides. Confucius said a picture's worth a thousand words. This project is so egregiously inappropriate, it's as obvious as the nose on my face. Chair Moya and others, I respectfully ask that you meet me on 67th and 2nd, and we'll look to the left and see the blood center mid-block and then we'll look across Second Avenue to a 33-story apartment building and try to imagine that the Blood Center wants to put a tower equal to three of those apartment buildings at its mid-block mid site with no setback. Meet me and please see for yourself. Thank you. The next speaker on this panel is Allison Bell. Start in time. My name is Allison Bell and I am also opposed to the Longfellow Tower. To be perfectly honest, I find it unfathomable that we are all here today. The New York Blood Center can build an as of right building that will take care of their needs by their own admission. When I first read about this proposed project a year ago, I immediately wanted to learn more about it and about this application process. I was steered to attend the community board eight meetings. Longfellow New York Blood Center made their presentation the community asked lots of questions, and they were supposed to be addressed at the next meeting. Longfellow and the New York Blood Center did not attend that one, nor the one after that. And when they finally came back, they virtually showed us the exact same presentation and answered very few questions. So here we are, with never any good faith outreach to this community by the Blood Center, by Longfellow, by their lawyers, by their PR firm, by their lobbyists to answer or address the serious concerns of my community. I could talk about the shadows, the loss of light, the disruption, the traffic, but I wanna focus on the zoning. Folks work long and hard for the R8B zoning. You should have heard them at the community center, the community board, meet eight, board eight meetings. They were still so passionate about saving the mid blocks. Now a Boston developer arrives, let's change the zoning. Let's build a building four times what is allowed. Blood Center, build your building as of right. It's the right thing to do. Longfellow, build your science tower at a properly zoned place. It's the right thing to do. And sometimes the right thing to do 
is not about the money. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for your testimony. The last speaker on this panel chair is Maria Andriano. Start in time. Hello. As a longtime resident of the Upper East Side, I am strongly opposed to this to the New York Blood Center's plans to rezone and build a commercial tower mid-block. The proposed building would be four times larger than the 75 foot height limit allowed. Zoning that was designed to preserve access to light and air, zoning that was designed to protect locations such as the ones impacted well, that such as the ones that will be impacted by Longfellow, St. Catherine's Park and the six schools of the Julia Richmond Education Complex. This tower development would set a dangerous precedent, not only to this neighborhood, but to all of New York City. Proposal is being touted as support for the life sciences, but the blood center would only occupy 35%. The expanded space as proposed is not essential to the, to the blood center's core mission, which can be adequately served by a much smaller as of right development. Let's call a spade a spade. This is a real estate ploy by Boston, Boston developer to build more condos in an already congested neighborhood. The proposal by Longfellow will ruin the quality of life for the children of this neighborhood and the children attending the Julia Richmond Education Complex. As our elected officials, I beseech you to put, for once, our people over profit. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maria, for your testimony today. Here, we don't have any council members with questions, so I can call the next panel. Great, thank you. Which is going to be Susan Cooper, Martin Edelman, Stephanie Reckler, and Barry Adler. So the first speaker is Susan Cooper to be followed by Martin Edelman. Starting time. Do we have Susan Cooper? Yes. Thank you. I'm talking about 2,500 children who are already distressed by the pandemic and this crazed world. They have been through enough, 2,500 kids and 600 new children each year for four to five years of construction. The impact on these kids concerned me, so I looked for research about what that impact might mean to them. And the Environmental Protection Agency has published a brochure titled Noise and Its Effect on Children. This research tells us that noise poses a serious threat to a child's physical and psychological health. It can damage their ability to talk, to listen, and to read. It can affect the capacity to learn and impair hearing. Physically, it can disturb the cardiovascular system, causing high blood pressure and other vascular ailments. We don't need yet another tall building in New York City, but we do need kids who can learn and be well adjusted. I'm sorry to get emotional about this, but this huge impact on kids is unconscionable. The brochure tells us how to minimize these risks, but none of the suggestions will help as no one will have any control over the unreal noise of construction, which cannot be tempered no matter how hard they say they will try. The shadow slide that the blood center showed earlier put JREC in total shadow, the school, not just the park, the school in total shadow. The current slide shows the school in sunlight with wide open windows, no heavy curtains, no double city windows, no air conditioners, blocking the natural light and air. I'm sure some of you are parents and we all are or should be child. The children in JREC, in the SAM school, in PM26, will suffer irreparable damage, and this will particularly um, the kids of special learning. There are already over 5 million kids with noise-induced hearing loss. Please, council members, let us not add to that count by allowing this project to move forward in this particularly ill-advised location. 
With other options, the blood center has pit their own economic benefits against the will, the well-being of thousands of our New York City children. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your testimony today. Our next speaker is Martin Edelman, to be followed by Stephanie Reckler. Starting time. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mar Marty Edelman, an Upper East Side resident for over 50 years and a native New Yorker. I support the rebuilding of the blood center to the existing mid-block height zoning code of 75 feet. And I believe that they will be able to then accomplish all that their mission identifies. I do not support building a tower, which could be 334 feet, that would bring one additional research with pathogens in a, into a residential neighborhood, two additional 2,000 people to work in the building that would overwhelm the local service businesses. Three, too much additional traffic to congestion, given that we already have a crosstown bus and school buses on East 67th Street and a main route on East 66th Street for cars going to the west side through Central Park. And four, noise, unhealthy air, and reduced light to the Julia Richmond School Complex and St. Catharines Park during and after construction. I thank you very much for hearing my testimony and I hope that you will do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Our next panelist. The next speaker is Stephanie Reckler to be followed by Barry Adler. Starting time. Yes, I represent the Committee to Protect our Lenox Hill neighborhood. We've submitted written testimony in great detail regarding Northwell Lenox Hill and the similarities of our objections to the Longfellow Blood Center. I've listened to the entirety of the council meeting so far. I just learned of the compromises that the Blood Center has made. I appreciate the probing questions that councilmen uh, Kalos and Powers have asked and have listened carefully to the public's con comments, but there are compromises that cannot fix some of the issues. You cannot make the roadways wider to accommodate the increased traffic that these new large buildings will generate. You cannot reroute the crosstown buses or the school buses that drop off the children at JREC. You cannot tell an ambulance stuck in traffic with a dying patient just to wait before getting to the Lenox Hill ER. It was said that no residential built housing will be reduced. Great, but the proposals will reduce the quality of life. The playground fund cannot reduce the shadows on the park. Only God can. The convoluted arguments for zoning variances will set a precedent in all districts. The blood center needs to rethink its plans. As stated, the plans will affect every district, every councilman. To be very clear, we are not against development. Development needs to respect the community. No consideration has been given to the impact these grandiose projects have on the community. Please vote against the current blood center proposal. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Chair Mo Mo Moya. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much for your testimony today. So the last speaker on this panel is Barry Adler. Start in time. Hello, uh, my name is Barry Adler. Uh, for 20 years, I've lived at 315 East 68th, and I've attended, I think, every hearing about this project. For me, the objections don't start or end with shadows and they have nothing to do with NIMBY selfishness. Yes, the shadows will be extremely damaging to our park and school and shouldn't be allowed, but I would be here protesting even if the sunlight stayed in full. This is to me about a powerful nonprofit that pays its top people high six and even seven figure salaries that somehow seems to think it can have a new building for free by, selling, by effectively selling air rights it doesn't own and that don't exist. And it is about an out of town developer that sees a way to get a lucrative foothold in our neighborhood on the cheap. This is not about denying the blood center a much needed new facility. A lot of people have said that already. 
And a lot of people have noted that under the existing zoning, the blood center could put up an act actually a bigger place than it now uh, plans to put up. And, but that would be for free. Uh, we think it has the money though. I think it has the money to pay for it. I think it doesn't want to spend it. And it certainly would have this neighborhood's complete support to build a, a structure of right. Nobody's against that. What this is about is stopping the gutting of a zoning rule that prohibits mammoth mid-block towers, not just near me, but near you too, to keep the scale city human and this neighborhood viable. It is, it is about not adding 2,000 workers, or I think Dr. Hillier said today 5,000 in all, and untold numbers of cars and trucks to residential streets that are already dangerously congested, including often impeding the passage of ambulances that go to the very hospitals down the block that the blood center works with. And finally, it is about cynicism. Almost no one who lives in this neighborhood has spoken up for this project. Our council member has been against it. I'm expired. His likely successor is against it. The borough president is against it. Our state officials and our congresswoman are all against it. Yet this project has been sailing through. Why? How cynical should my answer be? Prove me wrong. Stop this project now. Thank you very much for my time. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for your testimony. So that was the last speaker on this panel, and I don't see any council members with questions. So I'm going to call on the next panel, which will be Peter Patch, Joshua Satin, Alita Kemp, and Trisha Shimamura. So the first speaker on that panel is Peter Patch, to be followed by Joshua Satin. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, I'm a member of Community Board 8 and a co chair of the Youth and Education Committee. In that capacity, I am very much focused on the health, well-being, and education of our young people. I am also very much supportive of appropriate economic development because I think that's important to the future health and well-being uh, of the city. However, this particular development, this particular proposal could not be more inappropriate. I support development which is in context, has significant community support, and is consistent with the zoning requirements of the city. Zoning requirements are put in place in order to, to provide both for economic health of the city and for quality of life of the residents. This proposal violates that, and has particularly negative impacts on the Julia Richmond Educational Complex and the, and the park. So I urge you, along with the residents of the community and our city, city council members and our other elected officials, to reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your testimony today. Our next speaker, next speaker is, will be Joshua Satin to be followed by Alita Kemp. Start in time. Do we have Joshua? Why don't we move to the next, next speaker, speaker, sir? We'll take on Alita Camp while we figure out if Joshua is joining. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya and council members for hearing my testimony. My name is Alita Camp, and I was chair of CB8 when the Blood Center first brought this project with Longfellow to us, but I am speaking individually. The diversity, jobs, union jobs, and research can be achieved wherever the building is built without the negative community impact. To the community's surprise and to the elected officials' surprise, until this hearing, Longfellow reduced, we did not know that Longfellow had reduced the height, which is indicative of its failure to inform the community and further indication of its disrespect for the community. Please close your eyes and think of your home, your children's schools, your family's park. Now think of a tower that runs through the block next door to each of them. Think of thick traffic, noise and air pollution from the traffic, loading bays and the hum of ventilation systems light pollution from the signage and an all glass building. Think of this right in front of your homes, your schools, your parks, your libraries. 
Consider the danger from a BSL-3 lab next door to your homes and schools. These are so potentially catastrophic that the DOHMH won't release their addresses. Consider the danger from radioactive materials, including their storage and disposal. Consider that we don't know the work the labs will perform or their standards of care. Think of all this next door to where you live. Think of noise from loading bays, from carting companies and hazardous waste disposal companies coming through the night. Think of human and mechanical error, crane collapses, the ventilation unit that doesn't work but needs to work to exhaust toxic air, accidents involving waste disposal trucks backing into or out of loading bays. Think of the, whether this building needs to be on E66, 67th Street when the blood center can build a building as of right, which would provide construction jobs, allow work to find cures for diseases, and provide the internships it has promised, but which it has not before been interested. Fire. Consider whether this building belongs in any residential community. Doctors have said no. Contractors and developers of life sciences centers have said no. Every elected official representing this site, other than the mayor, has said this building is inappropriate. Just because a residential site is rezoned to commercial does not make it a commercial zone. 50 members of this council have constituents whose children attend JREC. Should those children be subjected to the dangers that this building would bring? Would you want your children to face these dangers? I urge you to deny this application. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. The next speaker on this panel is Trisha Shimamura. Starting time. My name is Trisha Shimamura, and I'm a social worker and a longtime member of Manhattan Community Board 8, where I am currently the first vice chair and the co chair of the Parks and Waterfront Committee. I'm also a mother to a two year old who plays in St. Catharines Park on a regular basis. I urge you to disapprove the proposed application for the New York Blood Center. My neighbors have already spoken about the dangerous zoning precedent that would be set, the tremendous burdens on Julia Richmond Education Complex directly across from the Blood Center. You've already heard that JREC houses six different schools serving students from across the city, but I also wanna call attention to the uh, transportation impacts of this project. School buses along with the M66 bus are near constant on 67th Street and many students, particularly our younger students and students with special needs require additional assistance as they enter and exit the building. Enveloping JREC in near permanent shadows and adding additional traffic to the street devalues our students and their safety. I will note that none of the measures proposed today would reverse the fact that these students would be in permanent shadows and navigating a very dangerous street. I find it troubling that the developer would recognize the sensitivities towards noise for these students, but would not also recognize the need for sunlight and pedestrian safety for all students. Finally, I urge you to consider, consider the devastating impact on St. Catharines Park. By their own assessment, the developers acknowledge that the project would cast shadows causing significant adverse impact on the park. And in fact, the majority of the park would lose direct light through the spring, summer, and fall months in the afternoon. The City Parks Department has also agreed with this assessment, noting that the shadows would negatively affect planning and activities in the park. No amount of funding by the developer would bring back the sunlight. St. Catharines is one of the most heavily visited parks in our entire city, and somewhat uniquely, it serves a wide range of users, including seniors, families, hospital patients. Um, this is not just for children. It's an open space with tables, benches, a bathroom, and a very walkable pathway that makes the park beloved by seniors, employees, and other adults. The loss of sunlight during peak summer hours in the late afternoon and early evenings, at a time when park use is highest, is too high to bear. For all of these reasons, I ask you to disapprove this application. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. Uh, our next speaker. Uh, Chair, it doesn't look like we could get Joshua from this panel. So that was the last speaker on this panel. And Council Member Kalos has his hand up. Good, Council Member. Starting time. Can we unmute uh, Council Member Kalos? Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry that I had to step away for the family emergency. And thank you, Chair Moya, for uh, keeping the hearing going uh, through these several hundred folks. Uh, a question to Alita Camp. While you were uh, the, the blood center saying that they've been unable to negotiate, uh, 
when you were chair of community board eight, uh, did they try to negotiate with you at all? I apologize for the background noise. Of course, the phone chooses this time to ring with a spam call. Um, in any event, no, they did not choose to negotiate. They did not answer all of the, the community. It should stop any second now. The community board's questions, um, Paul Selver said that he would respond to them, but he did not. They were not responsive. They were not respectful. They didn't post in conformity with the community board's requests prior to the ULERP. So no, they have not been responsive in any way and they have not negotiated they indicate they in fact they said that they wouldn't that ULERP was the time to negotiate i'm no longer chair but my understanding is that they have chosen not to negotiate during this ULERP process either in fact they didn't as i mentioned they didn't even tell us that they had um, reduced the height by 50 feet as they said this morning and it was a big surprise as you heard question to uh trisha so you may see behind me a map of the parks and so um the the one question that mayor de blasio's office has asked me is why parents like me and you can't just use central park why do we need a playground on this map uh so that that is a uh, one question for you uh trisha and um the the uh, other question is what what time do you tend to take your child to the park and you need a park that has sunlight in it after three o'clock. I take my son to the park almost every day after school um, and I pick him up at 445. Time so every day after school, I pick him up. Every day we go to the park that has the sunlight because it's cold even now. And he, we like a park that has sunlight in it. It's my way of knowing that he gets outside. And my son is two years old. He can't walk further than really 10 blocks is is the the farthest and I'm carrying him half all that way so no we cannot go to Central Park particularly in in the second third and first avenue in York this is our park thank you thank you uh, thank you for uh, your questions council member uh, seeing no other council members that have any questions this panel is uh, now excused and council, if you can please go up to the next panel. Sure, the next panel will be Michelle Birnbaum, Sharon Pope Marshall, Elizabeth Rose, and Margaret Short. And the first speaker in that panel is Michelle Birnbaum to be followed by Sharon Pope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair Moy. My name is Michelle Birnbaum, and I'm a member of Community Board 8 Manhattan. And while I'm not speaking on behalf of the board today, I should note that the board unanimously disapproved this application. As one who attended all of the community meetings addressing the development of the Blood Center site, and also a member of the Zoning Committee, I am testifying today in firm opposition to the proposed development on East 67 and 66th Street. I'm here to affirm support for the unanimous vote of the Community Board to disapprove the Longfellow Real Estate Partners redevelopment proposal. For all the reasons stated in the seven page CB8 resolution and for the noteworthy important concerns that such a breach of mid-block zoning will conjure, it is without doubt that such a breach of mid-block block zoning that many fought so hard for and which has protected the character, character and quality of life in the neighborhood for all these years will adversely affect many communities in all five boroughs far into the future. And so it's imperative this is denied. Zoning regulations are the only thing that stand between communities and development chaos, and therefore they must be respected and protected. A precedent for building the equivalent of a 33-story commercial building in a block of residential housing is abhorrent and in this case unnecessary as any need of the blood center can be achieved under current zoning regulations. Any as of right construction by the blood center on its current site and any construction by Longfellow Real Estate Department on any other sites will satisfy their programmatic needs. Development will employ a full complement of union labor workers. So the argument that denying this application would result in a loss of union jobs is untrue. Any social equity issue that was brought into this conversation was done so with an eye towards describing false motives and muddying the waters. Likewise, pointing to any specific disease and implying that if this application were denied, that the research and that 
disease would be impeded is also untrue. It's a zoning issue, and that's why it's in front of the zoning committee. Please join the many neighborhood preservation groups, block associations, community groups, community facilities, residents and businesses, and stand in opposition to the Longfellow proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, Joshua Satin is here from Julia Richmond. Josh, hold on one second. Council, who's your next, the next speaker? speaker and chair on this panel is Sharon Pope Marshall, who we followed by Elizabeth Rose. Starting time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, chair Moya, Council Member Kalos, and members of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify against the New York Lead Center development proposal. My name is Sharon Pope Marshall, Executive Director of Civitas. Since 1981, Civitas, an organization of citizens, has been dedicated to improving the neighborhood quality of life on the Upper East Side and also El Barrio East Harlem. The New York Blood Center is one of the largest community-based nonprofit collection and distribution organizations in the United States, a spectacular achievement. A new New York Blood Center facility can be built and should be built, but not by sacrificing the existing R8B zoning district. As of right, development may not produce the out of scale Boston developed tower the blood center team wants, but it will be the modern 21st century facility that the New York blood center and the city needs. The proposal before you seeks to remove the existing RAB zoning designation. RAB protects our low density mid blocks and guides larger commercial activity to the avenues. The removal of RAB is a direct assault on lower density side streets, which will have profound impacts and implications, not just for our community, but for communities across our city, not Boston's. Disapprove this I'm application. I just had two sentences. Disapprove this application. We can do better. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We call up our next speaker. The next speaker is Elizabeth Rose to be followed by Margaret Short. Starting May Johnson. I ask that you call Joshua Satin? Um, he's, he's a principal of a school and I think his time is more valuable. I will wait until he has gone. Okay, folks, we have an order here and I know that we wanna get all, all of the people in, but we, we have an order, we just wanna keep that, that going. Um, so uh, council, if, uh, we'll make the exception here to-, to... Uh, Joshua Satin, can you- Accept the unmute request if you're available. Hello. Hi, my name is Joshua Satin. I am the principal of the Ella Baker School, building manager of the Julia Richmond Complex. Um, I am here as one of the many voices uh, of the over 2,000 students. 300 staff members coming into the building each day. And we completely oppose the building um, of the tower across the street. Um, I was just out in the playground doing dismissal and boy was the sun coming over the top of the, the building right over there, the blood center. And it was just peeking over, giving our kids sunlight. If this building goes up at three o'clock, it'll be dark. Throughout the day, we're talking about years and years of um, years and years of um, noise pollution, overcrowding in the streets, just to build this structure that will keep us in the dark. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot allow it. 
I've been listening to Ben Kalos with these amazing suggestions and giving buildings to communities that deserve really amazing biotech. And it should not go here. Right now, we're talking, he, I think the person said three years to build, it'll be four or five. We all know what happens with building. So that's a complete life of an urban student, of a 226 student, of an Ella Baker student, of a Vanguard student, of a Manhattan International student, of a Talent Unlimited student, of a life student. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot put these kids through this problems. And then after that, it'll be years and years of congestion of up on 67th Street, over on 66th Street. You already can't get over and go south on, um, on 2nd Avenue after four o'clock. This will be a huge disaster to the community. Tom Ambulance is going down to the street. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, let's call up the next speaker. For the next speaker is Margaret Schwartz to be followed by Elizabeth Rose. Start in time. Hi there, my name is Margaret Schwartz and I am an Upper East Side resident and I work and live within 10 blocks of the blood center. I was an avid donor at the blood center for since COVID began, just trying to do my part during the pandemic. And since uh, attending many community board meetings and seeing the unresponsiveness of Longfellow and particularly the arrogance of the lawyer representing them, um, I just can't believe that we're even at this point. I ask that the proposal is rejected and that we listen to the community and the people that live in this neighborhood and some that do work in this neighborhood and who attend the school as well. Let's not listen to the unions who are asking them to work and build a building within the zoning rules. And let's keep our eyes on the prize here. Our eyes on the prize is this is a zoning issue. We need to stop mid block building. We already can't stop what's going on with commercial and residential real estate on the Upper East Side. So let's please listen to the community of which there are many. And so far I haven't found one that is in favor of this project. Yes, I love the sun, less I love the parks, but we need to protect the building that's going on around us. And no one's mentioned whether or not the infrastructure underneath us can actually support a building that size. Con Edison is all over the Upper East Side trying to provide power, gas, electric. Can we actually do this from that standpoint? Yes, the height of the building is out of the question, but what's going on underneath us? And can we supply the actual energy to supply what this building, what this research is after. And yes, we have muddied the waters with sickle cell anemia research, with COVID research. All this will continue to go on around us, no matter what, and no matter where that building is. Yes, more communication goes on with China from MSK and Rockefeller University than between Rockefeller. I'm speaking I'm out inspired. of context here, but yes, proximity, give me a break and don't build this tower. Listen to the community. Thank you for my time. Thank you, thank you for your testimony uh, today. Uh, let's call up our uh, last speaker. The last speaker on this panel is Elizabeth Rose. Start in time. Thank you, Chair Moya. I'd like to address two statements made by the applicant earlier today. The first was that the building type and form are appropriate to the neighborhood. Um, the footprint of this proposed tower at 290 feet, which is now approximately where they're saying they would stop, is comparable to the footprint of the Empire State Building, the Freedom Tower, one Vanderbilt, and 10 Hudson Yards. None of those buildings exist in a mid-block setting surrounded by low-scale residential buildings. So no, it is not of type and form appropriate to the neighborhood. The applicant also said that it was impossible to prove the impact on R8B zoning and effectively suggested that the council should discount that issue in their consideration. First of all, the statement goes both ways. They also can't prove that it won't impact R8B zoning elsewhere. And in fact, it's really easy for members of the community to imagine that it will for a couple of reasons. 
The first is that the Blood Center's original proposal in the ZAP portal included the entire mid block between 1st and 2nd Avenues and 66th and 67th Streets, not just their own lot. We also know that other medical institutions already own many mid block lots in this neighborhood of the Upper East Side. Thus far, they have been respectful of our 8 b zoning in developing those properties. But it's really reasonable and easy to imagine that they would also seek to uh, break our 8 b if this proposal is approved. And let's remember, this is about the blood center seeking a free facility. Usually when you seek something for free, you have to be willing to compromise. Um, they could compromise with an alternative location for a tower. They could compromise with a smaller building at the current location. But in no event, why should the blood center get everything it wants for free at the expense of the local community? Thank you. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel and council member Kalos has his hand up for a question. Council member Kalos. Thank you, chair. Uh, Principal Joshua Satin, uh, I'm gonna ask these questions uh, playing devil's advocate to both uh, two of these panelists. Uh, Joshua Satin, what's so special about Ella Baker? Where are your kids from? And what are their demographics like? And to Elizabeth Rose, as a former deputy chancellor for facilities for the Department of Education, who I have gone head to head with at numerous hearings, what's so special about Julie, Edu Julie Richmond Education Complex and why do these kids need light in their classroom or on their playgrounds or at dismissal? If we can unmute uh, the panelists, please. I'll let Josh respond first. Yes, please. If we can restore the time on the we clock. Have, we have Josh. All right, I will jump in and respond to your question to Joshua Satin as well. Ella Baker is actually the only unzoned school of choice uh, in this area, and it admits students from throughout the city, and in fact was, was designed to serve the children of people who worked in the neighborhood but did not live in the neighborhood. Um, that is a very rare thing. It welcomes students from throughout the city uh, and is a very special place. Julia Richmond overall was the first uh, large failing high school facility uh, that was actually closed and reopened as a group of small schools. Um, this happened probably about 25 years ago uh, and this is the model. This is an extraordinarily successful complex of successful schools that serve the needs of an extremely diverse student population that comes from throughout the city that includes immigrants, English language learners, students with disabilities, students who have not been successful in other schools. Um, this is the national model. And when the school construction authority seeks sites for new school buildings, one of the critical components that they look for is the presence of natural light so that their classrooms can have natural light for the students. That's a very critical component to school design. So thank you for the questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, seeing that there's no other council members with uh, questions, um, we are going to now excuse this panel and uh, council, if you can please call up the next panel. Sure, the next panel will be Nancy Klein, Sandra Lerner, Kathy O'Connor and Maggie Lehman. Um, so the first speaker on that panel will be Nancy Pline, followed by Sandra Lerner. Starting time. Do we have Nancy Pline? Hello. Hi, Nancy. Yes, hello. Hi. I'm, 
I'm up here in the corner. I, we can we can hear you and we can see you. Okay. Whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nancy Ply, I'm a, re I'm a resident and community liaison for 333 East 69th Street, a 114 unit residential co-op. And I am treasurer of the East 69th Street Block Association. Today, I represent both groups in supporting the work of the New York Blood Center, but am opposing their proposed rezoning and expansion proposal. This proposal seeks to allow a 600,000 square foot commercial building in a residential mid block street. The proposed 334 foot tall building is four and a half times larger than the 75 foot height limit allowed by the current R8B zoning, zoning that was designed to preserve access to light and air. That's especially critical considering that the location is across from the six schools in the Julia Richmond Education Complex and St. Catharines Park. During the five-year construction, there will be disruption and noise and reduced light for the students in the schools and in the park. After construction, the character of the neighborhood and the school environment will be irreparably harmed. Finally, the blood center would occupy just 35% of the proposed building space. The other 65% of the building will belong to a for-profit developer who can rent the space. The expanded space as proposed is not essential to the blood center's core mission which could be adequately served by building as of right with no change in zoning laws received. As you did when evaluating the Brooklyn Botanic Garden application, I would urge you to consider the real, real, real ramifications for the project on both the local community that needs light and air and the larger community throughout the city that uses the Julia Richmond Education Complex. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. Uh, I don't see Sandra Lerner, who I had announced in the meeting, so I'm just gonna move on to Kathy O'Connor and Maggie Lehman will be next after Kathy while we look for Sandra. Starting time. Thank you, council members. Um, I am opposed to the Blood Center Longfellow commercial tower proposal. It is an egregious project that has no place in any residential neighborhood. This zone is zoned for residential. It is not zoned for commercial tower. I support the Blood Center. I support their mission, but this proposal is nothing more than zoning for dollars. In addition, I support everybody who's mentioned the shadows that would be cast over the school complex and the playground, as well as the rest of the neighborhood. The building's operations would also contribute to additional street traffic to a neighborhood with school bus activity, a cross town, busy cross town bus route, and emergency vehicle traffic. In this proposal, the blood center would only occupy the lower third of the building. The majority of this project is purely commercial. The project is a bad plan for the neighborhood and a bad plan for the city. I support, support the blood center's mission, but this proposal is, I'm against this proposal. The applicant has demonstrated a disregard for the community and for decades of successful zoning. It requires the community to impact the, the egregious building in order to benefit a private developer. I urge you to reject this proposal. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, who's our next speaker? So the next speaker is Maggie Lehman, to be followed by Sandra Lerner. Starting time. You got to unmute yourself first, Maggie. You got to unmute yourself. Hey, 
Here go Megan. Can you can you hear me, Sharon no. Moya? Yep, now we can, can you hear, hear me. You. We can hear you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You can hear kids in the background. Chairman Moya, thank you so much. And to the committee. And this is the this is the blood centers mid-block East 67th Street location. You can see how close the school is to the blood center. You can see how narrow the street is. Picture the towers over 40, over 30 stories, and picture the high, huge, high velocity commercial exhaust fans that are so close to the school and will be running 24 hours a day permanently. This is East 67th Street. Look at the standstill traffic on East 67th Street. It's the same on East 66th Street. Picture, picture now, uh, picture now the seven commercial trucks an hour and the four loading bays that will be on East 66th Street fighting traffic here that you see and the school buses. This is the daily Second Avenue standstill traffic every single day. And this is St. Catherine's Park the school playground. You can see how close the blood center is and you can see how heavily the park is used. This is the New York City public library that is contiguous to the blood center building. All this is why New York City's 2016 Zoning Life Sciences Memorandum permits life science buildings only in manufacturing and commercial zones. They should not be on any residential street anywhere in New York City. This attempt to rezone parts of these two side streets from residential to commercial is an end run around the intent of that memorandum. To call them commercial through this rezoning whose sole purpose is to permit this tower, most of which the blood center won't own or occupy, does not, inf does not make this commercial. Councilman Moyer, thank you for your time. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Here, the last speaker on this panel is Sandra Lerner. Starting time. Hello, my name is Sandra Lerner. Can you hear me? We can hear you whenever you're ready. I am in opposition to the Blood Center Tower for the following reasons. The rezoning of a mid-block structure from the current 75-foot building height to the 334 foot height, or even less so that they had said today. Sunlight would be blocked from the Julia Richmond Educational Complex, JREC, which has six schools and 2000 students who range from babies to 12th grade. They come from all over the city and one of the schools has students with special needs. There is an additional 1000 students in three other schools within one block of the tower. On the same block as the blood center is a very busy public library. Increased traffic congestion and pedestrian density stemming from the tower's 2,500 employees plus numerous daily visitors. The deafening noise from a five-year construction plan will make it impossible for teachers to teach and students to learn. If windows need to be closed, the classrooms will be stifling with no fresh air circulation. The tower would permanently block sunlight and create three to four hours of afternoon showers, shadows over St. Catharines Park. The park is used year round and crowded with families, groups of children, school students, babies, toddlers, seniors, and hundreds of others, including workers employed nearby that eat lunch there to take work breaks. The park is across First Avenue from Sloan Kenning Memorial Hospital. Many visitors go to the park to try and clear their minds and get some peaceful time. The construction will affect the very busy traffic on the street, including school buses and the westbound Crosstown M68. The noise from the towers, air polluting ventilation systems, and the enormous vents and fans running 24-7. The tower will house experimental research labs requiring huge exhaust fans and fans to expel chemically laden air. One of the labs will be experimentally with dangerous pathogens. These, these environmental hazards cannot be in a residential neighborhood and next to a school, park, and library. If Longfellow Real Estate Company and the Blood Center get away with erasing the New York City 35-year-old mid-block zoning law, then every residential neighborhood and overburdened narrow street in the city is threatened. I strongly implore that you oppose this project. It is so wrong in so many levels. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony today. Chair, I don't see any council members with um, questions at this time, so I'll call on the next panel, which will be Billy Freeland, Joseph Puglisi, Nancy Foreman, and Monica McCain. 
So the first speaker is Billy Freeland to be followed by jo Joseph Puglisi. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you, Chair Moya and members of the committee. And thank you, Councilmember Kalis for your leadership on this. My name is Billy Freeland. And while I'm a member of Community Board 8 on the Upper East Side, today I'm speaking in my individual capacity. Uh, I will, however, begin by noting that Community Board 8 sought public testimony on this issue and the overwhelming sentiment was against this proposal. Approximately 411 people testified in writing opposed to the proposal and only 26 testified in favor. And during our deliberations, some of the most thoughtful criticism of the application came from my colleagues who are typically in favor of new development. Many others have or will speak to the issues of this proposal, including the impacts on Julia Richmond and St. Catharines. I'd like to testify to a more general observation that this process has uh, played out in a way that is a textbook example of what not to do if you're an applicant. There has been little effort to reach a compromise. Moreover, the 11th hour proposal to merely reduce the proposed height by 50 feet underscores how unserious the applicant has been. And as others have testified today, this reduction actually raises more questions than it answers, particularly regarding the applicant's prior representations about the mechanical space it needs. I also believe we learned something new today under questioning by council member powers. The applicant could not describe how much EDC funding they sought or are receiving. This raises questions about the purported need to finance their development by leasing to commercial labs, also known as zoning for dollars. All of this, Chair Moya and members of the city council, is prelude to the most crucial point, that the applicant has presented a false choice. We can have science, jobs, and modernization while still balancing the community's concerns. The planner, George Change, whom you heard from today, has helpfully outlined alternatives available. One alternative would keep the R8B scale by waiving coverage and yard requirements, as well as the R8B FAR requirements, but would maintain the height and setback requirements of R8B. In other words, it would keep the scale of the mid block while allowing a larger, more modern building. This compromise would provide the large floor plates sought by the applicant with the above grade portion of the building that is 44% larger oh, than the as of right providing an additional 100,000 feet. And if I may just conclude really briefly, no one, Chair Moya and members of the council is against science jobs and modernization. What we want is a compromise of good faith negotiation. I believe such a compromise is within reach and will be attained if the council opposes the application in its current form. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. The next speaker will be Joseph Puglisi. Starting time. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Joseph Puglisi. I'm a resident in the east side here near this project that they're proposing. I'm also a donor at the Blood Center. I've been in this neighborhood since 1979. And I want to implore the council and everybody to not allow this project to go as they would like. I'm in the real estate industry. And in 1985, when R8B was proposed and passed, it was perfect. And it was there for a reason. And anybody today looking to change this has to take a back step and say to themselves, well, wait a minute. Well, it's all for progress. It's all for this. It's all for that. We've lived through the Second Avenue subway construction and the years that took. And I've been at community board meetings and I'm on the block association where I'm on 72nd Street now since 1988. I lived on 71st Street from 1979. And I have to tell you, I use that park. I like that park. I'm not as young as I was when I was first in the neighborhood. And I appreciate coming and sitting, but the traffic is tremendous. Just the corridor that we had, the construction corridor that affected all the side streets for the Second Avenue project. This project's going to be mid-block and there's a school and there's a library and there's a lot of share, a lot of people that live in the neighborhood. This, this is totally absurd, the height of this project when you can say that the real estate company is gonna profit by this. Will the neighborhood profit? Well, yes, but it's gonna be a determinant to everyone that lives here as our quality of life keeps deteriorating in Manhattan. And I implore everybody to please reconsider allowing this to go forward because you have the 75 foot height limit and the blood center can accommodate more space with the proper way that they should do things and not try to do this in an undisclosed fashion until we find out at the meeting, oh, then now they're gonna lower it by so many feet with a 600 foot thing. Please just, please keep us in mind, the residents that live here. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you letting me testify. Thank you all. Thanks Thank for your you service. Sir. 
Thank, thank you for your uh, testimony today. We appreciate it. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Monica McCain Sanchez, who will be followed by Nancy Foreman. Starting time. Chair Moya, council members and staff, thank you for letting me speak. And thank you, Councilman Ben Kalos, for your unwavering fight. Um, there may be some construction noise that, that are coming from the two floors above me that I can't control. And I apologize in advance. I'm Monica McCain Sanchez, a, board of the, a member of the board of directors of the 250 East 65th Street Condominium, an 88 unit residential building located on 2nd Avenue, a block southwest from the Blood Center. And I have been a frequent donor to the Blood Center. I wanna make four points about this in opposition to the zoning change. Number one, we have many working families with young children living in our building who use St. Catharines Park. The Julie Richmond Education Complex is a highly regarded school providing education for children from around the city. Both facilities will be adversely impacted by that gigantic tower being proposed. It is well known that sunlight is crucial for the prevention of depression, especially in children who attend the school and play in the very popular and very crowded park. The tower will make those in JREC and in the park feel entombed in shadow. Two, if the zoning is changed, the rest of the Upper East Side mid-block buildings, which are the only true affordable housing units in this area, will be targeted by developers for redevelopment, citing the zoning change made for the Longfellow condo. Number three, New York Blood Center claims it needs to be near four important hospitals as well as Rockefeller University. In fact, I've heard today they work a lot with Rockefeller. Well, there is an open parking lot and a tennis court on the grounds of Rockefeller University right next to New York Presbyterian, which could be configured to key uses. So why not build a tower there, which is still in our area? There are towers there now. And the Blood Center couldn't get much closer to the hospitals than that. Can't they make a deal with them? Number four, this attack on public parks is a continuation of developers looking to erect buildings with a view, starting with Central Park South, and then they nearly got their way with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Time expired. They, they get away with this scheme, then schools and parks in your districts will be next. Please do not permit this change. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be, the next and last speaker on this panel will be Nancy Foreman. Nancy Foreman, if you can hear me, uh, please accept the unmute request. And I just did. Hi everybody, I am Nancy Foreman and I live 75 feet away from the blood center. This isn't about whether we support the blood center. This is about a zoning law. It's not about supplying jobs. If that even happens and space gets rented, it's a zoning law. It's not a racial issue, it's a zoning law. This isn't about traffic, shadows, lights, school, none of that. Put up a building where you don't have to change the zoning law. The blood center was offered other spaces, but they turned it down. And to the union members who tried to turn this into a racial incident, you'll still have work in another neighborhood, not just in my neighborhood. How about we table this? until we get a new mayor, because from what I'm hearing, the Blasio is the only one that wants this. Lastly, let's say you own a house and you wanna build a hundred foot fence in your backyard, but your town only allows a 50 foot fence. Guess what? You're only building a 50 foot fence. That is the law, this is no different. So we urge you to not even look at this project and let them move it wherever else. Thank you for my time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Council, uh, th was that the last uh, speaker on the panel? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to turn it over for questions to um, Council Member Kalos. Who has his hand up? Uh, I want to thank all the uh, panelists and I want to thank all the blood donors. I don't think I've had a chance to thank all the people who donate blood regularly at the blood center for saving lives. Uh, wanted to ask a question of uh, Billy Freeland. Uh, you're a member of community board eight. Are you aware of any negotiation between the blood center and community board eight? Uh, similarly, you mentioned that it was unanimous. Are there any people on community board eight who have a reputation of being pro-development who actually voted against this? And last but not least, 
we did try to get into the finances of the blood centers project and what the minimum amount of money that they would need. Why does it matter whether or not the IDA or EDC have zero million or $200 million to help subsidize this project? Thank you, council members. So to begin, there, there has been no negotiation and even this suggested reduction of 50 feet has happened so late that we were not made aware of it. Um, I think that's a bad template for how you should negotiate with the community by not keeping us informed at all. Um, to your um, other questions, um, you know, the EDC funding issue, you know, it matters because here we have them saying they want to lease their space out to commercial development. Uh, it's zoning for dollars. They claim they have no alternative for financing, uh, but we know that they've, you know, bought up blood banks around the country and we know that they have uh, funding available to them to actually uh, proceed with uh, an expansion, which, you know, we support in the community. And your second question, I'm sorry, Council Member, what, what was that? Uh, you, you mentioned that there are people on the community board who tend yeah. to typically vote in favor of every development project I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, there, there absolutely are. And each one of them voted against this plan. And it was you know, sobering to hear their comments in particular, because you know they're coming from a place of good faith. They want to see the blood center succeed. They want to see our economy succeed in the city. They are not at all, quote unquote, NIMBYs. But even they look skeptically at this project and know that it's not the right oh, way to fine. go. And I, I put a lot of value in that. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your questions and your testimony today. Uh, seeing no other council members that have any questions, uh, this panel is uh, uh, now excused. Uh, council, if you can please call up the next panel. Yes, uh, Chair, I'd like to make a, a very quick procedural announcement uh, for members of the public who have signed up to, uh, who have successfully logged into this webinar, but do not intend to testify, uh, we ask that you instead view the live stream broadcast of this meeting that will help us uh, behind the scenes with our technical coordination. Um, with that, the next panel will include Robert Feiner, Jacqueline Ottman, Daniel Goldhagen, Faith Frazier, and Rick Cohen. The first speaker will be Robert Feiner, followed by Jacqueline Ottman. Starting time. Do, do we have the next speaker? Yeah, we'll take Daniel Goldhagen. Daniel Goldhagen on this panel, who will be followed by Rick Cohen. And then we will try to get Robert Feiner. Daniel Goldhagen. Um, yes, good afternoon. Um, I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, uh, wanted to thank Chairman Moya and council members. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony regarding this proposal. My name is Daniel Goldhagen. I reside a block away from the Blood Center at, on East 68th Street. My apartment uh, looks out at St. Catharines Park in JREC, which is in the window behind me. I have followed all of the Community Board 8's meetings on this proposal since November 20, 2020. I'm firmly opposed to this request by New York Blood Center and its Boston-based for-profit real estate developer, Longfellow. You have been hearing the catastrophic impact that this proposed 334 foot commercial office tower will have on the community and the public institutions surrounding us, which includes a public school, public park, and a public library where I volunteer as a tax preparer for seniors and low to middle income local taxpayers. My main concerns are the traffic, the impact on JREC, the BSL-3 labs, and the noise and light pollution that will significantly impact St. Catharines Park and residents in the nearby area caused by the light created by a laboratory facility that will operate 24 seven. After two years of COVID, how will JREC provide quality education across the street from a four to five year construction site? How will EMT providers have access to emergencies in the area, including possibly an emergency at one of BSL-3, uh, Blood Center's BSL-3 labs. This proposal is a blatant for-profit transaction being marketed under a nonprofit umbrella. 
the for-profit developer Longfellow will occupy 65% of the proposed building. Although I am supportive of the blood center's mission and am fully supportive of its work, this proposal is at odds with its value statements, a statement as provided in its website, which states um, it embraces the, and, uh, the values and fosters expired. corporate and civic culture. Uh, so um, please don't turn your back on this community and our AB's purpose to preserve quality of life as the next real estate land grab may be one in other communities, including your own. I urge the committee and council to reject this uncivic minded proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next, next speaker. Next speaker will be Rick Cohen, who will be followed by Jacqueline Ottman. Starting time. Yeah. Members, I'm Rick Cohen, and though I worked for my own councilman 50 years ago, I've never testified until today. I live a block from the Blood Center. I played in St. Catherine's Park as a nine-year-old and wheeled my fading 93-year-old father to it to feel sunlight on his face in his final months. This is the wrong project on the wrong street. I urge you to vote against it. Approval would set a dangerous precedent for mammoth projects to stomp on the needs of your own constituents in your own neighborhoods. My family has lived here since long before the park, school, and blood center were built. But make no mistake, your vote is not just on Lenox Hill. It's a vote for Cobble Hill and Castle Hill, Richmond Hill and Toad Hill, a vote for their quality of life. Our city needs to grow, but in appropriate places. Every project isn't right everywhere. The center says New York lags Boston and San Francisco in life sciences research. Must we match every major city in every single field? Must we impose a tower where it will block light to students and cast shadows on a park? The park is a refuge where the elderly and hospital visitors and workers find solace and support, precious minutes of peace. So many users are seniors who can't reach Central Park or another. This oasis of air and light is their escape valve, just as your residents need your park's gifts. If the city absolutely needs this project, put it where it won't stop on the health and social needs of children, seniors, and those with limited mobility. Learn from Boston and San Francisco. They demolished highways that cut off the waterfront and replaced them with grassy boulevards and parks. Of course, construction jobs are vital, but so are the safety and sanity of park and school users. Residents and children will be here long after those building jobs. No neighborhood opposes jobs. We put up with subway construction for years. It drove businesses out of business, but that made long-term sense helping commuters to and from work. Anything goes is not city planning philosophy. Building anything anywhere does not make for good neighbors. The needs of residents in this community exceed those of a private organization. Please respect our air and light rights and needs so they may be protected for your constituents too. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Jacqueline you know. Ottman will be the next speaker. Jacqueline Ottman, who will be followed by Robert Feiner. Starting time. Jacqueline, you got to unmute yourself. Oh, here you go. Can you? Thank you, Cal Chairman. My name is Jackie Ottman. I've lived on East 69th Street for over 40 years. I'm a member of our co-op's board of directors. I'm also past president of the East 69th Street Association. Today, I, I, however, I represent myself and many similarly concerned friends and neighbors opposed to the project. Over the decades that I've lived in the neighborhood, I've seen a steady decline in our quality of life, whether it be from development like what we're talking about here and its attendant traffic and noise, or from a steady stream of chain restaurants coming onto First Avenue with their attendant litter and lack of participation in the neighborhood. St. Catherine's Park is now overrun with litter from takeout food during the day. I have stopped even trying to find a place to sit. And with the zoning the way it is, it's chancy to walk even on a sunny day and not find myself in deep shade on a side street or avenue depending upon the time. If this project is approved, I fear for the additional litter, traffic, and noise 
that will surely be created by the projected influx, and especially for the kids in the school and the park who won't even have a chance to enjoy daylight, sunshine, and a quiet environment in which to learn and play. I urge you all to reject this proposal and give careful consideration to the sensible compromises and alternatives being offered by Councilman Kalos, Borough President Gail Brewer, and others. Thank you very much for your time. Next speaker will be Robert Feiner. Robert Feiner who will be followed by Faith Frazier. Starting time. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Robert Feiner. I am a resident of East 74th Street uh, between 1st and 2nd Avenues. Um, I am opposed to this uh, construction. Um, I may be beating the same drum as a lot of other people, but I want my voice to be heard. You are our elected representatives. Again, the emphasis on representatives. Every elected representative for this district is opposed to this project. Nobody is against the uh, blood center. If they do great work, we applaud them. But there needs to be sensible use of the space. As other people said, the zoning is such that we're trying not to have uh, high rises mid block. That was uh, put in place over 30 years ago and it was a wise decision. And just think about the slippery slope that uh, will, will come to fruition in your neighborhoods around the city if you let this go. And what's the point of having zoning uh, laws if anything goes, if everybody can get a variance for whatever they want? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next and last speaker on this panel will be Faith Frazier. Starting time. Hello, my name is Faith Frazier. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm a resident of East 72nd Street. Firstly, I wanna reiterate that I'm very grateful and supportive of the important and life-saving work of the New York Blood Center. However, I am strongly opposed to this zoning text amendment, and I hope the city council will oppose it as well. The New York Center, Blood Center's proposal was a real estate endeavor, not a science-based proposal. It asked that the city upend its vital mid-block zoning for the construction of a commercial tower, a monstrously tall and hefty building, which would negatively affect its open spaces, neighbors, and school children. Aside from the dangerous precedent of changing the zoning in this area, which could down the line basically throw that away for the entire city, the safeguarding of our children's health and educational development should be paramount as we recover from the devastating COVID-19 pandemic time. Not stunting it by blocking life-giving natural light from the JREC Education Complex and St. Catherine Park plus adding years of construction noise and traffic. Interestingly away, we are way down this month long Euler process, but today is the first time I've heard that the New York Blood Center has said they are even open to considering any alternatives. I find this incredibly disingenuous. Mid block zoning is in place and has been in place for many years to safeguard and balance the light, air and space for the best quality of life for all residents. As we emerge from the pandemic, we would hope and pray that council members consider the future and health of its citizens rather than changing this important zoning for the sake of one commercial entity. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, that was the last panel speaker. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Kalos for questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Rick, I, I was moved by your testimony. Tell me about your father, about your time within the park and why it's something that means so much to you. And why does this park matter to tens of thousands of people 
whose families, their children might be getting treated at Memorial Sloan Can Ke uh, Kettering's Cancer Center Hospital for Special Surgery, New York Presbyterian. And Faith, um, a lot of folks online and elsewhere are saying this is all about NIMBY. Uh, would you support building a homeless shelter in the neighborhood on East 91st Street per se, two or three blocks from where I live? And what would be the difference between supporting building homeless shelters and supportive housing throughout the neighborhood uh, versus building a commercial tower across the street from a park? Are you asking the guy about his father in the park or me about <laughs> now? I have both. So you each get about <laughs> 30 seconds. Faith, why don't you go first? I think that mid-block zoning is in place for a really important reason. Oh. And we already are coming out of the pandemic. We're tr trying to help homeless and low-income people and building a commercial tower that is sort of suspect in why it's being built sort of goes against helping those people. And would you build, would you support, have you supported and will you support building homeless housing for the homeless and homeless shelters in the neighborhood? I have supported the safe haven on East 90th Street. I hope that that gets built. Me too. I think that's our first step. Thank you, Rick. Uh, council member, my grand, father, uh, Abraham Cohen, actually lived at the corner of First Avenue and 69th Street and became the principal of the school on the northwest corner of uh, 70th Street many years after that. Um, so my, my family has been rooted here actually since the end of the 19th century. My father um, oh, had a sorry. remarkable... Your answer. Okay, so um, basically my father had a, a remarkable renaissance as a widower and uh, I became his caregiver before caregiving was written about in books. And in his final uh, months to go over to St. Catherine's and be on the south side across from the library and just kind of uh, let him not only bask in the sunlight but to pet dogs and greet people who came up to him just meant the absolute world to him. It was an escape from being in the apartment. Thank you, uh, Rick. Thank you everyone for uh, your testimony today. Uh, seeing that there are no other council members uh, with questions, uh, I now uh, will excuse this panel and uh, 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 council, if you can please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Shannon Burkowski, Lydia Canizares, Peter O'Reilly, and Melissa Mitchell. The first speaker will be Shannon Burkowski, followed by Lydia Canizares. Start in town. Hi, uh, I'm Shannon. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm coming to you from my classroom. I'm a teacher by day. Um, I'm a parent by day and night and through the middle of the night. Um, I'm the co-president of the PTA at PS183, which is down as a block away from the blood center. And I'm also a resident of 67th Street. So this hits very close to home for me too. Um, our objection is not again to the blood center. Um, our objection is to the tower, a tower of who knows who, who knows what, who knows when, we have no information about who's going to be or what's happening inside the tower, um, violating these zoning reg regulations that are put in to ensure and keep the character of our residential neighborhood. This is not the place. Um, in my classroom all day, I thank goodness I have some bright light in here, but I'm in, inside all day. And when I finally leave the class, when kids finally leave their classroom and then they've been in school all day, they need to be outside in the sun and in the park. Um, you really don't know what you have until it's gone. And the pandemic really showed us uh, what, how desperately we need air and sunlight, um, especially as winter's coming and it gets cold, you need a little bit of sunlight to be able to be outside and, uh, and feel the warmth. Um, we know the effect that sunlight has on our emotions and to deprive kids in JREC of to be cast in shadow all day inside and then to go out to their playground, to the park, to be in shadow again is just unacceptable. Um, the entire community, the community board, our elected officials are all coming out against this. And I just don't know what message you want to send to your voters. Um, if you 
aren't listening to the people that are voting you into office. Um, I also explained to my third graders today because I had this Zoom up all day as I was waiting for my name to be called, what I was doing. Um, and my third graders, their first, after I explained what was going on, they, um, these are eight-year-old kids. They said, well, why can't they just build it somewhere else? So if eight-year-olds can figure it out, then I just don't understand why adults can't. Um, it, it, I really Time implore council to, to vote against this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next uh, speaker. Lydia Canizares, who will be followed by Melissa Mitchell. Starting time. Hello, I'm Lydia Canizares, and uh, I am an active local resident and a member of the Coalition to Stop the Blood Center Tower. As you know, the current R8B zoning successfully preserves the scale of side streets by restricting buildings to 75 feet. It is this protective zoning that the proposal is aiming to override. The partnership of Longfellow with the New York Blood Center is seeking a change in the zoning to build a mid-block 334-foot tower, a commercial tower that is over four times the height limit. It's true that the Blood Center needs new space, but they've admitted here today that they could build a 75-foot tall facility that would more than satisfy their needs. It's clear our protective zoning does not need to change for them to modernize and expand. So the issue is not the blood center, as they only would occupy a fraction of the proposed structure. So why are we here? The egregious portion of this proposal is the reason. It is the 260-foot commercial four-lease tower on top of the conforming blood center facility, which is totally unnecessary except to give the blood center a facility for free. It's clear that the basis for this application is greed, pure and simple. It's truly spot zoning and is nothing more than zoning for dollars. If approved, it would demonstrate the city council's complete disregard for the community and every local elected official who have come together to vehemently oppose this proposal it would require that the public bear the detrimental impact of this massive building in order to solely benefit a private developer. If this residential mid-block can be rezoned so dramatically, so can other residential blocks in every council districts you represent. Please do not open this Pandora's box. I urge you to protect our neighborhoods and reject this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Melissa Mitchell. If he's available, Peter O'Reilly will be next. Uh, and now we'll hear from Melissa Mitchell. Hi. 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 Can, can everyone see me? Yeah, great. So I am Melissa. I live on East 65th Street and I vehemently oppose this project. I think it is despicable that Longfellow is using social justice race as a ploy to get his mission across. I'm fully aware of the MWBE contracts and how they're often not honored in terms of these construction projects. And I don't see how this time it would be any different. I don't think it's a very honest assessment that Longfellow, here he is trying to get all kinds of people to speak out for the project, um, different marginalized groups. And, but let me tell you, when you think about diversity and inclusion, you think about people living in the neighborhood, not commuting one hour to work here. Look around. If you're familiar with the Upper East Side, most people that work here are minorities. And if you look at Midtown, Financial District Midtown, it's a lot more Caucasian people. So you want to diversify. If you want to get a more diverse work environment, how about we build the project in Midtown where there are other skyscrapers, where there are other tall buildings. We do not need a 30 story tower to get this mission across. I am all for life sciences. I am all for the blood center, but I am not out. I am not down for hurting children, for hurting hospital patients, for hurting cancer patients. We have asbestos in the air and we're gonna have sick people in the playground or in the park and it's not fair to them. It's not fair to the children it's actually been proven that even reduced sunlight could result in poor eyesight for children. 
Go look up all the, the horrible things that could happen from lack of sunlight. I'm just really disgusted and disappointed because this is not an altruistic mission. It is greed. And when you really think about it, this is ultimately benefiting the developer. And if we start, um, if we adjust the rezoning laws just for this project, we are just opening Pandora's box. Soon, the one of the only last neighborhoods that's, this is one of the last Gone neighborly fire. neighborhoods left in the city. So um, just one more thing I'm gonna say, principle over profit. Remember that, because once we start compromising our integrity, then thank we're going you, downhill. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Jared, it appears that we lost Peter O'Reilly. So that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Councilmember Kalos for questions. Uh, thank you, Melissa. I'm blown away. Don't even know what to ask you. If you have anything else you wish to add, go for it. Uh, for Lydia, I've seen you at St. Catherine's Park talking to people. How many people have you spoken to that are against the project? And how many people have you spoken to that are in favor? And, and Shannon, full disclosure, our, our families know each other. And um, what's it like? What, what would it be like with your two girls trying to go to a playground if uh, there isn't a playground with sun after three o'clock? How would that impact you? And have you ever been at the playground when there were a thousand families there on a Saturday because there was nothing else to do in the city and that was the place to be? Who wants to go first? Should I go first? Go for it. So one thing I really wanted to add, and this is more of a heartwarming note, um, I remember being on 67th Street about, I think it was 2018, I think, and it was the graduation at Julia Richmond in the you know, end of June. And I remember seeing all the happy families outside with balloons and the kids all happy and smiling. It was a sunny, beautiful day. And um, I'm not a mother yet, but I teared up because I just thought it was such a beautiful sight. And it'd be such a shame that that would be destroyed by adding this invasive tower to our community. So it really means a lot. And, you know, I'm from Queens, New York. I'm not from the Upper East Side. So I moved from Queens to be in a better quality, a better environment. And I'm just really sad that now I'm here and now my neighborhood might be destroyed. And I, you know, moved and I worked hard to be here and now it's gonna be ruined unless we do something. So, yeah, I'm sorry. It's just, I just, what I think about it is hard. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, questions. Uh, seeing that we have no uh, other council members uh, with questions here, uh, the uh, panel is now excused. And council, if you can please call up the next panel. Thank you. Chair, the next panel will include Elaine Walsh, Julianne Bertania, Keith Goodhus, and Thomas Sos. Uh, the first speaker will be Elaine Walsh. I'll just remind those of you all waiting, uh, thank you for your patience, we will get to you. Um, there is uh, no reason to use the raise hand button at this time, we will just ask you to continue being patient and we will get to you. Elaine Walsh, followed by Julianne Bertania. Uh, yes, yes uh, this is Elaine Walsh. I'm testifying on behalf of the East 86th Street Merchant and Tenants Association in my capacity as president. I'm also on Community Board 8 and former co-chair of zoning. So I have lived through in both capacities uh, what has been going on with the Blood Center. Most of my points have been taken. So what I'm going to say is that the applicant showed no willingness to discuss any alternatives or concessions and refused to come to meetings. He was, they were very uncooperative. The total lack of participation by the applicant is unheard of. I never saw that before from anybody else that has applied. And let me say at that point, they told us uh, when I spoke to them, no alternatives, 
we know what we want. Their attitude was, it's a done deal. We don't have to deal with the community board. As far as zoning, this is spot zoning, clear. R8B was established in 1985. If there's a change to this zoning, it will also impact in Brooklyn and in Queens, the R four Bs, five Bs, six Bs, seven Bs, and eight Bs. This includes Rego Park, Middle Village, Windsor Terrace, Bed-Stuy, Ridgewood, Elmhurst, Rego Park, I can go on. Please look at your communities and understand that any change to us in R8B will have an impact on the other preserved residential communities in the other boroughs. It is a despicable ask. One other point I'd like to make. Time expired. Have you, let me just ask, because nobody has. The Parks Department, okay. Have you heard from the Parks Department in a sign off on ULIP? They're the only ones that can sign off on the parks. When I spoke to them, they said there has been there is no mitigation that can happen for that park. So I, I'd ask you please to follow up and see uh, what has happened there. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next Ju speaker. Julianne Bartania will be the next speaker. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Moya, for allowing the public to speak. My name is Julianne Bertania, and I am president of Treadwell Farm Historic District. I am speaking on behalf of the community to oppose the Blood Center Longfellow plan to build a massive commercial tower in a mid-block R8B zone. The request to rezone the mid-block on East 67th Street presents a significant safety concern, violates the contextual zoning, and would set an unwanted precedent in our neighborhood and our city. The proposal is egregious and the arguments for the addition are morally disingenuous. We should not accept the false accusations of Longfellow who is positioning this mega project as a life science world hub for the Blunt Center, when more accurately, it is a massive commercial tower representing a private for-profit development being built on top of the Blood Center's own updated space. We recognize a clear need for some expansion and notable upgrades to the current blood center buildings, structure, and laboratories, which are outdated. We all want to see the blood center thrive and continue to create important progress and world-renowned advancements in sciences. The egregious height and mass of the proposed structure will not proportionally impact the blood center's important work. Specifically, of the 16 stories, the blood center will only occupy five stories of the proposed building which is only one story more than they occupy at present. The remainder of the building will be leased out to commercial tenants and not to the blood center. So please do not be fooled by any misrepresentation that this mega tower will be able to expand the blood center's good work. We support the critical mission of the blood center and we hope that more jobs and important scientific research can be housed on 67th street location, but the safety of the residents and students should not be ignored. We cannot change the makeup of this very busy street with the New York Public Library, the Julia Richmond Six School Complex with more than 2000 students that we've heard from today um, and St. Catherine's Park, bustling with children, students, elderly residents and area hospital workers enjoying fresh air and sun on any given day. There are also other preschools and schools walking distance that use St. Catherine's Park on a regular basis. In addition, this is a crosstown bus route so clearly an active block that should not be considered a prime location um, for I'm the proposed 330 foot tower. We, the we, Treadwell we Farm Historic fired. District community firmly opposes this project and feels strongly that our B zoning Thank should so not much. be changed. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. We respectfully. Okay. Then the next speaker on the panel will be Thomas Sos and uh, if you can hear me and he's still available, then Keith Goodhuss. And we'll now hear from Thomas Sos. Starting to talk. Uh, distinguished members of the uh, City Council. Um, my name is Dr. Thomas Sos. I am professor of radiology at Wild Corner New York Presbyterian, where I started in 1969 and have worked for over 50 years. 
I have authored over 200 scientific papers, book chapters, and research projects. I strongly believe in science and collaboration. I've also lived in this Upper East Side community for most of my life. I am strongly opposed to the current New York Blood Center application to alter the zoning rules to allow construction of a massive 340 foot tall so-called New York Blood Center Tower, more accurately, the Longfellow Commercial Real Estate Tower. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this is mostly a giant fraud supported by obfuscation and an aggressive PR campaign in which now you, the members of the city council are being asked to unwittingly participate by approving it. What are the facts and the truth? To fulfill its mission, the blood center needs a building only one quarter as tall, only 75 feet in height, and within current zoning with a larger foot plate. This solution has support of the neighborhood, JRAC, the medical community, including me, and all the local representatives. The blood center application falsely pretends that the entire 340 foot tower is for the blood center, but it would only own the lower one quarter. Longfellow would own the upper three quarters as a commercial real estate venture, free to rent to anyone without any obligation for any scientific process or prog um, project. So why are you being asked to approve the zoning changes? The blood center has ample, ample funds to pay for this, but decided to front for Longfellow in exchange for Longfellow play, paying for the blood center for a new free facility on the bottom. It's placed in its selfish interest, all residents and community at risk, adjacent JRAC students with disabilities. This would be against anything and everything you, that Thomas. the community thank needs. You. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Today. Thank you so much. Uh, can we call the next uh, speaker, please? Chair, it appears we lost Keith Goodhus, and that makes Dr. Soss the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Um, seeing uh, no council members with questions for this panel, uh, this panel is now excused. If you can please call up the next panel. Next panel will include John McClement, Bonnie Weber, Mark Foley and Rick Belushi. First speaker will be John McClement, followed by Bonnie Weber. Starting time. Hi. Hi, my name's John McClement and I've lived in Yorkville since 1985. Uh, I believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, if the proposed blood center project goes forward, it'll be a tragedy for the neighborhood and the city. The damage to the neighborhood has been discussed at length and includes shadows cast on St. Catherine's Park, Julia Richmond and adjacent residential buildings. Despite arguments to the contrary, this is a, di a diverse middle-class neighborhood not equipped to handle the burdens that a fully occupied commercial building will bring. An equally disturbing issue is the precedent this project will set in terms of mid-block building height limits. If this project is allowed to go forward, other real estate developers will argue that their development should be allowed <coughs> to dramatically see mid, exceed mid-block height limits. I am aware of a proposal of a proposed 70-story residential tower project in the East 80s. The effects of this kind of construction will be catastrophic and long-lasting. Finally, it is not as if there are no other suitable locations elsewhere in Manhattan when the important work of the blood, where the important work of the blood center can be uh, performed. This is not an all or nothing issue for the blood center or for the construction unions. Thank you very much. Bonnie Weber will be the next speaker followed by Mark Foley. Start in time. Hi, my name is Bonnie Lane Weber. I'm representing the Sierra Club, one of our nation's largest and oldest environmental organizations. We boast over 15,000 voting members in New York City. 
We appreciate the work of the Blood Center, but with that sentiment in mind, the Sierra Club New York City Group asked the City Council to disapprove of the proposed development at 310 East 67th Street. We join in strong community opposition to this proposal, including with the belief of Community Board 8 that such a development negatively impacts mid-block zoning throughout the city. In addition to joining the community, we echo specific concerns relating to the environment, environmental justice, and equal access to open space and sunlight. Development is important, and the construction of new laboratories for biomedical research are necessary. But in a region of the city with limited open space, is this really the best location? As projects like these encroach on residents' access to nature, we must question their worth with respect to their costs. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you for Done. your testimony today. Thank you. Next speaker will be Rick Belushi, who will be followed by Mark Foley. Start in time. Rick Belushi, if you see an unmute request, we ask that you please accept that so that you may begin your testimony. Okay. I think we got well, here. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Whenever you're ready, Rick. Yes, thanks. One moment. Members of the zoning committee, I want to appeal to your sense of fair play. From all you've heard from our solid block of opposition, we hope you can appreciate the sacrifice you'd be asking of our residential community and the level of permanent damage this will bring, as has been described. I'm sure you're weighing what's reasonable and what's fair for you to expect us to accept. With this in mind, consider the following. This will be a building four times what's presently, four times what's presently permissible. And the blood center's mission isn't going to change proportionally to that height or some reasonable allowance of more height were they to propose it that we in the community would welcome. But this project seems to no longer be about the blood center and their mission only. We, we've learned they're not choosing their own partners. The developer Longfellow is. Doesn't that strike you as odd? There's so much uncertainty surrounding this project, probably the likes of which you've never seen. Don't you need more than so much uncertainty to make your very weighty decision? And doesn't this have to be an extraordinary endeavor that forces you to vote for it because it's so virtuous? There are two possible scenarios. If they don't put their supposed partners in there, if the property gets flipped or it's built as an office building, which is a real possibility in the cutthroat world of New York City real estate, then we've been duped and we lose because the consequences of this fraudulent tower are terrible and permanent and will ripple throughout the city. Or if they lease the tower to exactly whom it is supposedly designed for, then there will be 300 feet of experimentation with chemicals and dangerous toxins occurring every day next to a school with thousands of children, many with special needs, and hundreds of people living in their homes within a one block radius, as I do, 75 feet away at 333 East 66th Street. They said themselves, actually, in an attempt to comfort us, paraphrasing now, they'll ventilate the building at six Time times expired. the strength out out into the air of the surrounding community. This is just one more example of how they present this project as if we're not even here and they're building on a blank slate. Our community will suffer. I think Rick, you said I'm- I need you to wrap it up that the time has expired. Okay, more to say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, let's go to the next speaker. Mark Foley, if you can hear us, uh, we ask that you accept the unmute request or accept the promotion request in order to begin your testimony. Mark Foley. Let's move on to the next um, speaker. If we don't have Mark, we'll come we'll, back to him. We'll Try to come back to Mark Foley in an upcoming panel. Councilmember Kalos has hand up for a question.
if we can unmute uh, Council Member Kalos to ask his question. Ani Lane Weber, as I live and breathe, it is uh, you are a sight for sore eyes and to have Sierra Club, which fights for all that is good and well in this universe and this planet come, come on this issue. Sierra Club, we, we work together around uh, plastic bottles. We've worked around recycling. We've worked around everything we can do to save our planet. Why does, why does St. Catharines Park matter? Why do our playgrounds matter? And what, what brings uh, Sierra Club to, to the fight at this late hour? Uh, you're, you are muted. Um, it's really a question of open space and how nature really heals people. But we have another, an urban sustainability committee and we're really concerned about all these high rises going up all over the city and how they're stealing the land and the light and the air, the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And it's quite horrible. It's really just terrible. So that's how we're involved with this. I mean, we're certainly concerned about St. Catharines Park, but you don't need us on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> nice to no, see you too. <laughs> no further questions. I yield back. Uh, Chair, with your permission, I'll call the next panel. Sorry, I lost my audio there. Uh, I didn't hear what you said uh, there, Arthur. Just making sure uh, you're ready to uh, yep. move on to the next panel. The next panel will include uh, Marsha Lowe, Susan Barr, Neil Ostberg, and Gary Gerst. First speaker on this panel will be Marsha Lowe, followed by Susan Barr. Starting time. Let's go to the next speaker. Um, or do we have more? Marsha Lowe appears to be in the meeting with us and her audio appears to be on Marsha Lowe. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Marsha. Okay, good. Um, I live at 301 East 66th Street and I'm a bit exhausted, but the testimony has been unbelievably terrific. And I would like to thank Ben Callows for his incredible work that he's done. And the comments that Alita Camp made were also fantastic. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, to the eight of the uh, City Planning Commission uh, who approved the blood center zoning, shame on you. It is imperative that city council not only address the poisonous human impact inflicted on the Julia Richmond students and the shadows on the park, but also the impact on hundreds of residents, perhaps thousands, likely displacing many of us. All will have a significantly impaired quality of life for numerous years and forever. This human impact will result in, result in psychological damage as well as physical damage. Many will no longer have direct sunlight as they have now, nor will they have much indirect light. This will cause irreparable damage. Many work from home. How will they be able to do so with years of noise, just as it will be impossible for the teachers to teach? Rent-controlled and rent-stabilized ten tenants will likely have no place to move, since many live on fixed incomes and will be subjected to the few years they have left to live in dire conditions. Perhaps Longfellow would like to pay for the cost to relocate them to a similar location and a apartment for their current, current, current rent. Having said that, uprooting seniors, seniors and completely changing their lives may not, may not be for the better. Condo and co-op owners will be struck, stuck where they are because they can't sell or will incur, if they do, will incur significant loss. I sure hope 
from here on in, there will be no additional support for this project and the city council will vote to dis disapprove the scheme. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, let's call up the next speaker. Next speaker on this panel will be Susan Barr and then Neil Ostberg. Susan Barr, if you can hear us, please accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. I'm afraid we have seem to have lost Susan Barr, Neil Ostberg. Neil Ostberg, if you can hear me, please accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Uh, do we have James Hall? James Hall will be the next speaker on this panel. Uh, pardon me, Chair. It seems we seem to be having some technical issues. Let's try. James Hall, one more time, then we'll try Neil Osper. James Hall, if you can hear me, please accept the unmute request in order to begin speaking so that we can take your testimony. James Hall. If you're on a telephone, James Hall, and you can press star nine, perhaps if you intend to testify. Okay, uh, Chair, seems like uh, all three of those speakers have declined to come in to testify. So uh, that's the last speaker on this panel and with your permission, well. Yep, uh, let's uh, move on seeing that there is no uh, council members with questions. Uh, let's move on to the next panel. Okay, the next panel will include Gary Gerst, Arlene Selkis, Catherine O'Sullivan, Jada Lutit, and Peter O'Reilly. The first speaker on this panel will be Gary Gerst, followed by Arlene Selkis. Starting time. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Gary. Okay. Uh, my name is Gary. Gary, we have, we, have, we have an echo. Yep. An echo there. So do you have... Okay. Do you have your computer on no, and off? No, I, I had a... Let me just shut off my phone quickly. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, so my name is Gary Gerst, and I'm at 315 East 68. I am strongly opposed to this project, but rather than repeat all of the negatives associated with the project, let me just implore you to reject this proposal so the blood center can get about developing a reasonable proposal that does not ignore the 100% opposition feeling of the neighborhood. For anyone, who spends any time in this neighborhood during a typical business day, it will be obvious what a devastating thing this should be, would be uh, for this neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Arlene Sulkis, who will be followed by Catherine O'Sullivan. My name is Arlene Sulkis. I live at 333 East 66th Street. We continue to hear the important testimony in opposition to this tower. From the elimination of vital sunlight to the existence of unbearable congestion, both vehicular as well as foot traffic. If serious traffic studies had been done, you would see how ludicrous putting up such an egregious building would be. How many of you would like to live, work, and go to school next door to a Bio3 research lab? Accidents have and do happen. 
what further evidence does one need as one sees the devastation that has, has been caused by the coronavirus? Zoning laws were put in place to protect the integrity and safety of residential neighborhoods. This presentation has been disingenuous from the very start. They never come, they never have come to the table with the community in good faith to address our concerns. Our questions have fallen on deaf ears and still remain unanswered. This is nothing more than a land grab and zoning for dollars. It pains me to think of the highly respected union workers and those who would unjustly put a racial spin on this. To all those who fear the loss of union jobs and science-based careers, if the intention of the Blood Center and Longfellow is to hire union labor, which they absolutely should, the location shouldn't matter one iota. And that holds true for the apprenticeships as well. It is preposterous that researching diseases like sickle cell affecting people of color would cease to exist if it were not at this location. The proposed jobs and the hoped for economic growth will still be no matter where they build their science hub. The students of JREC are of diverse culture, ethnicity and color. They too are the future of our country and deserve the education without the constant jackhammering, dust, and constant of metal going on for years. I respect the important work of the Blood Center and the need to support the life sciences. I have heard over and over again that there is no other feasible location, and yet there Thanks, still Marlene. is a Thank failure so to Thank give real concrete reasons really why Thank not. You. My Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, we have to keep it uh, to two minutes, and we do give extra time for people to wrap up, but I want you to be mindful that uh, we have been going on for several hours, and there's a lot of people also waiting. Um, your testimony will be submitted. Uh, we thank you so much for your patience, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, can we go now to the next speaker? That next speaker will be Peter O'Reilly. Start in time. Got it. Yeah, um, I want to mention that, you know, in case it hasn't come across, the whole proposal has been misrepresentation and disinformation. And first and foremost, they keep talking about 16 stories and it's 32 story equivalent. So it just starts out with misinformation and includes the labs and all that stuff, which is going to be testing for infectious diseases uh, and use live animal testing while they're at it. Uh, this is all being done in such a dense population, it seems crazy to put it here. Uh, and also, if there is an accident, you know, what's the, the evacuation plan? Tens of thousands of people leave their homes, close the schools, blockade the hospitals. It, there's no plan. Um, and this is really the wrong place, the wrong time for a mammoth thing like this. And uh, it was, the project is an example of why they passed the law in the first place. And I just want a little side note to the council members that you vote on this or will be remembered, you know, pro or con, come times when you move on to getting into higher office. So be careful how you vote. Uh, and by the way, I'm a two gallon donor to the blood center. So I'm, I'm not one who is uh, unsupportive of the, the effort. That's all I have. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we'll go to the next speaker. Here, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Uh, seeing uh, no questions uh, from council members for this panel, the panel is now excused. And if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Rita Popper, Roberta Annis, Karen Minahan, and Deborah Newman. Rita Popper will be the first speaker who will be followed by Roberta Annas. Time starts now. My name is Rita Popper and I'm 82 years old and I belong to a lot of organizations and, but I'm not gonna bother you with that. I'm a member of Community Board 8. I'm opposed to the Blood Center Town or as presented by Longfellow. This is a developer sinking a spot zoning variance in order to build a tower in the middle of the block that is zoned for a height of 75 feet. 
City Council members are our protectors and we are looking to you to help save the zoning laws that are in jeopardy by this project. Not only by this blood center uh, district, but by your district where you live and where your constituents are. Longfellow, the developer of the new blood center has cha not changed one square foot of the actual blood center. There is a more desirable land a large parcel of land close to the uh, our hospital corridor. The parcel of land is already zoned for health and education facility and adjacent to Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital on East 73rd Street with a coveted view of the, of the river. This site would put the blood center and proposed laboratory smack in the middle of the world's largest hospital corridor. Nothing in Longfellow's proposal prohibits covering, converting the tower to condos. Why does Longfellow select this wonderful site? Because it's impossible to sell condos adjacent to a hospital. Unused laboratories, with now 12 feet high ceilings, a prime conversion. The time on, expired. On East 67th Street. Please Thank help you. us maintain our neighborhood. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, let's go to the next uh, speaker. The next speaker will be Karen Minahan, who will be followed by Catherine O'Sullivan. Time starts now. Karen Minahan, if you can hear us, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. While we, uh, okay, we're gonna see what's going on with Karen Minahan. We I'm were... sorry, I, I did a letter instead. I let them know this morning that I wasn't gonna be testifying. Okay, Karen, no, no worries. But I'm against, that's my official vote. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Thank next, you. next we will hear from Catherine O'Sullivan and then Jada Lutit. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, Council members, my name is Catherine O'Sullivan. I am from Inwood, lately rezoned. I'm totally opposed to this ridiculous um, giveaway to developers again for a commercial tower mid block. Our zoning is a bit of a joke at the moment. This administration will be remembered for its neglect of its residents and its pandering to uh, private developer interests. So, uh, I've nothing more to add. The residents have said it all very well. I'm absolutely opposed to this, and I hope you will do your duty by the citizens of this city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we'll call up the next speaker. Jada Lutit. Time and then we will, we will try to hear from- Hi there. Um, I, what I just don't understand is if every single local official and the, every single local community group has said that they oppose this, why is it even a question? I, I, my understanding is that the city council listens to the people that are local. Well, there's no question. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, uh, next on the list is Deborah Newman. We will try to hear from Deborah Newman. Deborah I'm Newman, stop. if you can hear me, please accept the unmute request. I actually, this is Deborah. I actually had uh, already kind of requested to pass because I felt like everybody had said everything I was going to say, but I am also opposed to this and uh, I don't really have much to add. So I'm going to 
pass. Okay, Deborah, thank you so much um, for your testimony. Next speaker. Uh, Chair Moya, I believe that was the last speaker on this panel. I seeing see. that Council Member Kalis has a hand raised. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Rita Popper. Uh, you are a, a strong voice on Community Board 8. You also live a mile and a half away. Why do you care about a park in the 60s? Along the same lines, uh, you recently helped secure funding for a park in the 90s. Uh, how much was necessary to repair that park versus how much is being offered for St. Catherine? What's the difference there? And why not put a tower across the street from the park on 90th Street? Do we still have Rita? Uh, apologies, it appears that we have lost uh, Rita. Okay, uh, sorry about that. We lost Rita. Um, now, if we can, um, there's no more questions for this panel. Um, this panel is now excused and we can call up the next panel. The next panel will include Barbara, Barbara Mutterpearl, Eugene Kim, Francine Banyan and Barbara Mason. First will be Barbara Mutterpool, Mar Hi. Mutter Pearl, pardon me, followed by Eugene Kim. Time starts now. Um, hi, I'm sorry. I wasn't testifying. I was trying not to testify. Okay. So I'm just listening. As long as you submitted your testimony, Barbara, thank you so much. Eugene Kim will be the next speaker. Eugene Kim. Time starts now. Thank you for the time. My name is Eugene Kim, along with my wife and daughter. We're residents of 315 East 68th Street. I've attended all of the meetings to this topic, uh, on this topic to date, and this is my first time speaking. Uh, I'm strongly opposed to the proposed tower. The Blood Center representatives talked about New York City being behind Boston Cambridge and the biotech and VC community. That's fine. And I think as a prior speaker, Rick Cohen said, no city can be number one in everything. Um, should we trade a quarter of Central Park to create a tech hub to contest with Silicon Valley? It, it, it doesn't make sense. And related to that, we haven't talked about the, competitive, uh, the competitiveness of the life sciences industry. Not too far away, the Philadelphia life sciences effort has grown rapidly over the past several years near my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. There's uh, uh, over a million square feet of lab space under construction in Philadelphia on top of 3 million square feet of lab and office facilities at University City Science Center and University City Square just north of the UPenn campus. Uh, it's, it's a highly competitive space. There are a number of uh, suitable sites that allow for the creation of and an expansion of um, some of the things that the uh, backers of this tower have talked about and to plop this in the middle of a residential area uh, where there really isn't any room to grow. It, it just doesn't make sense. On top of all of the issues that we've talked about, all of the physical pollution, the biohazard risk, and the congestion, all these things take away from the community. It's a gamble um, for this tower to be one across, uh, one among many across the country. And we are breaking precedent here. It sets a dangerous path for the communities going forward. Um, we are strong, my family, myself, we are strongly opposed to this tower. Thank you, Eugene, for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Francine Banyan. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Francine Banyan, and I am a representative of the East 69th Street Block Association. I live at 301 East 69th Street, and in the 10 years that I've been here, I've seen the community change. Unfortunately, this is the worst change coming. I try to bring my grandchildren here to this park. I try to use as many of the local services here that I can to help this community stay vibrant. But it's difficult when my words are ignored, not only by the developer, 
but the blood bank. I've willingly given blood at the blood bank. And the thought of having to go miles away to give blood is not a very positive thought. But I am willing to say that whatever we need to do to get compromise from the blood bank and compromise from this corporation that's looking to make a lot more money by valuable real estate, it's where we live. Why don't you have something like this where you live? And that's a big question. We're interested in the blood bank. We're interested in keeping our community alive and vibrant. And the 69th Street Block Association has demonstrated along with many other people to say, council, do not vote for this. You're taking away our voices. And elections are coming. Election day is coming. And it does impact if we don't let you know at this election, the next time you're running for an office, we will let you know that you disappointed us greatly. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, we'll have the next speaker. Barbara Mason will be the next witness, Barbara Mason. And after Barbara Mason, if available, will be Catherine Houghton. Time starts now. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Barbara. I had not planned to speak. But I feel so passionately about this. I've lived at 245 East 72nd Street for 47 years. I love my neighborhood. I love St. Catherine's Park. I am a registered nurse, a social worker, retired from the Department of Ed, and a big fan of Jay Rick, who's and Jay Rick has had so many battles. I just hope I have just brought up the names of all the people in the city council. I will hold them responsible. I think this is unconscionable. I know Second Avenue traffic. I live with it from my third floor window. It is all just very appalling. I plead with you to preserve our neighborhood and thank you for listening. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for your uh, testimony today. If available, the next and last speaker on this panel will be Catherine Houghton. Catherine Houghton, if you can I'm hear us, now. if you can hear us, please press the raise hand button. Chair, it appears that uh, we have lost that last speaker. So that was the last uh, speaker on this panel. And we have uh, Councilmember Kalos who has a question. Time starts now. Uh, not, not on this panel, but on the final panel, please. Okay. Uh, seeing that there's no questions uh, for this panel, this panel is now excused. And if we can, uh, call up the next panel, please. All right, Chair, that was the last coordinated panel that we have. So we will now make an announcement uh, to see if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the New York Blood Center proposal. If so, please press the raise hand button now. If you do not intend to testify or with, do not wish to testify, please do not raise your hand. Once again, any remaining members of the public who wish to testify on the New York Blood Center proposal, please press the raise hand button now. And you can do that on your phone by pressing star nine. Uh, and the meeting will briefly stand at ease now, Chair, while we check for any additional members of the public. All right, Chair, we do have some additional uh, members of the public who wish to testify. We will first hear from Neil Ostberg and uh, I'll, I'll just make one last 
reminder that uh, for those of you wishing to testify, only if you have not already done so, we ask that you do please uh, use the raise hand button. Again, only if you have already, if, if you have not already testified. And now we will hear from Neil Ostberg. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Neil Ostberg and I am a resident of 333 East 66th Street. I've lived there for over 10 years and I live there with my wife and my daughter who is nine years old. Um, <clears throat> and so obviously we've talked about the light, the park. Um, my daughter grew up here and we go to the park at 5 p.m. and it's still sunny there. So let's not take that away. Um, but um, I wanted to get to some of the comments of Mr. Hillier, which is who's the CEO of the New York Blood Center. Um, he did not acknowledge the community concerns re re regarding safety during his testimony today. Um, there are compressed gas deliveries made on the 66th Street side. And in the past, there was some kind of wastewater being ejected onto the sidewalk. Uh, on that side of the building, which I made a complaint to 311 and it was plugged. So we don't know where the waste really goes. And so I, the proposed uh, development would bring an exponential amount of, of, of risks to the neighborhood. My daughter walks pa past the, the center every single day. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to point out which is, I don't know how to turn my video on uh, with the phone for some reason, um, but um, the New York Blood Center is a nonprofit organization, therefore files a form 990 with the IRS. And uh, I think I'll email this in, but um, the CEO today, Mr. Hillier said that the company that the blood center runs at an operating loss. And according to the 2019, not form 990, that is not true. They had an operating profit in 2019 and 2018. And the total assets are $515 million. And uh, certainly this is not a financial Time hardship. They can, they can certainly obtain financing based on that kind of uh, asset. So I just wanted to just like, like just be straight. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you for your uh, testimony. Uh, do we have uh, another speaker? Sure, I'm, I believe so. We're gonna ask that the individual logged in as call in user underscore one, if you wish to testify, uh, we will take your testimony. Time starts now. You press star six on your phone to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, well, everything Olivia Camp said, every telling point she made, everything the parents, students, and staff at JREC said, everything Marshall Lowe said, in fact, everything everyone has said against it. I'll just reiterate that the construction workers can have the same good jobs constructing this building at an appropriate site in which the blood center can research the same diseases, hire uh, the same staff, mentor the same students. So it's not a question of this site or nothing as it's being portrayed. It's this site or an appropriate one. I'll also hit the insanity of putting labs uh, that work with dangerous airborne pathogens near homes and schools and the effect on students of jackhammers, pile drivers, cement mixers, and beeping trucks all day long, and the need to keep their windows closed against the flying debris when we know that ventilation is vital to safe schools. And the same effects on the residents. We, too, uh, need uh, protection from the noise, pollution, and the dangerous uh, pathogens that might be uh, escaping. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can you just please state your name for the record? Sure, Linda Stewart. Okay, thank you so much, Linda. Uh, do we Sorry, have Chair, we're gonna um, just do uh, one last announcement uh, once again. For anyone wishing to testify on the New York Blood Center proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, if you do not intend to testify or if you have already done so, please do not raise your hand. 
uh, and we will again briefly stand at ease while we check for any members of the public. Council member, do you have questions? I see your, your hand is up. Uh, while we're waiting, I was hoping to um, take this opportunity to make brief remarks as we close. With your permission, Cheryl, we do have at least one additional member of the public um, that I believe we are set to hear from. Lo Vanderbach uh, will be the next speaker. Time starts now. Yes, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me? We can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Lo Vanderbilt. I'm representing Carnegie Hill Neighbors, which is a not-for-profit uh, quality of life organization in the Upper East Side. We are concerned about the R8B precedent that, that would be set, that it could be violated, that it could impact Conversely, other mid blocks throughout the city and has been pointed out in other boroughs with related um, zoning districts. Um, we note that uh, note that the um, that there are alternatives. George M. James pointed out uh, one of the alternatives in the upper in the um, east. East Harlem at 127th Street near 2nd Avenue that could fit the site and that would meet many of the uh, city's objectives in terms of in terms of dispersing uh, large projects. Um, we also note that um, that Gail Brewer mentioned very aptly that this is a, a very large subsidy to the, the blood center and a private developer. And we think that is highly inappropriate given its adverse effects. We also note that um, George M. Jaynes for the coalition has developed certain um, full coverage alternatives that would satisfy R8B in, in its general parameters. And that, and he has identified zoning changes that, would, that could be fit into the current Euler process without uh, delaying the entire process and yet uh, building on something that would be acceptable to, uh, to us and to, to the larger- Time uh, expired. Uh, that's, that's my statement. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, do we have any other speakers? Garrett, uh, I do see an additional name in the list. Uh, and so I think we will try to hear from uh, Isabel or Isabe Schwartz. Time you hear me? now. Please accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Isabel Schwartz. Unmute, okay, hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> okay, um, I finally figured out how to do this. Uh, my name is Isabel Schwartz. I'm 76 years old and I've lived the last 15 years in an apartment overlooking the space this proposed building would occupy. I and the thousands of other Upper East Siders who share a similar view, not only paid a premium for that view, but were confident in its permanency because of the long-standing zoning regulations that apply. Like many New Yorkers, and in fact, worldwide citizens, I've spent the better part of two and a half years isolated in my own apartment. I've enjoyed the amazing slice of nature that exists in the depths of the city. 
I recorded two robins having a conversation between opposite ends of the space in, que in question. Being spring, I fantasized about their mutual love songs. One of them sat on a corner of my building just above my head. Then there is the expanse of sky offering sunlight and the incredible sunrises that challenge the best of tropical vacation photos. I'm shocked that our zoning board would even consider allowing an interloper who will not be affected by this monster of a building in his backyard to come to our neighborhood and permanently damage its unique residential character. For him to profit from this construction is nothing short of criminal. Do not allow it, please do not allow it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for your testimony. Uh, do we have another speaker? Chair Moya, um, I'm just checking with our staff. Okay, we're going to try. Uh, we're going to try to hear from the user participant logged in as Barbara Mason, noting that we have heard from Barbara Mason. But if there is another person uh, logged in to testify, we're going to now try to hear from that person, the one logged in as Barbara Mason. Time starts now. Barbara Mason or participants logged in as Barbara Mason. If you can hear me, we need you to turn on your microphone. If you, test, if you intend to testify. You may do that on a phone by pressing star six or accept the unmute request. Okay. Um. Okay. Um, yeah, we seem to be having some technical difficulties or in fact, they don't intend to testify. I'm going to try that same procedure with one last participant, the individual logged in as Elaine Walsh. Again, noting that we have heard from Elaine Walsh, but if there is someone else who has not testified logged in there, uh, we will now try to hear that testimony. I'm no, I've already, I've already testified. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Chair, and with that, uh, I see no additional members uh, of the public. Everyone who has registered, uh, everyone who had registered in advance, we have heard from, and we have no uh, new participants logged in who are uh, who have yet to testify. So, okay. Great. Um, well, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers. Uh, 864, 865, and 866 for the New York Blood Center proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I'm going to turn it over for some very brief uh, closing remarks uh, from Council Member Kalos. Uh, if we can unmute the Council Member. Uh, thank you to every elected official, countless members of Community Board 8, more than 100 community members who showed up at countless meetings and have spent an entire day with us today. Thank you to Chair Francisco Moya for his important questions of the applicant and his patience in this incredibly long hearing with more than 37 panels, countless questions from me as a council member that might be outside the norm. And I will also note that 90% of our speakers spoke in opposition. I reiterate my support and my community support for a new blood center building. We're offering an additional 100,000 FAR with a value of approximately $100 million. The blood center is in a position to turn that much money down. We found at least one developer who will build a new building as of right, complete with a new space for the blood center. Uh, I wanna thank everyone. That's it. Have a good day. 
thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, that concludes today's business. Uh, I will remind the viewing public that for anyone wishing to submit written testimony for items that were heard uh, today, please send it to please send it by email to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And with that, I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues. Uh, but in particular, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the staff, uh, the sergeant at arms uh, for really keeping all of this together. Uh, thank you for uh, always making sure that our committees uh, run very smoothly. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, our land use and council staff, uh, especially uh, Raju Mann, Amy Leviton, uh, Julie Lubin, um, Caitlin Greer, uh, Sandy Thompson, uh, Michael Whiteside, Ryan Cody, uh, John Douglas, and especially to uh, Chelsea Kelly, uh, Megan Taddeo from my staff, and of course, uh, my two co-pilots uh, for today's hearing, uh, Arthur and Angelina, thank you for all the great work that you do behind the scenes. Folks, in order to keep this moving, uh, these are the staff members that uh, are working 24 seven uh, to make this uh, run as smoothly as possible. Uh, and uh, make the council members look uh, good when we do this. Uh, so we just wanna be uh, very thankful uh, for all the great work uh, that they do. Thank you very much. Uh, and that uh, will conclude today's meeting. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.